But anyway, so I'm going to talk about red list. I know what the first slide will be. So we, uh, Martin and me, we worked on the first red data book. So it was not really a red list. Um, in the 1990s, we published it in 1999. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on the left, you see the front side of the red data book. It was of the Council of Europe. Um, and in uh, 2010, the first official red list was published. Um, so that was uh, for us to start. And now we're working on a new red list. So it might be good to remember what the red list is about. It's actually about the risk of extinction. Um, in the so. so there are several categories, not evaluated, not applicable, they could be efficient, and then you go up until you reach the point of extinction, so where the species is completely gone. Um, and I just noticed that many people um, don't know the exact way the red list is prepared, so I have to give a very short introduction to that, because it matters. So. There are five basic criteria on which the red list is devised. And the first one, the A criteria, means you have to have a population reduction of at least 30% in the last 10 years. And that means you should prove that somehow with, uh, for example, monitoring or other data. But at least just the feeling that the population has declined, well, it can be enough if there is really nothing else. We prefer to do that with our monitoring data. The other important one for butterflies is the B criterion. So this means a small geographic range. The small geographic range means uh, not too many uh, um, squares where the species occurs or um, what I call an extent of occurrence, which is a line around the range of, I think, smaller than 20,000 square kilometers, which means half of the Netherlands. That should be the total uh, maximum distribution in range in Europe. Uh, just to give you an idea, this means it's really a restricted species. And that's not even enough. We need two out of three of the other criteria. The species should be either fragmented or have less than 10 locations or in continuing decline, or show extreme fluctuations, more or less a tenfold. So in one year you have 20, the next year you have 200. That's what they mean with that. So it should be serious fluctuations, not just that the species is two or three times as abundant in a certain period than in another period. The other ones are almost never relevant for us. Small population size, well, for insects, it is really very rare. Might occur, and if there are a few species where you could think of that, like Gunnaprix madarensis probably has clearly less than 10,000. Well, very small, because here are some extra, it should also be in decline. There are some very small, well, this is more for uh, tigers and things. And you can have quantitative analysis. Uh, if that's available, you can use that as well. So, for the bulk of the species, we're talking about the first two criteria. It should be a, a real decline of at least 30%. Or there should be a small geographic range plus two out of three others. Now, that's important to keep in mind because um, it, it also says in the last 10 years. So, that means a species which showed a huge decline of 99% over Europe in the ninth, up to 2010, and now is stable, is considered not endangered in this philosophy. You can ha have many remarks on that, and you're perfectly right, I also have them, but it doesn't help. <laughs> For an official red list, you have to follow these criteria. It doesn't matter what else happened or how you feel about it. Of course, it's not completely true, there are some exceptions, but you have to be very uh, able to, to describe them very precisely. So, um, what we did is get uh, observations to calculate the AOO. 
and so the area of occupancy in, in two by two kilometer squares, the extent of occurrence, which is a convex hull. I'll show you later how that looks like. We have to make a range map, which is uh, principally the type of maps you see sometimes in field guides, so a rough, uh, or a rough or precise a map with a, uh, the range on it. Um, and we need the info on trends and on fragmentation, the number of locations. Number of locations is also important. This is not the number of populations or subpopulations. With a location, they mean all the part of the population which could get extinct under one event, for example, a big fire or uh, other things which would impact the population. Yeah, this feels a bit boring and it is, but it's good so you have to realize that this is more or less how it goes and there, are, there is really a 150 page booklet on all the details on the criteria so it's not something simple now what did we use most of the data actually come up, came from gbif um, uh, and inaturalist and observation.org they are also in gbif those data but um we use the validated records to do the first filter on outliers. I'll show that in a minute. We also got data from UFZ on the Lepidiv data. And we got the data for the Article 17 distribution maps of the EU. So for the species which are mentioned on the Habitats Directive, um, each member state has to send in uh, a distribution map on 10 by 10 kilometers. We also validated with the old range maps that Martin Wiemers made back then in 2010. So we used them to validate. So is it where you can see the outliers very quickly because his maps were very useful for that. And we also checked them in a team with a, uh, it's about two years ago with a whole group of people. Um, so we tried to get a data set which is as good as possible. Now here you see some of these things. This is the map as it came. You can see the old, uh, the lines with the oldest uh, range map. And then in red, you can see there were some here in Germany and here and here. I mean, you can easily delete them on based on such a map. And so at the end, we had distribution maps like this. So with all the squares where the species was uh, reported, in this case, uh, also interesting to see if that especially iNaturalist still had quite a few observations from Russia, which helped. Um, for the range maps, because that's what it should say, for the range, to, to build new range maps, we use the step in between. We build first, SDMs to fill the gaps. Well, especially in Russia, that means. So we had distribution data as input. Uh, and environmental data we used, we couldn't use too much of that. There is a reason because we needed good maps up to the Urals, which means that things like CLC3, the Korean land cover, we could not use it because it only is up to Poland, and not into Russia. So we used four climate variables. I think it was almost the same ones as Josef and UFZ used in the climatic risk atlas. We used altitude and we used the ICN habitat map. There was a reason for that. Well, first of all, the ICN habitat map goes all the way to the Urals. It's actually, it's a global map. But also we needed, uh, one of the outcomes would be the habitat preference for each species. Now that's a very rough map, with very, but we need it anyway to, to do this. And actually one of the reasons we followed this is that we use the butterflies to test this method because we also will use it for the moths and for the moths, much less is known. So we could use this. So I'll, I'll show you some examples. So here's an example of how 
we came to the range map. Here you see the distribution of uh, Neptis Sappho on the 10 by 10 kilometers squares. You can see it, quite some observations here on the Balkans, a bit less in Ukraine, and then all the way into Russia, stops somewhere close to the Ural. We first made a species distribution map using the way I described. And the green means in this case that the species has a high chance of occurring there. And red means that it had a very small chance of occurring. So it's a little bit different. You see there are some spots also in Poland, but okay, it already looks quite good. And there is an algorithm in which you can decide if the species could occur there or not. And you see the red dots on the green. The red dots are the, is the true distribution points. This is what I told you about the, uh, one of the results is that you get the relationship between um, the distribution of the species and the parameters of the ICN habitat map that you put in. You can see these are very rough. So we have no connection with subtropical dry grassland. But what you can see also is there is one clear one, which is the temperate forest. Now, this will not be a surprise to all of you, but so this is one of the outcomes of this work. And that's, we don't really need it for the butterflies because we have good data and publications, but for the moths, this method will probably help in getting this done. So for the range map, we then combine the real observations. Um, we not used the SDM points more than 100 kilometers from the map that um, Martin Wiemers made, unless I adapt it. So case of Mani and, and Argiades, for example, we know it expanded enormously northward. So that's when I did something else. I made a new map actually. Uh, I did an alpha hull. I show you what that looks like, which fills up large area, and then you get up with end up with uh, with this map. So what you see on this map, the dark red dots are the observations now on fifty by fifty kilometer scale. The open red dots are all observations before two thousand twelve. But for the range map, we have to use everything. And this is the re combined result of the SDM and the alpha hull shows a new kind of distribution map of, in this case, Neptisafo, including areas where there is very little information. And then we have two maps to compare. This is the old map, which was made for the 2010 uh, situation. This is the map, what it looks like now. <clears throat> So uh, personally, I think this is uh, it's much more precise and can be used for many other things. You are not agreeing because probably one small part is not right because that's usually what we have. Because... Yeah, that makes no sense. I mean, this map is even much more wrong on many sites, which is not because I know we all know this was made with the knowledge available at that moment. And there is nothing wrong with this. And this one is a little bit, and there may be small mistakes in it because, for example, the SDM said, well, there is a good chance of the species occurring there. But then we're getting nowhere. Because yeah, what is the way then, if you come with a good solution, I'm open to it. But a solution, not just <laughs> saying it's not good. But it's difficult when you know that the species that is absent there. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think there are many more remarks to this map. Do you agree on that? No? Mm -hmm. You think this one is better? Then we use that one. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult when you know, I know that the species is missing from within the Czech Republic. When well, there is even a map here. There is even a dot. There is even a dot here. Okay. This is also nonsense because this, this is absolutely right. It just been there eight years ago. Or there is no solution to that. Right. Because if I want to fill up Russia, I have to make some decisions. Uh -huh. Otherwise, the map stops here somewhere, and we have no idea.
So, still some commands? Still that? You want some? This is the problem. Okay, so we have the AOO and the EOO. I will show you how that works. This is what the EOO is called. So it's this convex hull on the real observations. In this case, it's huge. So this piece is clearly over 20,000 square kilometers, so it's not going into the B criterion. We also have population trends, which come from ABLE. So we have trends of the period 2009-2018 for the EU and for Europe. Now, in this case, you can see that in Europe, the species yeah. is actually... On yeah. Okay, so... But like I said, we only have uh, population trends for 160 different species. And we would like to add some, um, try to get uh, results for more species. And there is this paper already from 2010, so it's a few years old, um, which goes about using the list length method in this case for Australian birds. So it's completely something different, but still, um, this um, article is uh, has also an R package with it that you can download and use. And it is a certain way of correcting for the fact that um, there is a huge rise in the number of observations and you have to find a way to deal with that. Um, we know the weaknesses of this um, this, this method, because there is a paper um, the, um, comparing, uh, I think, 10 or 11 methods to find a distribution trend. So we know this method is susceptible for changes in recording and intensity, but still, the method is relatively easy to apply compared to many other methods. And uh, of course, this is always a balance. Uh, the best methods from this system require um, lots of data and very heavy computers to do it. This was, in our opinion, the best uh, balance between usability and still deliver a relatively good data. But we are aware of this, and that's why we have to check up with all the trends that come out with the national experts, if they confirm this. So what we get is, uh, at the end of the day, an Excel sheet, actually, which more or less looks like this. Uh, so we have the species. Um, then we have the, you see, a column with the 2010 uh, outcome. We have an AOO calculated. Now, if there is a color, that means that the AOO is under the threshold. <laughs> that there is something to look more closely to. We have the EOO, so the extent of occurrence. In this case, for these species, it's always larger than the threshold. So in this case, that's not so very relevant. We have the, what you said, distribution trend in Europe, list length, Bay Asian, Q50. So in this case, this is the, uh, more is the trend uh, from the list length method, plus if it's significant or not. So there are also trends which are not significant. Oh, yes. Put some things in that. Yeah, oh, sorry, and we have the population trend from the ABLE project also with an indication for both Europe and the EU, if it was significant or not. And we have so the distribution trend and an indication if it's significant or not. So these data we had, not for all species, but also all kinds of species which are either too rare to calculate something or other reasons. <clears throat> And then we use, well, this is a more detailed in the beginning. I gave you this information and here you can see all the 
written uh, things. So you can see either a decline in occupancy or an index of abundance. Those are the two most appropriate ones uh, for uh, population trend or distribution trend. And mostly we had to deal with uh, this uh, uh, A2, A3, A4, which means especially the population reduction is uh, not but the cause of reduction of reduction are clearly reversible and understood and have ceased. So mostly that's not the case for our butterflies. So we have to deal with the other three. So it's quite, this is even the summary. So it just gives you an impression how detailed these descriptions are. And for the EO and AO, we have this B criterion, which we, uh, we use these. Um, so, we have the ingredients to work on the red list. We have a European trend, both on population and distribution, in which case we use the most negative trend. Uh, and now we have done this first assessment. Um, and now we're going to, to, to want to know about the species, which uh, yeah, many species are simply least concerned. They have a very large ELO or AOO. They don't show a population reduction of 30%. And unless uh, normal, under normal circumstances, those species would simply be become least concerned. Um, but for the other species, where there is at least a decline of 20%, that's more or less the, the border we took, uh, or... Um, an AOO of less than 3,000 or an EOO of less than 30,000, so close to the uh, border, but a little bit above. Uh, we want to discuss the outcomes with the uh, experts. So we did, uh, we organized five workshops uh, where we want to discuss these outcomes. In many cases, if you simply confirm, then that's an easy thing, but we, we are aware that there are all kinds of pitfalls and traps in which we can fall. That's why it's important to give this feedback. A very, this is just on the draft, but you can see that uh, the, the number of species, uh, uh, this is the 2010. And so it, it, is, it shows some changes. We have more endangered species than in 2010, and also a bit more vulnerable, but less near threatened. But let's be very clear, I don't give species to this because this will change, probably, because of the workshops. And some of the results which are, are clear is, for example, that we have one extinct species now. Well, we can be proud on that. Uh, so it's the Pyrrhus Wallastoni from Madeira. Uh, we did some uh, extra work in the, off, the last few years in the Life of Best project, which we already heard, and now uh, this species is considered extinct. This is a photo we made in the museum in Funchal, where you can still see them. Uh, we also know, for example, that this species is now again considered endangered, just as last time. This is Gunetrix maduensis in its habitat in uh, Madeira. We also know that some species changed. So, in this case, uh, Parker CFI change from endangered to least concern um, because it, uh, well, the distribution is large, is, uh, sorry, there is no decline observed. Uh, While well, there is a decline, but that was not in the last 10 years. And uh, uh, we could not fulfill two of the three criteria on the number of locations, fragment, uh, fragmentation, decline, or and or uh, fluctuations. There's also species, well, there is a question mark because it's just an example, but for this species, it seems under the present uh, that it will shift from least concern, which we had in 2010, to vulnerable. Um, so there are, there will be small changes in, in all kinds of directions. So we already had the workshop on the Macronesian species. Maybe we have to redo some of the assessments, but uh, um, all workshops are planned for these regions. 
Um, but I must say, you, we have a lot of species in the uh, assessment, so we have to follow the criteria quite strict. So if you don't agree, you have to come up with data or something which proves, not just saying I don't feel very pleasant with that. It's not enough. Um, it will be reviewed first by the ICN office, and then again by the ICN Species Committee. I don't forget what it's. Species Specialist. Uh, okay. So, um, they will have a lot of fun with the moss, by the way, but <laughs> <laughs> that's not up to me. Um, and after that, we will upload all results to what they call the SIS, for which I also forgot what it means, but it's the database behind the red list page on the ICM web page. Yep. Okay. okay, that was it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we keep all the questions for later, and now uh, it's very interesting to see uh, the presentation of Sam, which will be about the moth. So many more species and many more questions in that. Yeah. Of course, you are Sam. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now you can handle it. <laughs> and actually, I'll be making eight minutes to end the presentation. Oh. Well, that's all right. Twenty seconds per month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 this, this, the, this talk will be completely different, I guess. There will be no model maps or anything like that in the debate, so <laughs> no need to worry. So, um, yeah, so the, the, um, the V first European moth red list is on, on its way, and I'm very pleased to say it must be the last major species group not to actually have a, a red list in Europe. Um, and uh, I uh, the partnership is IUCN Butterfly Conservation Europe, Dutch BC and, and Butterfly Conservation uh, involved in projects. Uh, it's three years long, and you, you'll see very soon why that is needed that, that for that length of time. Uh, the project team is listed there, and, and to be honest, I, my involvement has really just been to help um, the uh, the application process. I've not been involved in delivery, so I, I need to give credit here that this talk is. Mainly from uh, Jury and Van Dyke from the three C. So, uh, um, any questions? You can direct to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, okay. So, the, right. The, the first challenge: the number of species. Eight thousand seven hundred species of Lepidoptera, most of which are moths, and uh, over half are micro moths. So that was the first issue, the first issue. How realistic, realistic is it to actually produce a, um, a moth red list for all moths? Very clearly, it's not. So the decision taken early on was that we would focus on the larger moths, and uh, that's exactly what we did. Um, and, and even that is a challenge because that that list of three thousand two hundred uh, keeps growing. Uh, I think uh, there are two hundred species described. Uh, added to the list since 2000, so uh, at some point you have to make a draw a line and say that's the, the list we're working with, um, and that, that's what we've done. So yeah, there this new genetic research, uh, new, new survey work has, has kicked that into that list. Uh, so that's a slide from uh, uh, Chris's, the, 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 the first red list, two th oh, sorry, second red list, 2010, and you'll see the number of threatened and um, uh, near threatened species. It's about 18 or 19 percent of the species that were studied. If you apply that to 3,200 um, uh, larger moths, we could be dealing with a list of, of nearly 600 species, which um, it's going to be quite a challenge to to uh, to, to work work through that. That's if you've got the data. So. I, I probably just yeah, it's just mentioned yeah in terms of um, habitats directed. Moths are very much underrepresented under when you consider the number of species uh, in the habitats directive. There are only 19, only one of which is a, a micro. Okay, so um, and this, and some of this will be repeated exactly what Chris has said, so I'll try and skip over those bits. But yeah, just remember the, it's, a, it's a 10 year data period. We're working on 2011 to 20 for the moths. 
And as Chris said several times, we have to work with the very strict IUCN criteria. And um, help from regional and national experts is, is pretty important to this project, as you will see shortly. So if you've not been contacted and you are a moth expert, Jury's email is on there. It will be repeated several times um, at, at the end. If you want to get in contact with Jury, if you think you've got contribution to make, he, would, he and the team would be very pleased to hear from you. Um, and again, this is, I'm sure I don't really need to do, um, present this slide particularly, but just to remember that it is the European context that is important. I mean, this particular species, I think, is down to one site in the Netherlands. We seem to be even a dot for it there. But, so it's obviously, obviously of importance to, uh, in the Netherlands, but, uh, but uh, across Europe, it's not in particular um, trouble. So, you know, that, and I think sometimes we get a little bit bogged down in what's happening in one particular country. It's the the European story that's important for the, the, this kind of project. Uh, and again, Chris has mentioned already, we, uh, as with the butterfly red list, we are looking at um, a, both an EU27 red list and a pan-European red list, which does obviously, as <laughs> the debate over uh, Russia, does that mean I'm going to get put off if it's <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so anyway, we, we are, we, we're doing both then. So the, the starting point was the, uh, uh, the I don't presumably some of you are familiar with uh, Karl Schott and Rosowski's book. Uh, that does include a list of all the matter of the lepido lepidoptera and um, the country occurrence. So that was the starting point for the team. Um, and uh, information on synonymy uh, was uh, in Lepid, Lepid Forum. Um, and then they went about starting to gather the data. Um, and, and combining databases. So GPIF was the main source of data, and then the team have been contacting various people around Europe to pull together the national and regional databases where they're available. So, uh, as I said, this is a work in progress, this project. We're halfway through it, and um, uh, we, uh, uh, there's a long way to go still, but so far they've gathered um, nine and a half million records, um, at tetrad scale and for 2655 species so there's actually so this is really just put into context the difference between the butterfly red list and this one we haven't got any data for 535 species at all and um you know, and and then it, actually if you just look at the data sets for 2011 to 20 um you know that cuts that database in nearly in half and that adds another 163 species we haven't got any data so 700 out of 3200 species we haven't got data for at this point in time oh i mean it that this at that point in time shall i say there's obviously work going on to uh to uh rectify that and as you can see um clearly all the the moths are from the the, the map on the right there you can see the, the the number of species per square there and you can see they they all live in uh, the UK and Netherlands and Belgium. So yeah, so a, there, there are big challenges of actually getting data sets from uh, across southern and eastern Europe. So again, I ask you if you can help with this or you know the right people, jury is the person to contact. And now we have a little interlude of an uh, interactive quiz. I've got a. Uh, we uh, we made um, a list of the most widespread species. Anybody like to guess what any of the top five are? <laughs> yep. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, uh, oh, that's actually been enough, enough of an interactive bit. Anyway, so there they are. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's in the, the in order. So, uh, so anyway, we're making progress. The, to to address the issue of, of the, the species without records, um, um, the, the the colleagues in Britain, um, uh, Mark Parsons and Phil Sterling, have been uh, having to do the laborious task of searching through uh, journals. Reports try and find records for those species where they're, where they're under five records or no records. And there's another big tranche of species which are um, in, have only got six to 30 records and they're also repeating that. So we aren't anywhere near 
modeling data and producing a lovely map that uh, Chris presented for this project as yet. But uh, hopefully that will happen soon. And uh, again, unfortunately, I can skip over much of this now um, uh, because Chris has mentioned it. So the, the main the criteria of population size reduction, of course, we don't, we, we are just talking about distribution data here. We don't have uh, on a European scale multi monitoring data sets that would allow us to apply that criteria. So, you know, that is, is not, is simply not available for most. So maybe for some of the HD species, we, we may be able to do that, but I suspect not. So we, we as Chris mentioned, it's this one, uh, the, the geographical range, that's the critical thing. Um, and and you, we just see maps that, um, sim, similar sort of maps there that uh, Chris has produced. So, showing the EOO and AOO, so I don't really need to talk too much about that, but clearly species like that uh, are unlikely to be threatened. Um, but of course, just a reminder, that even if you, you've got that data, you do need to be able to address some of those, two of those three criteria, A, B, and C, uh, as Chris has already mentioned. Um, and even, even for, obviously, there's going to be a lot of species where we think we have very small EOOs and AOOs, as in this um, um, canary endemic, um, you can barely see the, the dots on the, the, the range on the map down there, but it's down there somewhere. Um, but you can see it's a very small extensive occurrence, an area of occupancy, and that would actually meet the, the criteria for endangered in theory, but you know, it comes back to actually, do we know enough about that species to say it's met two of those three criteria there? Spec for it's going to be quite challenging to, to do that. And of course, I'll skip through these small population size and decline. We've already discussed, we just don't have the data, and certainly we don't really have much knowledge, enough knowledge for moths, I think, which would um, uh, allow us to use that criteria. And neither would we be able to use uh, D and E, I don't think. Um, but B might be possible, but I don't know how much population viability analysis has been done. On moths, uh, I suspect not. So we will be stuck with B. That's what we're going to be have to apply. Um, so quite an extensive job. So where we are right now is obviously this distribution data has been collected. We know where every species occurs, except for those we've got no records for, obviously. Um, and if you just looked at the extensive occurrence and area of occupancy, two two thousand over two thousand species of the three thousand two hundred potentially are threatened, which is um, obviously a, a nonsense. Uh, so there's a, an awful lot of um, questioning of the data sets and, 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 and so on will need to go ahead. So we, we have reverted in this project to what, what you did in the European Red List for Butterflies originally, which was to send out a questionnaire. Um, some of you may well remember that and be involved in that. So there's a Questionnaire going out to experts asking for information on on uh, um, in, in their regions and countries on their on a, a distribution and decline information where where they might be uh, uh, available. So, is a lot of expert opinion in this project will be needed. Um, next stage is yeah, the questionnaire is going out to those experts. So, if you are consider yourself one, you won't be uh, contacted. Then do get in touch. Um, we're going to try and combine all that knowledge to come up with a preliminary, preliminary list of uh, threatened species, and then we will be back into the workshops that uh, um, we're doing for the butterfly red list. And of course, for 3,200 species, those of you familiar with SIS Connect, where you put the data into the IUCN uh, website, there's a there's a text boxes which have got to be completed for each of those on for geographical range, population, etc. So. Again, quite a lot of work to do that. And the final report is due in 2024. Um, so, yeah, just a reminder, we do need your help. Uh, if you can fill in the questionnaire, that would be great. Um, and, you know, help us with regional distributions and trends, that'd be great. Another plea uh, on there is the third, fourth point down there. You might be, you might not have, you might not have fairly got expertise, but if you do, so if you photograph moths, uh, they are looking for images because every moth in the red, in the red, the red list will need an accompanying image. 
Um, a chap called Chris Manley from the UK volunteered uh, very nobly to, to, to produce that. And we have a, 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 a spreadsheet showing which species uh, we matched up photographs on. I think I looked this morning, it's about 1,400 out of 3,200. So if you've got photos of moths, um, you could contribute those by getting in touch with Chris, uh, or, or you could ask me, I can just have the spreadsheet on. And of course, there's a permission form for use on the website you need to sign. Um, the last point, of course, this just comes back to some of the discussion yesterday. We really do need a European monitoring scheme to update the next red list with actual population trend data. So presumably in another 10 years, when we're all long, well, some of us will be long retired by then, uh, there might be another red list and we'd be able to actually be a bit more informed, I think. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. That's as uh, much as I can. Yeah. Really an interesting presentation, and it gives us another push to go for more monitoring. So, all of you, please try to have a left track in your garden and monitor what. Um, any question? I see a young. Don't forget, I'm not going to be able to answer them. <laughs> and you'll be able to answer this one. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's coming. Has it has it warmed up? Yeah, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, can I make a plea to everybody who's producing a red list that when you publish, you put the date of your publication in the title of the red list? We have red list, we have a new red list, we have a revised red list, mm. and when you try to Google search, you can't find the one you want. Mm. And it's happened already in the UK with the ones being published this year, which I'm not, which has been a problem. Right, so please put the year of publication right. in the red list, and then you can differentiate between the 2010, the 2022, and the 2032 when it comes. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. The yeah, yeah, uh, yes, it, it would be allowed. And it, it's, they're so strict about it. Mm -hmm. oh. But it's a, it's a Google yeah, yeah, it's in, the new world, world, in the new world of internet yeah. services. It's weird. We... <laughs> okay, so I had a question with uh, this data because uh, in Eastern Europe, as you know, we don't. Uh, do we have some data set that these are not included in the red list? Yeah. So for one, we can uh, share probably this data, yeah. the open data we can share, but I can also contact people from Habiprot. Maybe they would like to contribute. They have a large uh, yeah. MOTS database. And the second thing is that there are a lot of publications, but in Serbian language, and I think uh, yeah. those are not uh, georeferenced. Um, yeah. This is yeah. a large job <laughs> to yeah. get up, but. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, and I don't think Mark or Phil can like speak Serbian or <laughs> so they wouldn't be able to read them either. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's an incomplete, it's going to be an incomplete picture, but we, we do the best that we can with the data we have available. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, so I can on that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you've got people who you know, could contribute, please get to the jury. It may be already now, but um, do, do try. Yeah, if it's useful, we can. Probably send this data. Maybe they have, uh, they could put some on the website a list of the species there. But the population, maybe you would check and you see, <coughs> you think that there is information on Serbia. Yeah. Nowadays, Google Translate and things can you know, be easy. So that, that would be quite helpful, I think. So yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Maybe I'll ask him. Yeah. Behind, oh, behind. Oh, uh, I have a question for Chris. Uh, so the uh, the data set from GBIF and iNaturalist, they, it's uh, um, uh, many of this data is uh, opportunistic uh, records. So have you compared this uh, data with uh, national atlases, or uh, because there might be some regions missing from from uh, GBIF or iNaturalist data sets? Does 
Yeah, maybe it's back to the one here. It's not a mute. How do you mean it's a mute? It's not a mute. I really didn't. Wish we'd known that earlier. I'm muted, yeah. I'm muted. Yeah, for sure, we yeah, will miss data. But I hope you saw that on the things I produced, for most. Uh, this this only really concerns the rec the rare species. I mean, for the trends, it doesn't matter. For the um, it does matter for the for the uh, rarer species, but they're limited distribution. Um, so I will really look into those with the workshop. So that's the moment to uh, to discuss this. Uh, this we should remember there is a huge difference between the moth red list and the butterfly red list. Which the time available for the butterfly red list is much more limited. It's just an update and not a full red list, which the moth red list is. So we just ha didn't have time to go through all of them. We could have done it more clever. I agree on that, but that's too late. Now. So, uh, what is the time schedule? Sorry? What is the time schedule? It has to be finished in half a year. The butterfly one, I think, is September. Yeah, the butterfly, not the moth. September. But the best, yeah. I think the lesson also should, well, yeah. It, it, I think the future red list, I mean, whatever we, how we look upon it, I think the next red list for many other species groups, including butterflies, will be primarily built on G -Biz. So it's but I know there are different opinions on this, so that's what I think. So that uh, Turkey is not included in this... Uh, uh, European Turkey. Yeah, uh, it is. European it is. Turkey, so up to the Bosporus. Okay, because uh, for example in Greece we have, you know, we have some species that are uh, at the limit of their distribution on the edge. So this will play a role how we consider the European population if Turkey is included or not. Yeah, the spe well. These species will, uh, which are mainly Turkish species and occur on a few islands in Greece, they uh, have a very small part of their distribution in, uh, in Europe. And many of them, so we will use the same criteria as previous at least, which means that if less than 1% of the world global distribution is in within the limit of the border, then we don't uh, do uh, We consider it not applicable. That's what we did in both previous versions too. And that's also the rule of the ICN percentage. So many of those species on which just occur on one or two islands and have a large distribution in Turkey, they will not be, uh, be in there. Assessment. For example. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can pass on to Simona. Yeah, I'm I'm Russians. Thank you so much. Now, I think to catch uh, the impression of some others uh, here in the room, I disagree a little bit uh, in the more constructive way I can with your approach. I think that if we are here, red list are not a boring thing to do, but it's a tool for our butterfly and for our moth. So I think just to ask to, to involve more people that are here, because most of us are um, the data provider for national red list. We, most of us already know about IUC criteria, and I think we already finished the the time in which we discuss about criteria, we are we overcome this step, and now we are solid in build up a, uh, I can say the, the most uh, reliable red list, and now we know how red list uh, will be crucial in the next. Uh, this red list, especially for the butterfly one, will be crucial in the next 10 years compared to the previous one. So most of us were in the Mediterranean, people were in Malaga doing the Mediterranean one. Most of us were data provider for the, the previous one. So I, I think uh, most of us didn't know since the beginning that red list, uh, butterfly red list, European butterfly red list was uh, ongoing to be updated, for example. And most of us have one third 
or less data on GBIF on bilateralist. But I think that despite money, without money, without to be author or something like that, we will do our best to find even a, a specimen in the collection, in a museum, if needed, if crucial for assessing the, correctly the one species. So please, in some way, um, involve more the people. That, that's my impression, but it's not only my impression. <laughs> because we need it. It's sure. that you are doing, eh? because we, we scheduled the, the meeting, the workshop with rare species, uh, but, and the same for the moth. Mm? Of course, but we have more time. Actually, Thank you. you were invited for the workshops. Yeah, yeah. But if we in advance it would be something like uh, an email to the BC. Okay. okay, we are Maybe. doing this. Uh, this is crucial point for our butterfly. Otherwise, we were not here. Huh? And please uh, do your best. Of course, remember that a lot of data are not useful. For example, in, in I, I don't know, Cassandra is the Rinza Cassandra. You know, is an endemic species of Italy. It's spread of whatever in Italy. It doesn't make any sense to produce additional data uh, because the, it's least concern, for sure. But for endemic, more smaller endemic species, it's important that we work with time to produce reliable um, assessment. And don't forget to, I appreciate a lot the idea to use a species distribution model. And if we also can work on species distribution model projected in the future, in the close future, because uh, we must be realistic about uh, um, our the, the future of our perhaps future on our butterflies. Thank you so much for your comment. Well, this is a very simple question. Uh, uh, I, I would like to know if uh, when when are you closing the data input for the moth uh, at least? Uh, well, that's probably a question I probably can't answer. Sorry, I probably I can't answer that definitively. The, the, the project has to be finished in 2024. Yeah. So I think I would even, I think for this year we have you plenty of time. Sorry, 2023. Yes, yeah, so I'm volume. Okay. Yeah, um, and I think particularly for the. The, the the species with a few records that's the ones they they will be keen to to, keen to contribute to okay thank you so much for this moment i just stopped the discussion i know it's really interesting and there are many questions left but please share them with sam and chris with the beer because we're running out of time and it's time for holly to go on with the global uh, butterfly monitoring so if europe is not big enough we're now going global Sorry. Yeah, just So, um, I'm Holly, the International Officer at Butterfly Conservation UK. Um, I started this role in July this year, and part of my job is to support Butterfly Conservation Europe, and the other part is to make progress on the Global Butterfly Monitoring Index, which is the subject of this presentation. Um, it's been a collaboration project so far before I started between Butterfly Conservation, Butterfly Conservation Europe, Devon and Desicting, IUCN Species Survival Commission for Butterflies and Moths, UK CEH and the Zoological Society of London. So yeah, lots of people involved already. Uh, firstly, why do we actually need a global butterfly indicator? Currently, parties that are signed up to the Convention on Biological Diversity have a mission to take effective and urgent action to halt the loss of biodiversity. The Convention has adopted some global indicators in order to measure progress towards this target, and the Living Planet, Living Planet Index is one of them. 
This is a measure of the state of the world's biodiversity, and it's based on population trends from about 21,000 populations of about 4,000 vertebrates around the world. And it showed that these populations declined by an average of 68% between 1970 and 2016. However, this indicator and a lot of others that are similar to it don't include any insect data at all. Um, where we do have data on insect population trends, many of the studies point to large declines. For example, flying insect biomass was estimated to have declined by over 75% over 27 years in German nature reserves, and about 30% of butterfly species that are currently assessed for the IUCN red list are declining, and 35% of insects in the UK were found to have declining ranges. Uh, some more data here. The State of the UK's Butterfly Report in 2016 found that 76% of the UK's butterflies declined in abundance, occurrence or both over the last 40 years. And it's been mentioned before that the EU Butterfly Indicator for Grassland Species recorded a significant decline of 39% in grassland butterfly populations across the EU from 1990 to 2017. So, as demonstrated in those examples, most of the trends and indicators available so far are data from studies in temperate regions, particularly Europe and North America. These are maps from a 2019 paper, which is of butterfly species occurrence data taken from GBIF. Um, the dark blue shows where the data is complete, and the yellow shows where data are incomplete, and white is where there's no butterfly occurrence data at all. So, the authors found that butterfly inventory data are far lower in the global south than the global north, which you can see on the maps quite nicely, although it has been improving in recent years. So basically, there's a need to understand butterfly populations and their trends and the drivers of these trends across the world to better understand what's happening to butterflies and insects at biogeographical and global scales. Um, so, why butterflies to make a global indicator, apart from the fact that we all like them? Um, they're the best monitored invertebrate group and are relatively easy to identify compared to other insect species. Um, they're good indicators sometimes for the status of other insects and for the health of the environment because they have short life cycles so they can react more quickly to environmental change. And also, due to their limited dispersal ability, and sensitivity to climatic conditions, they can also represent fine-scale environmental changes and important pollinators. So these are the aims of the Global Butterfly Index project. Overall, it aims to facilitate the collation, storage and analysis of existing butterfly monitoring data sets from countries around the world to produce a Global Butterfly Index, which will also contribute to the Living Planet Index. We're hoping that the results will create a global indicator to detect population changes, which is less biased towards Europe and North America, provide a mechanism to understand the drivers of change across all biogeographic regions, and establish an invertebrate group firmly in the global biodiversity indicator and policy space, so that the findings of this will have impact on national conventions, and, sorry, international conventions and things. Um, and a secondary and longer term aim is to establish new butterfly monitoring schemes in countries without any. Um, project on the progress so far, which um, happened before I started. Um, the Zoological Society of London made the first attempt to begin the Global Butterfly Monitoring Index um, by taking on some master's students who tried to collect butterfly population data via literature search. They gathered 1,154 time series data sets for 385 butterfly species, which is shown in the map on the left where they got the data from with the yellow dots. But the results still had many data gaps, um, even for temperate countries, like you can see the USA there is quite empty. So they felt that there wasn't enough data to publish a proper living planet index for butterflies but just yet. Um, so the organisations up in the top corner were interested in developing the work further and started the Global Butterfly Index project. Um, we hope that the European Butterfly Monitoring System can provide a suitable data collection system for the backbone of this, um, for the raw data collection from monitoring schemes across the world. And the methodology for calculating the grassland butterfly indicator and other such indicators can be adapted to calculate trends across the world for the actual indicator itself. 
Um, yeah, and the gas and bus supply indicator has been adopted by the EU as an indicator of the status of biodiversity, which demonstrates that um, these indicators can have real policy impact. Uh, recently, the European Butterfly Monitoring Systems Data Input app has been adapted to include entry of 15-minute counts, which you all know about, and also for Japan and Kenya. Um, so, demonstrating that it's already starting to kind of expand around the world, but we would need more adaptation to account for methods like fruit baiting, which, are, which is a good method for butterfly survey in the tropics. And we're currently searching for funding to expand the database and the app, develop the app. So this is a slide of the next steps of the project. Um, firstly, it's to try and find out what actually does exist already, what monitoring schemes are running around the world. Um, I've been working on that by Google searches, but if anyone knows any, I welcome the information. Um, the second stage is we're going to try and organise a conference for the Global Butterfly Monitoring Project um, to develop the idea further, get in input from more different people and build momentum on the project. We're hoping to hold this on the back of the Czech Republic Biology of Butterflies conference next year, but it's not been arranged just yet. <laughs> is that difficult? <laughs> um, the third point is gathering data from different monitoring schemes and setting up data sharing agreements um, so that we're not taking data from schemes without them understanding the use or getting the chance to use it first. We want to make sure everyone's happy with that arrangement. Um, step one, create a database specifically for the Global Butterfly Monitoring Index to have methodologies available in it. Um, and produce the indicator. We are thinking of doing global, continental and biogeographic regional indicators, as well as um, export the data to the Living Planet Index so that we can get the insects included in that. And then the final step is to promote the output and publicise the results to use the indicator to effectively improve the conservation status of butterflies across the world by um, yeah, raising awareness and trying to influence policy. Uh, that's the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, we also skipped the questions for later with the beer. And it's an honor to me uh, to invite Christian Stedmer, whom I almost shared a job with together <laughs> many, many years ago. And he has been a perfect host for us in many years, uh, facilitating uh, the visit to Laufen and uh, having a nice place to be all together with all of us. And now the word is for Christian. Please uh, tell us all about, you know, on Fendalis butterflies. Thanks a lot, Yama, for the warm introduction. Uh, the problem is with the talk, I think I made a, a horrible mistake when Martin asked me what we should the, name the talk like, and I said, yes, we name it from Gary's talk, because I think it arouses expectations I cannot fulfill, because what I have are more questions, but not so much of facts, and so I try uh, to escape from the beginning. Ich brauche Ah, okay, genau. So. Okay, so I decided to escape from the first topic and switch to another one for a few minutes because Martin asked today how it all began and we had yesterday, Seth and me, some nostalgic moments about talking about the beginning. And that's it because um, it was exactly yeah, more than 20 years ago, uh, when SEP and me started in 2001, the first Pan-European Management of Butterflies conference here in Laufen. Um, and this was the start. A year later, I think, we started with MacMan. We had meetings here, and then BC started. And the first meeting we had, it was just uh, the whole complex was renovated because it's an old monastery. 
And when the monks left, it was about 1998, it was really ruined, where we have the guest room. There was former the kitchen, there was the water on the floor. If you looked up, you could see the sky and the stars, which was nice, but there was no roof anymore. And so the academy got some million of euros for renovation, which took us two years. And so finally, in October 2001, we started here with this conference room. It was the first conference. It was the first meeting at all. And so it was like this nothing worked at, at, in the beginning. Uh, in fact, we have the same microphones we use now. We had yesterday, which explains a lot. I think even the Stones already recorded with this mic of a uh, honky-tonk woman in the 60s. But yes, we still use them. and. We'll use them maybe another 20 years. Anyway, so the thing started and this is where we came a long way from and this was the poster where we made the public relation for this conference and you can see it's really old-fashioned. It was the beginning of a new decade, even a century, even a millennium and this was the style we had at this time. For me it's nice to, if you check the names that some of them already well, are still out here and still join the conferences and it was really it was a very nice beginning and this i wanted to tell you in the beginning to spare some minutes about fengaris <laughs> Um, yes, um, we have at the academy some areas of 18 hectares where we do uh, research and training area. It's mostly a training area for our courses where we go when we have uh, with the students, with pupil. And we have some research also and this area, you can see it's 18 18 hectares. It's nice to have run this problem. It's going to make Jagger, right? <laughs> Okay, so I have to talk a little bit faster before <laughs> the engine runs on empty. Uh, in these 18 hectares, uh, it, we have this area since 30 years now, and it was last year when it got to my responsibility to take care for this area. It was mainly uh, uh, right before as uh, with a focus on vegetation and not so much on the faunistic aspects and I tried to, to change some things there and this is what I want to tell you about. It's mainly there is a small river in the middle of this area, you have all these meadows around, some are really wet, now we have a beaver family, it makes the things a little bit more wet again and uh, most of these are uh, meadows cut once or twice a year. And what I started with is to work with some stripes. It's always a good idea if you want to favor on insects to, to leave some areas where they can uh, grow back and have still place. And we were successful in one of these stripes as we found this year, this nice butterfly, the tufted skipper, which was never recorded there where we are for sure that the next populations are more than 40 kilometers away. And it was this year, the first year that we had the species in our area. And even on top, uh, we had proof of reproduction because we had some egg laying females. It seems that this species also expands a little bit what I had talked yesterday with Patrick Go also, and gives some, yes, an insight to the dynamic of the butterfly species, but for us, it was really a big success in the second year, changing a little bit of 
I shouldn't have said it about the microphones. <laughs> Yes, yes, I will. Yes, okay. And the main issue or the questions I have is that we have in this area also Pengaris Tileus in our situs. And the normal situation, as I know them since decades working with this species, is that we have Nausitus as the species which is more stable, which is uh, prone to even inhabit in very small patches. All in all, that Nocitus is the species which is quite frequent, and Teleus is the species which was always rare, which was kind of our problem child because the population in whole Bavaria went down. Now started in Strauss in this 30 hectare and we, we had findings from last year on which are for me very surprising and this is what I wanted to ask you and your experience with it because uh, we started with counts last year and these are the results from um, from this year and to put a long story short this is the area of Strauss you see there's a corridor and all in all we had count this year, more than 250 individuals of uh, Teleus. And already last year, we had 150 of them. So it seems to re really to rise. And if we compare with Nausitus, we had this year only two individuals. And last year, there were about 40. So big question mark. I didn't have any time. Uh, what's going on, why we do have such a shift. What I would want, to, want from you to or ask you is, uh, do you have a similar experience, like you said, Emma, before that in the Netherlands or in some of your areas, it seems to be the same. So, and um, we didn't have any time now to, uh, because I think one of the key factors, of course, will be the post dance. And it's something we want to start next year to have a closer look. But all in all, I'm really, it's a phenomenon we have in Strauss in our research area. And what I wanted to ask you, or what's your impression if you have observed the same phenomenon? Is it on a large scale development or what's going on? I know two years are much too short to, to give any. Uh, reliable answer, but it seems that we have the same development also in other areas here in Bavaria. And so, yes, I think, thanks for your interest and we can start the discussion now. Thank you, Christian. Um, Martin. That's a comment from Brandenburg. We have also checked some uh, sites in the last two years, and there it's the other around. So, uh, Teleus is, used to be always uh, threatened. There's only one population left, and that one we saw in the last, in the last year, uh, just one specimen. So, I don't know if it's still there. Uh, I think there were some few more seen this year, but not by myself. So, maybe it's still there, but it's really at the brink. Mm. And the uh, and Nausitos is still quite common in some several mm. places. So there it's not the case. I, our impression is that one reason uh, for the decline is that these places are getting drier and we had really a strong drought. So I wonder how it was in Bavaria, if, uh, because it was not everywhere the same. Right? In some areas there we had drought in Germany and um, I don't know in Bavaria, maybe not. Or how was it here? Yes. I think like the rest, uh, we had some strange years. It was last year 2001 it rained a lot here it was an exceptional year that we had loads of rain it was cold <laughs> loads periods hmm? 21, yeah. 21 and this year was very hot uh, the areas itself are very wet and humid because like you saw in the picture there is a small streamlet going through and if we have a little bit higher water level the meadows are flooded so it should be and from baiting long long time ago 
We know that we have loads of Mimica rubra in these uh, areas, Scabbard horizontal. And like I said, I didn't have any time to check for the for the answer site. Is it something we will do next year? But it's really a little bit of a big question mark. What is the slide? Sorry. Yeah. My command would be that, um, from my experience, there are a few reasons why a species change, uh, side of increasing or declining. There are the big things like climate change and so, which are usually even over regional, so national, or occur even in the whole of Europe. There are the things that happen on the locality which make the changes. So, you, the usual thing, I, if I get questions like that, is that usually you look if it's the same in the rest of, let's say, Bavaria or part of Austria. If this happens everywhere, it's usually something. Over regional, so it might be nitrogen, and it has to be climate change, whatever. But it's not local. Once you get, stop working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and usually, when you see the difference, so it's increasing or decreasing on your side, and it's in the rest, well, then there's something on your patch. Yes. Yes, thanks. I just wanted to share the experience with you. Um, because as far as I know, it's not only in Strauss, it's in a larger scale, but still we have to define where it's going on. Mine was. <laughs> yeah, that's just a comment. It, it has nothing to do with uh, Germany, of course, but uh, some years ago, we made a model uh, of what's happening with mousitos in, in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, and it will go with climate change completely. So, uh, so we and the, the thing is that we are now starting to see how some populations are outside the, the climate, the, the favorable climate for the species, and, and they will go in, in just, just a few years, probably. So maybe I mean that's a comment that that links with what Chris say, said because uh, sometimes it's it can be climate, it can be just local uh, situation, but uh, but just just a comment. I mean climate is already uh, having an effect on these species. Okay. No. We have similar drop or said. From appearance to uh, the change from appearance to disappearance in 2002 after, after floods, but uh, I think that you would know if there, if there was flooded or not. Any floods, Christian? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, not really. Not really that we can explain this shift now with uh, we had floods before. Uh, long time before, but didn't affect at all the two species and the population densities as far as we know. I have to admit the data we have are very... Uh... By the way, if anyone has a question about Holly's presentation, those questions are also really very welcome. Someone here in the back wanted to have you on. Ah. Matthias. Uh, you wanted uh, to ask something too. Christian, oh. have you looked at the microhabitats? Because, I don't know, at least in Croatia, uh, Nausitoius likes a little bit overgrown habitats. This meadow won't be perfect for, for Nausitoius. For Thales, yes, but usually, at least in Croatia, um, Nausitoius goes much to the edges or a little bit closed habitats. And also, it, then it's uh, the problem with overgrowing. We lost it on several locations where we have it now and some others nearby. Yeah, thanks. We, like I said, we have to look a little bit closer and in details. It's, well, like I said, this area, the focus was on vegetation for nearly 30 years now. And now we start a little bit to have more focus on uh, yes, insect groups, I would say, where we focus a lot. We have, uh, we made the monitoring of the grasshoppers, of the dragonflies, of the butterflies, of this group, even birds. And 
but I still know these areas now since 30 years and I was used to go out there and find loads of Nausitus and only a few of Teleus and 30 years are a long time. I think you get used to some schemes in your head and you are very surprised or we were all very surprised when we find just the opposite the, the last two years. I, yeah, I'd like to add some some observation about the, the this discussion about climate change and, and, and how that effect may may affect uh, the species. We have many observations at many localities where we had this drought in the recent years, and where the normal for those areas normal mowing regime with two cuts, one before the flight period and one after the larval period, uh, was clearly done and it was very nice and was perfect. Uh, but the first cut is in a time when there was no rain anymore, so that there was no regrowth of any plants, no flower buds there. So that obviously affected uh, the, the communities, the, the populations of Nausitus and Teleus, both of them affected, because they, they don't get any resources anymore. Yeah. So we, we tend to recommend uh, to, uh, to, to leave larger areas, Quite, quite, quite big pieces of the land uncut on the first cut to have some resource in case there's a drought again mm. so, and the cut areas don't regrow again. Mm. So that's 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 a very close um, interaction between these different climate fluctuations that we see now and the mowing regime. I think we have to adapt our our management to the new situation of the mowing. And I think, in, I mean, that's close to the Alps. It has much more rain. It's much more moister soil. So that's a bit different to those areas that, that I know, that, that I'm working. But nevertheless, it might be interesting and, and keep that in mind uh, when exploring the reasons. Yeah, thanks for the input. Maybe in connection to that, maybe general comment, sorry, climate change and droughts, because also in Brandenburg we also had very severe droughts and we have also uh, sandy soil, so afterwards there's hardly any flowers anymore. And we noticed that especially species really which are specialists for these very dry areas have a big problem. So if they don't have a place to go, if there are, for example, wetlands nearby, uh, where there's still flowers, then that can disappear. So we also have to think that species we think they are well adapted to uh, drought and dry conditions, they might be even quickly disappear if they don't have a place to go. Mm. And we had uh, we, we saw the uh, fast population declining. So I think diversification somehow in the habitat is very important and more important than ever uh, to, to um, survive climate change. Exactly. Yeah. I would like to add that diversification at landscape scale is equally important. Are there any more questions? Okay, Miguel has a question for Holly. Yeah, uh, Holly, uh, uh, can you tell us when when is the next uh, Living Planet Index report uh, going to take place? Or <laughs> it's because it's because it's not published every year. It's uh, so. The next one, I think, will be 2024, but a more realistic aim for the R project is to publish in the 2026 one. So, so you don't think you will have it ready for 2024? Uh, I mean, the butterflies, I mean. Uh, will well, will I there be some butterflies in it or, or, or not yet? Probably not yet. Okay. Because it, it, yeah, so, I mean, uh, they take a while before. Well, we are aiming for 26 then. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Or I see you're all uh, up to having a cup of coffee. So enjoy uh, the break and just go on with all the discussions with the government. Very good. Yeah, so the other thing is, um, so uh, what a few people have asked me if they can have e your all your email addresses. So yes. for data protection, I have to ask if anyone objects to sharing your email amongst this group, just with with all the group. So what I'll do is I'll send an email to everybody 
but not blind CC it. So up to now, I've been blind popping for data protection reasons. But I want to now send an email so you all have each other's emails. Okay? Yes. Everyone's happy? Good. Over to you, Sam. <laughs> Good, but uh, my pleasure to chair this next session policy. Um, I bet if I asked everybody, would they still monitor butterflies if, if we didn't use your data? And you would probably say yes, you would do it anyway because you love butterflies. But actually, what's really important is what you do with it. And, and the purpose of this session is to provide some policy context for what the EBN is. So we start with a message. From Martin Poissy, is I'm told his pronunciation from the MAP from Czech Republic, and he's on screen now, so I invite you to listen. <laughs> Dear coordinators, experts, delegates, and above all, friends of butterflies, my name is Martin Poissy. I'm a member of European Parliament from Slovakia. In the Parliament, I'm also known as the member who pushed through the spring parliamentary preparatory action that you might know. <laughs> First of all, please allow me to express my apologies for not being able to join you in this meeting in person and for actually sending you via video link instead. Sadly, constituency and family related matters prevented me from greeting you in person. But regardless of the format of my intervention, I would like to thank you for the possibility to share a few thoughts with you. As you might know, the European Commission published its nature restoration law proposal before the summer break, and the European Parliament, which means us members in this house, will be soon attending this proposal for a regulation. This piece is supposed to lead to a great revival of nature, of the fabric of life, which we all have seen degrading so quickly in the last couple of decades. Since the beginning of my mandate, I have been advocating for better protection of pollinators being the precious wild ones and actually very unknown ones or the managed ones. But the well-being of all those becomes challenged by negative farming practices, pollutants, and the cocktails of the pollutants in the environment, loss of habitat, and so on. Therefore, I was very happy to see that one of the goals of the legislative proposal on the next range restoration law is to restore the populations of pollinators. This goal will not be possible to accomplish without you and your work. And so I would like to voice my support and words of encouragement with you. I'm thrilled to know and to see that you are able to work on a solid monitoring across the European Union. We, the policymakers, need to know the data and need to know your assessments. Those are relevant not only in the context of the nature restoration law, but for making necessary adaptations in other related and relevant policy as well including the agriculture. I do understand that your situation is not easy across all the member states. Some countries are having rather well greater and well development and established monitoring, lucky for them, but some are just about to make the first baby steps now. I believe that my country, Slovakia, is one of those. In, and it's, we need to do a lot of work to be done in this respect. Although I do witness and actively fight backsliding in this, in my very own country and in several areas, I would like to stay optimistic when it comes to pollinators. Not because they would suddenly start to prosper across Europe and Slovakia, but because there is a wonderful group of dedicated people, you. I sincerely believe that your hard work and the passion can make butterflies and other pollinators thrive across the union. I want to believe that our rural landscapes, meadows, but also cities can become a colorful, rich playground for butterflies, hoverflies, and bumblebees once again. And in order not to call only on you to continue in your efforts, I would like to also make at least a small commitment here to, on my side, I would like you to know that I will do my utmost and best to help you in your work as well. And also, hopefully, in terms of sound legislative amendments, working hand in hand to restore the environment, conserve pollinators, and fight for these policy objectives on the European level. But also by trying to secure the necessary resources for this work, because without money, things don't move. And to invest in young generations of protectors of pollinators, helping to protect them. 
I will finish my long speech now and let you engage in much more pleasant in-person exchange. <laughs> let me wish you a great meeting and please do not hesitate to reach out to me or my office if you need anything. Thank you very much and thank you for your work. Okay, right, we just working again. We that works. So, dear coordinators, please. <laughs> So our first talk is uh, is from uh, on, from Sue Collins on the EU policy context, and I've always wanted to say this: <laughs> you need no introduction from me. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sam, and thank you very much to Martin and uh, his office, Monica Verdon, who some of you may know has been a tireless supporter of ours and uh, was the fundamental person in the European Parliament who secured the support, both the ABLE study, ABLE pilot project, and subsequently for spring. So we owe a debt of gratitude to them and uh, to Martin, who uh, is going to uh, continue to help us in the days and weeks ahead, and who particularly has asked us to suggest any amendments that we want to see to the European draft nature restoration law that I'm going to cover in my talk. So the structure of the session, because it's quite complicated. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the nature restoration law, the pollinator recovery target, and the EU pollinators initiative rest, uh, revision. Then Eden is going to talk about forest issues, and then we can have some Q and A. And then I'm going to talk about the use of indicators and data to improve conservation and restoration. Then Holly is going to um, uh, give you some information about the pledge process and uh, the information that we've put together that you can use in discussions with member states. Then we've got Xavier and uh, Simona. Lars is going to speak later in the volunteer session um, and a discussion about how we can uh, intensify discussions with member states on these uh, important policy innovations of the particularly the nature restoration law but also the voluntary pledges to improve the status of uh, habitat directed species and to increase protected areas for red list species so a bit of context these are the recommendations that bce and i promoted in 2020 set a binding pollinator recovery target set binding ecosystem recovery targets, use data. This is uh, all set out in the ABLE policy brief, copies of which are outside for you to pick up if you want. So as Martin has just said, uh, your data is useful for monitoring the CAP strategic plans that have been uh, drafted by member states. It's useful for other sorts of plans where there is EU money available underspent in regional policy and so on, on biodiversity. Natura 2000 management plans are a really important instrument for getting conservation objectives for butterflies and moths and their habitats into the practical management system on Natura 2000 sites. Prioritised action frameworks are a thing that the member states have put together which is trying to work out the costs of managing natura properly so all your member states have submitted paths to dg environment and they add up to i think about uh 10 billion a year and there's lots of money potentially available so uh the next lot of policy recommendations are um Reducing pesticide use. So reducing these pressures, nitrogen is well known to be an overwhelming pressure on some grasslands in particularly in Western Europe. Pesticides, we are in a very, very dirty battle with the pesticide providers who are like the tobacco industries and lie about the lack of impact of their pesticides on biodiversity and Simona and others are busy researching that and uh, producing the evidence that more needs to happen. There's a target in law, in the strategy 
to reduce pesticide use by 50% and reduce the use of toxic pesticides. And of course, neonicotinoids are effectively banned in the EU, although there are derogations which are problematic. Derogations means member state doesn't have to do what it's told. Um, so abandonment, we all know, is a really issue, big issue. Money needs to be put into restoration of recently and long-term abandoned meadows. And an issue that I'm very concerned about that doesn't get much press, which is larval food plant availability. There's lots of people who merrily think they can plant a few bits of nectar and everything will be all right for pollinators. But actually, you need larval food plant resources for butterflies and moths, and you need nesting sites for bumblebees and etc. So there's more to it than uh, most policymakers and politicians and people in the countryside think oftentimes. We need more open habitats, edges and forests and woods, and Aidan will talk more about that. Urban is important, and I think we're hearing more to learn from you, Amanda. Climate action, so the nexus between climate change and biodiversity. We're hearing earlier this morning about the really important changes in weather as a result of climate change affecting outcomes. And uh, yeah, monitoring and reporting is absolutely crucial. So that's the context that you know, I advocate for in all the European meetings I go to in Brussels with member states and the uh, Commission and uh, the presidencies of the EU and have been giving the same sort of messages for over a decade. Um, and they eventually get through. I'm very repetitive. So we had a change in May 2021. The EU biodiversity strategy was published. Now, just to emphasize the difference between a strategy and a law. Strategies contain soft targets. They contain aspirations and member states sign up to them. Law means they have to do certain things. So in May 21, we had the strategy. Excellent degree of ambition as a result of pressures from everywhere for decades. Uh, it's about restoration and ecosystem recovery and biodiversity recovery. It included a soft target of reversing declines in pollinators by 2030. We and the other NGOs were pushing for funding targets at that stage. So it came with a policy commitment. Also protected area network increased to 30%. It's probably about 26% at the moment. And um, also strict protection for 10% of the EU area. There's a, a good um, commitment to halting the deterioration of all listed habitats and species. That's very ambitious. Whatever the condition they're in, some of them are in favourable but could go down. A lot of them are in unfavourable and are also going down. Um, so, uh, improving the conservation status trends by 2030 for 30% 30 of occurrences of listed habitats and species. So, that's around the pledge process that is voluntary on member states, and Holly's going to talk a bit more about that later. So just a bit more information about the protected areas target, and I have to say that the work that Chris and others are doing on important butterfly areas is very timely, and um, there's a requirement to uh, increase protected areas, and this can include not only Habitats directed butterflies, of which there are 20 odd or 30 in both annexes, um, but also red listed species. So the red list update is a really critical thing, and it could be red lists at EU level, or it could be Mediterranean, or it could be national. But if you've got a red listed species that you really think ought to be uh, covered by more protected area in your country, lobby for it, push it, talk about it, talk to your government. Um, the other really good thing in the strategy is the recognition that actually paper Natura 2000 sites are not enough. You do need to actively manage them. And there is a legal obligation to set conservation objectives on uh, special areas of conservation. And we need to include um, butterflies in those objectives. And we can draw on uh, do's and don'ts. Um, we need to develop those at a another kind of level so that they are relevant to science. And um, 
EU member states are expected to improve the quality of their Article 17 reports, which are the ones on favourable conservation status or otherwise of listed habitats and species. And they're supposed to use data rather than expert opinion, and they're supposed to do surveys. The reports are every six years. The next tranche, I think, if I'm correct, Chris, is in 2024. I think it was 2018 was the last last reporting period. So your countries ought to be doing the monitoring now. And I know some of you are paying paid to do that. Not everybody is, but it's actually a policy commitment that's been accepted. So the other the other part of the soft policy targets is um, the pledge process. And this includes the protected areas extension for red list species and others, umbrella species, whatever that means, but we claim that butterflies are an umbrella species. Ensure no deterioration and this uh, obligation to uh, increase the status of at least 30% of species and habitats. And that was uh, the subject of the pledge process. So um, we had this uh, event in March, which you may remember online, in which we had all uh, these um, discussions with member states, and I hope some of you have followed them up. I know in Germany, SEP has put forward uh, a couple of um, butterflies to be included in pledges, but I'm not aware of anyone else actually coming forward with uh, specific proposals to their member states. There's still time. And then uh, we come on to the draft nature conservation, the nature restoration law, which was published in uh, the summer, as uh, Martin Hoysack said. So this has overarching objectives. And now this law, which is a regulation, which will have immediate effect in member states, as distinct from a directive, which needs transposing international law. The nature restoration law is like the cap. Great. It's a regulation. It has to be followed. The thing that makes it different from CAP is it doesn't include money. Uh, and as Martin said, that's essential. So by 2030, we cover 20% of the land and sea with restoration measures, and by 2050, have solved it all. Um, and some of the binding requirements, so we had the soft policy commitment, now we've got binding requirements, reversing the decline of pollinators by 2030, monitoring of pollinators will become compulsory for member states, there are, they have to draft nature restoration plans with funded measures using EU and national funds, and there have to be indicators for agroecosystems. So just to uh, give you the heads up on what the law, the draft law actually says. So it's Article 8 you need to look out for. Shall reverse, shall is a strong word in legal circles. Increasing trend measured every three years. So not hugely ambitious uh, compared with the EBMS, but three years is at least twice as fast as six years from habitat structure. Um, methods of monitoring have to be agreed. At the moment, uh, there's going to be a discussion about how the grassland indicator is uh, done. And it does say annual data has to be collected, so they're going to be really dependent on us. It won't surprise you to know, as I said the other day, that there's some opposition to the level of burden that member states feel this uh, monitoring requirement places on them. And the forestry industry is mounting a disgraceful campaign of misinformation on this. And Martin Hosek's request to us is to suggest amendments to strengthen the draft law so that he can play those off against those who want to weaken it. So if you could have a think and let me know as soon as possible, if you can think of anything that could be improved or plausibly added to the nature conservation, nature restoration law, please let me know because we have to give them to him by the middle of December or early January. Um, nature restoration plans could be more ambitious. And we in the board discussed the thing that something on management effectiveness could maybe be added. And also on funding. And uh, there's a proposal there. 
So uh, Annex 4 is also important because um, there are targets for agroecosystem recovery, which is excellent. And there we are. The Grassland Butterfly Index is referenced as a requirement, and we need to reverse the decline in that. And then there's another one, share of agricultural land with high diversity landscape features. Unfortunately, the drafting currently excludes grazing, so we need to uh, suggest an amendment there. Also, the farm and bird index and obviously the stock of organic carbon is really important and drain peatlands. OK, the other um, thing I wanted to say that um, there are some benefits to having binding EU pollinator recovery targets. So first of all, it gives teeth to the policy, soft policy commitment. Um, it really gives you the baseline that you can argue for funding because of this current situation, which I'll talk about more in my further presentation. Um, yeah, so it, it reinforces the need for agriculture policy reform and mainstream you know, monitor, field monitoring in policies. And of course, butterflies resonate with the public. So they're, they're kind of hard to argue against in, in, uh, in public circles. And in Bavaria, there's been this wonderful, um, uh, is it a petition to save pollinators? So that's a really important demonstration that the environment thinks is important mm -hmm. at about a million signatures. And then the EU Pollinators Initiative. Now, this was an existing initiative that we helped to promote in 2018. Three targets or three themes improving knowledge, which is the underpinning policy for our work, understanding causes and consequences. Least progress has been made in that area. Raising awareness and engaging society at large and promoting collaboration has been quite good. It was reviewed in 2021 and we responded to all the consultations and so on. I've attended uh, at least uh, three of the expert workshops that were held, protected areas, agriculture and uh, pesticides, and we've made recommendations to the EU and member states on this. And the, I'm a member of the EU Pollinators Expert Working Group where um, the priorities for the revised initiative are being drafted. One of the things I've been pushing is adding typical species of pollinators, the typical species of the habitats directive habitats, which host pollinators, because at the moment there are no bees or hoverflies in the habitats directive annexes. And this is a way of, and this, this commanded a lot of support among colleagues actually, this is a way of getting a requirement into the management plans to look after bees and hoverflies as well as listed uh, butterflies. And could apply to non-listed butterflies as well if we manage to get them to develop these uh, lists of typical species. At the moment, it's very random. So some countries don't put any list, uh, typical species in their standard data forms and other countries do. There's no harmonization. So it's a, a technical point really. And as as uh, I said before, the need for monitoring is acknowledged very strongly by the expert group. So we expect the revised initiative early in 2023. So thank you to all of you, all your volunteers, all the coordinators, BCE board, BCE partners, BC spring partners. Without all your work, my advocacy would be just hot air, but it's actually evidence-based. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sue, for that great overview. Um, as those of you know, Sue will know she works tirelessly on policy matters for BCE, but it's been very fortunate now to have some support through Aidan Whitfield, who's uh, helping us out. So Aidan's going to talk about the EU forestry strategy 2030. This way works. Thank you, Aidan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, Sue has taken the lead, particularly on uh, grasslands, which is the most important uh, habitat for, for butterflies. Uh, and, and I have uh, been take, trying to take a lead on the, uh, on the, on the issue of the forest strategy and, and forests. Um, so the 
Um, so the, um, the EU biodiversity strategy, which Sue has already mentioned, came out in, in May 2020. And um, as well as being the overarching strategy and it had a, a, talked about a lot of things, it made some specific recommendations about forestry. So the, the first one was to increase the quantity of forests and improve their resilience. The planting of at least 3 billion additional trees by 2030, if you can get your head around a number quite as big as that. And a commitment to develop a dedicated forest strategy by 2021. So there it was, the high level soft targets, but, but some, uh, some key uh, developments in progress. Um, the main issues that have come out about the forest strategy <clears throat> have been firstly, um, and, and this is just a sort of list of the, of the big issues that are under discussion, uh, is protection of primary and old growth forests, reducing the EU renewable energy subsidies for using forest biomass, which some countries are using just as an excuse to chop down forests and, uh, and put them into power stations, to stop planting monocultures, to stop growing trees on drained peatland, which uh, doesn't go down very well in certain countries that have a lot of forest on drained peatland, such as, the, such as Finland and Sweden. Um, another one which has appeared particularly after, after this summer is uh, actions to prevent and reduce forest fires after the problems that we've seen this year. And also a commitment to reduce the loss of biodiversity. Now, those are the issues that are being talked about. BCE only has the policy resources to focus on the issues which are relevant to Lepidoptera. There are other NGOs such as FERN who are focusing on all the issues. So there are a number of other NGOs who are, who are really forest NGOs uh, and we're talking to them, but they're taking the lead uh, overall and they're, they're running things, but we're trying to keep up with, with that de debate. So one of, the, one of the things that I did was uh, in April of last year, there was an EU consultation on the proposed forest strategy. And I wrote the response for that, um, highlighting six particular issues which were relevant for Lepidoptera. The first was the importance of open spaces within forests. The second one was um, the need for monitoring and mentioning the woodland butterfly indicator and getting a, a, an advert in for that. And also then talking about the importance of traditional management techniques which have stopped uh, over the last 60 years, particularly instance, for instance, uh, coppicing in, uh, in woodlands. And, and then looking at the three different sort of categories of forests, for protected forests, um, I stress the need to prioritise the top five pollinator forest types, which are listed in the Habitats Directive. For non-protected forests, again, the importance of traditional management and of looking after the edges of woodland, which doesn't really get a mention very much from any of the other NGOs. And when it comes to new forests, um, that three billion target is all well and good, but um, Forests should not be, the, the, ten, the risk is that people will plant forests on the low value agricultural land, but that's often the land that's the most important for the butterflies. So I made the point about not on grassland, not on peatland, you've got to have the right tree in the right place. It's no good planting three billion trees and swamp and covering up some other important habitat. So that was uh, April of 2021, and, and then in July 2021, the EU forestry strategy uh, was, was published, and it included measures for strengthening forest protection and restoration, enhancing sustainable forest management, and improving forest monitoring and planning. So pretty much what we expected, uh, and, some, and some good measures in there. So looking ahead to the future developments that are going to happen in the next year or so based on that forest strategy, um, there will be a new EU framework for forest managed monitoring and strategic plans. 
Um, and there was another consultation on that, which I responded to uh, just last month. And in the next six to nine months, there will be a number of EU guidelines published. Um, one will be on defining primary and old growth forests because um, the NGOs in particular are very keen on the uh, protection of primary and old growth forests and certain countries that want to cut down their primary and old growth forests, notably Poland and Romania, have a very strange definition for what they think a primary and an old growth forest is. So uh, there's quite a bit of work. So there's a, a need for a definition there. Um, and one that's of particular interest to us is closer to nature forest management which I think people will recognize from work that we've done previously on um, management techniques such as coppicing, on looking after woodland edges in particular. And um, also uh, issues around biodiversity friendly afforestation and reafforestation. So it's not just about looking after the existing forest, it's also about what you do when you cut down your current monoculture, um, what, are you going to, what are you going to replace it with? Uh, and that's uh, that's an important area to follow. So um, there's quite a few developments coming through. These documents will come through in the next um, in the next six to nine months, and the the NGOs have been fairly strongly involved in uh, in shaping those uh, those guidelines. So that's where we are with with forestry. And I think we're making some making some progress. We have a rather different take on forestry compared to the other NGOs. So I think it's a matter of keeping our our effort in there. And I think there's also something of a, a compromise that we can promote because in, in, order to, in order to help the butterfly habitats, we don't need the, the forestry industry to change everything that it does. If it simply changed what it did in two or three percent of the forests around the edges and got the edges right, it would probably make a big difference. And I think there's a, there's a sort of a compromise area there that we can try and, uh, and, and promote. Thank you very much. Soon I'll take any questions. Thank you, Aidan, and for all the work you're doing on the forestry strategy. Uh, questions? I'm a little concerned about this target to increase uh, forests because uh, in many areas, like for example Germany, we have a large uh, areas of forests already. And it's just about the quality, of course. But then, if you plant new ones, I think the only way uh, not to destroy biodiversity would be to plant it in agricultural land. Mm -hmm. But then there is, of course, the competition, and then farmers will complain. So I think this is very, very. Risky. I think also we have so much forest in Germany that we don't really need more. We need just better forest. So um, I'm a bit concerned about this target because this could actually, for example, there might plant even what you didn't mention. You mentioned some things like peatland and grassland, but what about open spaces in forests, which are very important? Now, yes. should they fill these spaces in the forest? That would be the worst. No? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, I very much agree. And I think that's one of the areas we need to keep. We need to keep pushing on that, uh, you know, it's got to be the right tree in the right place. Um, certainly in, in urban areas, I think there is more can be done and to, to help in, in urban areas, particularly um, in urban areas that are becoming very hot and very uncomfortable to live in with, with climate change. There, there is more can be done there. But, uh, but yeah, there are some countries where really additional forest cover can only mean reduced food production, which is not necessarily a good thing. Things I just had, of course, the three billion trees derives from a planet uh, ambition mm. because it's seen as one of the most important planet sinks. And of course, grassland's role in the planet regulation and adaptation is underplayed. I have a question slash comment for Sue. So uh, on the other, on the one hand, we have the new restoration strategy and uh, law uh, so coming up soon. And on the other hand, we have a, a massive uh, construction plans for a renewable energy uh, resource, uh, renewable energy uh, infrastructure. So we, at least in Greece, we see a lot of natural and semi-natural habitats being destroyed 
and now they take advantage of the situation uh, with uh, because of the war between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, and uh, they uh, destroy a lot of uh, natural habitats, and this is a big issue. And I see there is uh, there are two uh, different uh, 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 policies that uh, um, are controversial. Absolutely, I, I completely agree because um, obviously, obviously um, development pressures have grown all over Europe for the last 20 years or so and the need for coherence between policies is clear and uh, of course the economic pressures to develop are all there so we have to fight even harder to preserve our so what we've got, it's not only restoration, it's look after the best and restore the rest is my kind of uh, thing. And um, yeah, I mean, you have to use the Habitats Directive, we have to use the law, we have to use whatever mechanisms we have and the evidence that are produced in monitoring are really important at site level to fight, um, to fight developments. And I think as butterfly people, we're uh very underpowered in our in our um, ngos and so on you know we've got a few ngos but, i mean butterfly conservation europe is impoverished uh what we need is to campaign um we need to work with other ngos so i work with all the ngo networks in brussels in the european habitats forum you know wwf uh, um, international bird life international the european environmental bureau and others with more sway and more say um, but it's a continuing and, and really hard fun to protect what we have and to invest in the future. Okay, but I especially we haven't got any time for another couple of questions at most. Um, concerning the upcoming guidelines that are going to be published next year, how much influence can we take to? bring in the experience that we have about, especially about biodiversity, friendly forest management to, to we have a lot of initiatives of practical work going on there and uh, practical experience, how that works and what we can do. So it'd be nice to feed that in as a background. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to, uh, to, to, feed, to feed those in and refer to publications that we've already made. Um, and we've we've seen some some early some early drafts of uh, of those, uh, but it's quite yeah it's quite a quite a lot of work to keep up with the with the uh, with the idea. But I, I think you know at least you know the EU is coming up with some guidelines, and uh, when they and we've all as as you say we we already know that within our own communities, but getting our our thoughts and our experiences put into EU guidelines will give it a lot more strength to those. To those ideas and pushing those ideas forward, and I think I think some of them, particularly around the the effort around woodland edges, where where people don't have to sacrifice too much of their land, they only have to look after some of it. I think will 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 strike a, a, a chord with the uh, with the forestry industry and be and be actually feasible. Whereas some of the things that some NGOs are asking for are, are really, <laughs> much more difficult to achieve. Thank you. Apparently, I misread the time table. We have time for more questions. Yeah. So anybody else have to do? Um, Aiden, in Belgium, there are some uh, nature NGOs that are trying to make to create so-called airco forests, mm -hmm. so dark and cold, so that people on hot days can have a walk in a cold forest. But so I think you should not just aim the forestry industry, but also you should tell nature organisations that hey, that's it's not a good plan for butterflies to try and create these airco forests. So yeah. you should also aim these nature and genes. Right. But, but, you know, the, the, it's, it's part of the mosaic, isn't it? You, you need the open areas within forests, you need open and wide rides, but you also need some shaded areas. You know, because you know, it's a, in, in Belgium in the winter, you don't really want to go for a walk in a cold, dark forest, do you? Even, even now. So uh, you need to have that mixture. And I think the problem with forestry over the last 40 years is it has simply been run by the forestry industry for the forestry industry, monoculture right up to the edge. <clears throat> and, and that's not good for biodiversity. It's not good for tourism because those forests are dark and cold. 
And it's an absolute disaster when it comes to fire management because the fire just comes along, jumps over the road and heads off on the other side. You know, they need wide rides on their, on their forests. And you've got to think about that for 30 years and keep, keep those areas clear because when the, fo when the fire starts, you know, you haven't got time to chop down those forests and create those fire breaks. They've got to be there already because if you, you and, and you actually need wide roads just, just so the fire, the fire prevention people can get in without being burned to death. Um, so, you know, the, the, the openness of forests and structure, um, I think is something that's important for a whole variety of reasons, but it's, it's not what the forestry people have been used to doing for the last 40 years. They plant right up to the edge. I mean, we've seen in the UK, they plant right up to the edge of the railway line. And then when the wind blows, when we get a storm, it blows all the power lines down and the railways all stop. Complete lack of maintenance work to keep the trees away from the railway lines. But it means you get extra tree. Are there any more questions for us? So you both work at uh, the law and legislation and strategy level, but I was wondering if you also involve uh, the business certification level, such as, uh, I mean, I don't know, butterfly friendly wood for construction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a label existing, but if it's something that could be another uh, same thing for agriculture, uh, we want to have local food, but at the same time, we want to protect some area. If we plant forests or protect and export the food production and import the food, it's maybe not a good solution also. So I was just wondering if you also work on the supply chain and the market and the businesses, uh, because maybe government is working in, the, in some way, legislation is working in some way, but the public also has a vote every time they buy, they mm -hmm. spend a pound or a euro or a krona. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it would be it would be look it would be ideal to be able to do that. I just don't think we've got the resources to do it at the moment, and the and the initial priority for the for the moment is to get these is to get this nature restoration law in place. I mean the the EU. It's clear that the Commission has um, eventually, after about ten years, started to listen to what Sue's been telling them, um, and and in a whole and a whole lot of other areas. Have actually started to produce new laws. So you know, the Habitats Directive was good, but it didn't really work very well. And they've actually started to add new laws above that. And you can see the progression from you know able and then spring of actually building an, an argument of building that system for, for, for instance, for butterfly monitoring. So that only now can they propose that butterfly monitoring is mandatory. They couldn't have done that five or six years ago because because. Half the countries in Europe would have said, well, how on earth can we do this? We haven't even got steam. So they've built up to that. But, but you know, our focus with the resources we have so far has simply been to progress with that and try to get this nature restoration law in place. And the fact that we've got, you know, uh, the grassland butterfly index put in as a mandatory target in an EU regulation is a, is a tremendous achievement. And that's just taken all of our resources so far. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Better, but um, consumer pressure is a is a potential lever. Uh, we simply haven't engaged with the process because we, you know, half a day a week. You know, it's not enough. Um, and there's a business and biodiversity strategy. There are heaps of potential levers, and that is why empowering BCE with more resources to actually engage at member state level and in some of these. EU level initiatives like labelling and so on. I mean, I can I can put my two penny worth in, and I do. But as to actually uh, doing anything significant, there's another. There's a taxonomy regulation. Who's heard of the EU taxonomy regulations? Absolutely no one. Actually, within it, there is a requirement on sectors to do no significant harm to biodiversity. Now, you know. Most sectors are doing significant harm to biodiversity. How do they police it? They have a tick box. You know, uh, self certification. I'm doing no significant harm. If we had, if we had the resources to get in there and, shh, you know, you are doing significant harm in this case, we could be powerful. We do a lot. We punch above our weight, and you know, we go to lots of the absolutely key EU biodiversity 
discussions and sexual discussions. And uh, my plea is to find money for the BCU. Okay. Yeah, that will take a cut off there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for your interesting question and answers. So, um, Sue is going to talk that next about the flow indicators and the policy context mm -hmm. for measuring translation effectiveness. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all your relevant questions and, you know, for your efforts on these areas. I'm now going to remind you that uh, some years ago, uh, Chris and the rest of BCE published the do's and don'ts for um, management for butterflies, the Habitats Directive, which of course is relevant also to uh, other butterflies. And um, we heard earlier about uh, the importance of managing for variety. So, as Irma said, variety and diversity at a landscape scale is really important. And also within a site or an area, the grazing management needs to leave uh, areas of refuge. It needs to have different sward heights. It needs to have shade and, and, and you know, it has to have larval food plants, it has to have nectar. So managing for variety is really, really important. And we need to drive home those messages uh, at, I mean, I think they're driven home at the top level, but at member state level and at local level and in N2K management plans, we need to be able to advocate for more um, personalised, localised management objectives that maybe at biogeographic zone level could be uh, elaborated. I mean, it's a very good document, but more could be done there if we have the time. And it's very relevant to uh, the restoration agenda. So, um, as we all know, there's poor conservation status of butterflies in their habitats. There are on in the habitats directive. Holly can tell you, but I think there's uh, seven thousand occurrences of butterflies. I can't remember on um, Natura two thousand sites and. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, grass and habitats are important for non-listed butterflies and for other pollinators as well as listed ones. And the sources of data we have on this are, of course, the EBMS data, uh, the butterfly indicators, which we've now enabled. We did for grassland, for urban, for woodland, for Natura 2000, and for climate, although the climate one wasn't quite as uh, helpful as we uh, need. So there's there's indicator data organised by uh, Habitat, and there's the Article 17 of the Habitat Directive, which requires six months, uh, six six yearly updates by member states. And um, Holly's going to talk more about that. So another of the uh, things that uh, we've achieved is that the Grassland Butterfly Index is on the EU Biodiversity Strategy Dashboard. And this, if you if you Google EU Biodiversity Strategy Dashboard, you'll come to lots more information. You can look at the data sets, you can look at the documentation, you can look at the values. And this is um, what uh, the EA collates all these indicators. And ours is directly related to topic five of the EU Biodiversity Strategy, Reverse to Blind Pollinators. It's the only available long-term data set that's vaguely related to pollinators. Um, and it's indicator 501, Grassland Butterfly Index, and it's using to 91 as the reference level. And you see it's going down. And by 2030, that's got to go up. That will be mandatory. So that's uh, that's a really good kind of integration of our agenda into the high level uh, process. So um, just to give you a, an overview of uh, some of the evidence from the member states own Article 17 reports. And these are people who've had these sites for 30 years or more. And what have they done with them? Well, a quarter of them apparently are in favour of although the remaining data is a bit dodgy. Um, so three quarters of them, are either, well, 10%-ish are unknown, so that's unfigurable. 
and the rest are in unfavorable inadequate or unfavorable poor condition on the four parameters which are population size habitat for the species uh chris what are what are the other two parameters for prospects. future prospects which is a oh, what's the third one Can't remember. habitat quality yeah so then we come on to the habitat quality question and this is uh conservation status of the top five most important grassland habitats for pollinators. This is a this is a report that was prepared by uh, people for the European Topic Centre and it includes the important grasslands for butterflies. Uh, it also includes uh, these things, calcareous grasslands, hay meadows, species rich and wildest grasslands, and dry grasslands and tall herb fringe communities. Those are assessed as the most five most important habitats for insect pollinators, wild pollinators. So they're also in pretty poor condition. They're a bit better than the species themselves, in terms of butterflies, but 30% in favorable and um, fewer unknowns, but a very large proportion are unfavorable. And as you remember from the targets, at least 30% of those entries have to be in favorable conservation status trend by 2030. So they're prepared to leave 70% still in unfavorable, but. And just a map of where things are pretty bad or good. So dark green is good. So what we've got is that Estonia? Uh, Italy's not too bad. Spain and Portugal are pretty bad according to this. Uh, but I think Miguel has questions about the quality of the data and Holly is going to show you that the quality of the data is not very really good. But having said that, it's some data that the member states themselves have supplied and it's going to be the baseline for the improvement target. So we have to swallow the fact that it's not as good as it could be, but it does show a shocking picture uh, as a baseline for restoration. That's the grassland butterflies. And these are the ones of European importance and the rest of them. And this is the map for the habitats. Slightly better, but in some in the east, because agriculture hasn't yet ravaged all those areas. Whereas in Western Europe, which is partly nitrogen pressures, partly uh, habitat loss and development, as uh, Olga has pointed out. Um, well, no, Greece is, uh, you know, still hanging on there, but uh, pressures are building. So those, that's the baseline for the pledges as well. And here are the, in these reports, they don't only, only talk about conservation status, but they actually are forced to say what are the main pressures and threats, and what are the management measures that could support their recovery. So. When member states say they don't know what to do, that's not true because they've submitted all this evidence. And as you'll see, for grassland butterflies and the top most important grasslands, the high impact pressures and threats are rather similar. And so we know what needs to be done, what's most important, abandonment, overgrazing, you know, these things are not unknown to member states. They just need to invest in doing them. So that's one of them. And these are the conservation measures that member states themselves have said they need to put in place, which are maintain existing extensive grazing practices, uh, adopt mowing and grazing, reinstate appropriate practices at the EU level, and then you come down to Germany, local level. They know. They're the same things. They just need to get on and do it. And Holly has organised these uh, these pressures and these threats and these uh, management measures for each of the member states. So you have some very ex very explicit um, background briefs that she's going to she has produced for you to empower you to talk to member states and pressurise them to do the right thing, including in their cap strategic plans at the next iteration but also uh, in any other mechanisms like regional development uh, expenditure. So 
let's look at the positives. There are some things that many countries have done. So we've got the German insect plan, which has got 10 million euros. We've got the French butterfly species action plans, and we haven't actually heard from Matthew now. Where is he? Somewhere here. But there are, there we are, yeah, 32, I think 32 um, species action plans for butterflies in France. And uh, that's a great achievement, and they just need to be implemented. And then we've got some live projects. Irma's wonderful Blues in the Marshes, which is very successful. Metamorphosis, which has just started in Romania, Slovakia, and Hungary. Apollo, which has started in Austria, Poland, and Slovakia. And um, Aidan went to the uh, first uh, meeting for that, where they're doing some reintroductions. We may have some problems with that, but anyway. Uh, then some of you get paid for Member State Natura 2000 butterfly service. I don't know all of them, but I'm just suggested a few that I know of get paid to do these surveys. So they're once they're dated once every six years in reports. Uh, then there are 10 lucky countries, as Martin Hosset said, who get support for their butterfly monitoring schemes. And that means there are 18 that don't get any support. So that's another battle that we've been waging for um, some years. And then we've got the very important EU parliamentary projects of ABLE and SPRING, and in the past, the EEA has given Linda Schichting money to update the grass and butterfly indicator, and the SPRING project includes uh, some resource to update that, uh, which will be published, I think, next year. So, in conclusion, you know, there's support, there's policy support, and then there is uh, pledges to meet those soft targets in the strategy. There's the Article 17 baseline reports for the pledges on uh, conservation improvements for species. We've got the butterfly monitoring data. We've got the draft nature restoration law, which introduces binding commitments, and they need to be implemented. And we've got uh, another interesting commitment from the European Union, which is to spend 7.5% of the whole EU budget on biodiversity every year and have to prove it in 2024. And there's a tracking mechanism for that. And it has to be 10% in 2026. Um, and in, speed, in spring and so on, we're pushing for funding for part-time coordinators and data management for EBMS schemes. So we basically need much more action at member state level. I've probably done as much as I can at EU level. I can't really think of anything else that needs to go in the EU policy framework to support butterflies and their habitats. Maybe you'll think of something else that I could add. But basically, it's now down to member states to deliver. And that depends on all of you somehow finding the resources and the courage to speak up and use all these levers of change to get the change on the ground. So that's a challenge for this decade. Thank you very much. Okay, right, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, Holly, you're, you're up next. We can talk about the uh, Habitats Directive Article 17 report. So this presentation is about the pledge work that Sue was referring to in her presentation and um, basically what we would like um, national coordinators to do to discuss with their member states to get butterflies included as some of the pledge targets. I'll hold it closer. <laughs> yeah. So basically that's what I just said. <laughs> encouraging our partners to have further discussions with their member state officials about their country pledges. 
And also we're going to outline the data analysis and the tables we've created to help make this easier for member states and you guys to support the discussions. Uh, so the data has come from Habitat's Directive Reporting, Article 17, um, which requires member states to report every six years on the progress made with the Habitat's Directive implementation. And that is linked to Article 11 of the Habitat's Directive, which obliges member states to monitor the conservation status for all habitats, which are listed in Annex 1, and all species as listed in several annexes of community interest. Um, this means that the provision is not restricted to Natura 2000 sites only, and data need to be collected both inside and outside the Natura 2000 network to understand the true conservation status of species. The EU biodiversity strategy was adopted by the Commission on May 2020 with the goal of putting biodiversity on the path to recovery. A, um, the draft EU restoration law, which is related to the strategy, will set restoration targets for habitat types of the species protected under the Habitats Directive, as well as for the habitats of the species which are protected under the Habitats and Birds Directives. And member states must monitor the condition of habitats and prove continuous improvement. In March this year, Butterfly Conservation Europe and DG Environment organised a pledge workshop, which many of you will have attended, with the aim of promoting butterflies as good candidates to include in the member state pledges for conservation status improvements and also for halting deterioration. So, um, the EU biodiversity strategy targets are listed here. Within the species and habitats pledge, because there are two pledges, one for species and habitats and one for um, sites, we'll come to that later. But this one says that there must be no deterioration in conservation trends and status of all protected habitats and species by 2030. And that at least 30% of species and habitats which are not currently in favourable status must be in favourable status or show a strong positive trend by 2030. Mm -hmm. So to help identify species which um, might be selected to meet these pledge targets, we've made this data table. Um, it was quite a large table, so I hope that you can read it at the back. Um, but this is um, the Article 17 report from all the countries in the EU. And basically we have split them into each country, which we will be sending to you. Um, next week, hopefully. And this is an example table where I've just selected some random species and random countries to basically show the type of information that's in the table. Um, and the arrangement of this spreadsheet corresponds with the format of the pledge form to try and make it easier. So if you see um, the grey boxes at the top with the numbers, that's because that's the corresponding box that this would have to fill in. Um, it, for each butterfly species, which is um, over here, it details the conservation status, which is favourable, unfavourable, bad, favourable, um, unfavourable, and not good, that's the one. Um, and then the trend, increasing, stable or decreasing. And then we have um, measures of the population, the habitat, and the type of habitat it might be found in. Then we've also included the red list information um, for the Europe and for the EU 27 and any synonyms, so um, Maculinia is now Fengaris. Whether it's endemic or not, which um, you know, could suggest a priority in a certain country if it can be found there. Whether it might be an umbrella species, you can't see the full information in the box, but basically information that many people here provided to us. And then we've taken the recommendations in the management publication, Do the Don't for Butterflies, and matched them up to each species. Um, I'll expand these boxes later, but we've then, these categories up here are categories in the pledge form that you have to take. So we've rearranged the management ideas, they're all in here, which is easy to read, and then we've also split them into the relevant category that they match, which again, hopefully just to try and make it easier for member states to fill the forms in for butterflies. Um, this is an example for Germany, and then yeah, I've expanded some of the boxes here. So 
you can see that in the umbrella species, which you can't read on this slide, it actually says all of this. And then, um, oh yeah, this is Parnassus Apollo. Management ideas, do's and don'ts, with the coloured things matching what criteria you would need to pick to make that recommendation. And then, this is an expanded view of all of the boxes with a tick by tick management recommendation. Uh, why is the yes? Uh, this is another example for Portugal. Um, Portugal only has two species in this data table. And then I've shown again the expansion of the management do's and don'ts for Euphydrias aurinia. And then we move to the protected areas pledge, which again we've tried to make a similar data table for. Um, the relevant strategy targets here are that member states well, must legally protect the minimum of 30% of the EU's land area and to integrate ecological corridors. They must also strictly protect at least a third of the EU's protected areas, including all remaining EU primary and old growth forest. And they must effectively manage all protected areas, defining clear conservation objectives and measures and monitoring them appropriately. These targets are actually assessed at biogeographic region level rather than member state level, but um, for now, we'll show you the data tables we've made for each member state. So, as before, this one's a random example with random countries, just to try and give an indication of the data. Um, and I'll go through each column. This one's a, there's a key included in the slide, so you don't have to remember everything I'm about to say. But the first column is the country, then we have the site code, and then we have the species name and the species code, and they're all invertebrates, so there's a column that says that. And then we have a sensitive column, which is about whether the record is sensitive or not when it comes to publication. And the column after that, we're here now, non-presence in site, that demonstrates if there's been any local extinction since this list was made originally. Um, zero is for no, but there have been some local extinctions. Um, the population type column describes the status of the species population at that site. So P is for permanent. And then there's a lower bound and an upper bound column, which are the limits of the species population size or the estimate. The counting unit explains the unit that the population was measured in, which is in accordance with Article 12 and Article 17 reporting. Abundance category is measured in common, rare, very rare or present, um, D, P, R, and B. And then we have a data quality, which is an assessment of the quality of the data provided for habitats. Um, there are a lot which are considered data deficient, which is this D purple. Um, population is the size population column. The size and the density of the population of the species present on the site in relation to the populations present within the national territory. The conservation column is the degree of conservation of the features of the habitat which are important for the species. Isolation is the degree of isolation of the population present on the site in relation to the natural range of the species, so whether it's not very good connectivity for the species. And then there's a global column, um, we're here now, which is the global assessment of the value of the site for the conservation of the species. And then lastly, we've got area of the site in hectares, and we've coloured it. The large sites are dark green, and the small sites are pale green. Yeah, this is an example for Germany, um, ordered by site size, size of sites, smallest to largest. Um, because it's a big file, so it wouldn't all fit on the screen. And then again, from largest to smallest, for Germany again, you can see there's a lot of data deficient habitat quality. And it's not just Germany. Then I've done an example of Portugal as well, just ordered by site code. Again, you can see all the data deficient and all the gaps in these columns where there's just no data. <laughs> again, it's not just Portugal. <laughs> Looking at all the countries together, 
and all the data of the species and the sites, which we've called occurrences. Um, there are 4,701 in total. We found that there have been 113 local extinctions of butterfly species from sites since the combinations were originally listed in the Tura 2000 data, which is quite sad. Um, the quality of 1,991 of these habitat data assessments are rated as data deficient, while 204 just didn't provide any indication on how good the data was. Only 466 of these 4,701 sites are described as having an excellent degree of conservation of the features of the habitat, which are important for the species. And 1,124 sites are described as average or reduced conservation quality. And 448 species populations are considered isolated or population almost isolated on the site in relation to the natural range of the species, which again is demonstrating a lack of connectivity of some of these sites into their wider network. So, um, as we stated before, we'd like you all to try to talk to your member states authorities to get some of the butterflies included in these pledge targets. The deadline for this was December this year, the end of the year, but it's likely to be delayed until February 2023. Pledges are going to be published on an open online dashboard and the EU will hold a programme of five terrestrial biogeographic region seminars at EU level with stakeholders to assess the adequacy of the pledges. Um, this is after they've been submitted. So they'll start from March 2023 and probably last throughout 2023. And they will address the different zones. So boreal, Atlantic, continental, which includes Pannonic, Stepic and Black Sea, Mediterranean and Macaronesian regions. Management effectiveness is a crucial part of this and assessment of the methodology to measure this is under development. And a comprehensive analysis of coherence, connectivity, robustness and representativity of the network is planned by the European Environment Agency in 2023 to 2024. There will also be an important meeting, Natura Connect Project Meeting, on the 28th of February 2023 in Brussels, which will be looking at these issues. And there's a link to the meeting on the slide there. Um, so the next steps for Butterfly Conservation Europe and partners uh, to review the spreadsheets when I send them out to you next week and then try to set up meetings with national authorities to share the information and make recommendations. You know, um, obviously there will be country recommendations specific to species that you guys will know about and can add to the data to recommend species which will be included in prejudice to your national authorities. Um, yeah, that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Holly. That's a, a fabulous lot of work that she's been doing uh, for us. So I hope that at least some of you can have a look at these data sheets and consider trying to have a discussion with your member state. Matthias. Question? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was involved in the formulation of the pledges for Germany, and uh, we, we found it rather depressing um, finding species in any region within Germany that could be improved enough to, to uh, shift to, to, uh, to a better conservation status or have a strong positive trend. So in the end, because all, all the all species um, are so far from being in a, in a better state that that we yeah we didn't see any any reality in in a improvement for any of the species. I said suggested a few, but the federal states um, refused uh, to accept that um, because they they thought it's not possible with good arguments I could follow. So it's it's a rather depressing experience in this uh, in this context. So I wanted to ask. Um, what, what other experiences are there and how can we get to achieve something? I have to say that's a, a misreading of the situation by the German government. There is an obligation to halt deterioration and it's not just to get them into favourable status. So that is truly 
depressing if they're taking the view that because you can't get really better that you're not even going to bother to try and improve so i i think that you need to go back to them and challenge them on, on that with saying you know you need to do this to hold further deterioration because as you see from your spreadsheet some of those unfavorable status uh, reports are also declining so they've got to reverse those so they have to be included in the budget holding deterioration is i think that's a very clear point on which we can try but improving the status yeah but i don't see anything you've got there. you've got years to do it and and you know i mean the aspiration is there and i i don't accept that um because you can't get all the way that you don't do anything that's rubbish no, no, it's so i i just think you just need to push it more Holly. Yeah, it doesn't have to get too favorable. No, no, that's clear. It has to meet a strong positive trend. But you've got eight years. <laughs> if you start knowing or you invest in, uh, you know, whatever, raising, are you saying you can't change anything in eight years? I don't think so. That. I think you can turn some of these uh, previously abandoned places round in perhaps four years to start showing uh, a better trend. So. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any experience with these discussions. I have another question. Uh, I'm curious about the, how standardized the assessment of habitat area is, uh, because that will be quite important if uh, member states are supposed to increase the area. And I was uh, surprised to see how little habitat uh, was uh, suggested for Lucana Hale in Sweden, for example, it would be interesting to see whether people would uh, suggest that some species are uh, present in uh, much wider areas than they actually are, and some others are very restricted. So it would be interesting to, to hear opinions about how standardized those assessments are. Okay, I think Chris is the expert on Article 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but article, uh, I talk on this subject uh, because this is really Article 17 is a fairly straightforward report. So um, I somehow missed your point, then, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary how you assess the habitat area for some of these species. I know that uh, uh, for Sweden, for example, they, they have a very uh, well ill-defined way of doing so and, and the area uh, coverage will be quite important but yeah the, the, this is one of the flaws in the article 17 report because if you look at the population is quite clear uh, range is quite clear future prospects well you can discuss but principally they are quite clear but habitat is a combination it's a combination of habitat quality and area and that as soon as you get to that point, you can always interpret it. And that's what has happened. So I think this is simply a, a problem that should be solved um, uh, by the guidelines or whatever. Because you can include your uh, red list approach. The, the distribution ranges approach, uh, the, the, uh, yeah. but, yeah, the problem is, of course, you have a, 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 how do you compare a small habitat of good quality with a large habitat of poor quality? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to say what is better and when it's good, good enough for species. Mm -hmm. I think this is the, where the, the habitat directive reporting has a weak point. Mm -hmm. and I, 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 it, because the point is, of course, also it depends sometimes very much on an expert. When do you think it's good? And the area is good because it's the, it's the combination. It would be much more logical if you have is the area enough and is the quality good. It's a combination. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chris. Um, I mean, I think we don't need to get too hung up on uh, uh, those uh, issues, but there is a reporting and monitoring expert working with DU level 
where if you've got the time you put input into the development of the quality of the reports. So I mean I haven't and Chris and I haven't had time to engage with those, but it's a potentially important uh, process that's going on. Uh, Maybe, uh, Say something here. So, so you are correct. Uh, there is this, but I'm really are struggling with that because every member state has a very different view on this, and that's I think the reason why this is still not solved. There are uh, some countries who want to stick to the old, very vague system, and they have their reasons for that. And others want to to improve, but then they are. So this is all political. It would be interesting to see some sort of compilation of the different ways that people have done this. Yeah, yeah, well, you could write to, um, uh, what's her name? Zoinberger, isn't it? Karen Zoinberger at DG Environment. I mean, I think it would be, if you've got the time, it would be worth uh, putting that into the debate. But I would, I would encourage you as uh, butterfly people to rise above the squabbling about the definitions and so on at the moment, because it, the picture is quite clear. Lots of it's un unfavorable. We know what to do. Just get on and do it, and include it. Pledge to do it. Spend money on it, and get ready to meet the targets, which are in the nature restoration law. So, I think that's what needs to be done. Just get on with that. Emma. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid there's also a psychological element in it because um, much of us have been facing deterioration and loss of habitat for many, many years, and all our trials to get things improved always got the answer of it's not possible, it's too much you ask, it cannot be done. Um, you have to think of uh, economy and stuff like this. And um, I think it's, it's a big change now with the nature restoration law and the pledges that we can jump over these borders. But it really takes something from us to really do that, to just put your dreams on the paper, even though you know they will tell you it's not possible. They do it all the time. And now we have the chance to just break these kind of borders and really try to improve things. And I think we really, we really should do it, even though they will tell us they won't like it, just Matthias' experience told us. We just have to do it. Yeah, it, it, I, I think it's, it's useful to see there are two ways that the Commission could have could have achieved, tried to achieve what they're currently doing. One way would have been to revise the Habitats Directive. There's a requirement to review and update directives every 10 years. They didn't do that for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was going to be too slow because it would have taken time to revise the directive, then, they, then the revision would have had to be argued about, and then there would be three years to implement it, and then five years to implement it into national law. So it was all too slow. The other problem was that these poor quality Article 17 reports have been accepted by the Commission for years. So they were complicit in allowing this to happen. So they've left the Habitats Directive where it is, They've got the pledges process to try to remind people that actually their answers haven't been very good, but they haven't gone into that legal argument. What they've done is put another level of laws above that and said, right, leave the Habitats Directive where it is. Now we're really serious about it. Here's a nature restoration law, and they're talking about submitting nature restoration plans within 18 months of this law coming into force. So they, they put another level above, a new start to say, yeah, yeah, we know you've previous stuff wasn't good enough, and we allowed it to be not good enough, but we're going to make a fresh start and try hard with it. And, and I think that, you know, a number of member states, a number of particularly environment ministries, haven't really got that message yet that the EU is really quite serious about this. And we need to step up to that to that new challenge. Um, but but so, do, uh, so do all of our ministries in all of our countries. So, um... We okay. We'll take um, yeah. No, take your question, Miguel, and then I'd like to invite um, Xavier and Simona to come up and present a couple of slides about uh, the reporting that they've done from EBMS to member states and had some discussions uh, around these uh, not necessarily pledges, but the policy issues that I've raised uh, with. Uh, 
presentation. No, well, uh, mine is, is not really a question. It's a, uh, but uh, um, uh, it was funny to see that we are still um, giving the same messages that that we we put in into the the scene. 30 years ago, I mean, when I, when I started my PhD, I, I already <laughs> suggested that I, we need a traditional uh, land use and some things like that. So, so well, it, it's quite depressing, but in the other hand, it's uh, we've been very, very redundant in, in proposing this year after year. So I think sooner or later we will get it. And the other, the other thing I, I want to comment is that, well, I, I, I personally feel a, a little bit lost with all these all these issues, and I, I think some countries are, are doing great job with uh, with pushing in their uh, to the governments and things like that. But however, um, my comment is don't don't feel the press about this this big business coming on and, and uh, not having time time to to produce uh, pledges and things like that. And I, I, I just give you a, a, a small comment on that. When we started our BMS in, in 2014, um, I went to the Ministry of, of, well, not to the Minister, of course, but, but to some officials in the Minister um, to tell them, well, we have started this and we, we really need support. And they said, "Well, we were, we were just in the middle of a crisis in Spain, and, and it was it was appalling." And of course, he's well. The, the official told me, "No, it's impossible. We won't support this. We don't have money." But now, eight years later, eight years later, um, we have received quite a lot of money from the the Spanish Ministry Ministry of Environment because they thought it was the right moment. They had money to do it, so. My my reflection is that uh, don't uh, don't feel you you cannot do anything. Uh, I mean, probably it's just a question of of being uh, being a bit uh, uh, stubborn, I would say. So and, okay. and follow follow the follow the 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 pledge and and insist and so on. And I mean, sooner or later you may may, may get it through. So. Just a comment. Yeah, I absolutely agree with the girl. And it reminds me that in 1995, nearly 30 years ago, when I was director of policy of the English Nature Agency, um, I worked with European Environmental and Advisory Councils across Europe, and I chaired a working group on agriculture and biodiversity in nature. And we made recommendations for cat reform in 1995. I have that document. And we are delivering the same messages and the lobbies from the agricultural industry have prevailed for the last 30 years. Their time will come and now is not the moment to lose heart. I agree very much with what Anna says. Don't take no for an answer. Just keep <coughs> plugging what you know to be right and use the evidence. And eventually they'll come round and get the systems that you need and evidence. So, um, could we ask um, Xavier, please? Thank you. Thank you. This one? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, just a uh, just few words uh, to present a bit uh, how we managed to have uh, support from the Ministry and the relation we have with the Ministry in Luxembourg. Uh, so, the BMS started in Luxembourg uh, in 2009, when uh, in 2007, the reporting under the Article 17 was quite bad for Luxembourg, many species with some Many species with uh, an habitat with unknown uh, conservation statue, but also quite poor quality to to assess the, the statue. So the, we we list uh, Nicolas Tito, my colleague, uh, made a, a proposition of a national biodiversity monitoring uh, program, which uh, 
aimed, of course, to to produce uh, um, good quality data uh, for the species and habitat targeted uh, by the, the habitat directive. But uh, also, we had some arguments to say that uh, it's not enough. We should also include uh, common butterfly or, or butterfly from common landscape uh, in the national biodiversity monitoring. Um, for one reason is that nature biodiversity is not only in protected area or protected species, but also uh, elsewhere. It's in, in surface, it's, it represents more than the protected area. And also, uh, it could be an indicator to assess the Natura 2000 uh, actions to be served as a reference. Um, so, as I said, there's, there's, uh, so the squares represent uh, I hope you will see the squares represent the transects that were have been randomly selected with some more uh, in addition, but uh, with a uh, stratified random sampling uh, squares of one kilometer, and then we have transect in it yearly surveyed, and then uh, in 2016 we could add um, transect also the same method, but uh, to be used uh, to target. Uh, um, Canale, and then later Filga uh, Surinia and Arian in uh, protected areas. Um, yes. Uh, about uh, about um, meetings we have uh, with ministry contact we have so we have two times per year meeting where we present all our result observations. Unfortunately, we could we we had to prioritize um, the collection of that data or field uh, observations. And so we poorly analyzed uh, the, 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 the results. Um, but what helps a lot uh, is the grassland uh, indicator, uh, especially this one in 2016, where uh, there were results at the level of member states and where Luxembourg was highlighted as one of the country where um, the, the higher proportion of widespread species were in decline. Uh, so it helps a lot to, to trigger to uh, to to say that we we need to to do more and um, yes so we had uh, from that moment um, but at this moment we were missing resources for for analyze so finally in 2022 this year uh, recently we launched a uh, um, bio project which includes um, the production of national indicator based on butterfly counts where we are going to produce a more evolved model with modeling um, methods, uh, species abundance trends, uh, also the Luxembourg grassland indicator at, uh, yeah, at Luxembourg level. Um, also, I, I think it's uh, the Ministry of in charge of Environment is happy to, to have this to knock the door of the Ministry of Agriculture, saying, "Look what's happening in grassland." So that's also an agreement. Um, and uh, then also we are going to investigate at what level uh, those data because it's not fully representative of natural 2000 area, but at what level we can use, make a comparison with transects uh, between natural 2000 and common landscape. Thank you. Great, thanks Lafayette. And, um, Simona. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. The situ Italian situation is not so good. You can imagine a country that dedicates uh, really few efforts, um, mental efforts and um, economical efforts to, to biodiversity in general and butterflies as well. But my, just my suggestion is to, uh, similar to Miguel's suggestion, is to continue our role because if before or, or then someone reacted. Of course, so as you, we have been done a lot of work on butterflies uh, in our country. So we produce uh, checklists, red lists, databases, and that was normal for us. And we joined at the European level, thanks to the, the, the BCE. Um, but what I suggest to you is to use this moment because it's crucial. After Polymetro Initiative, the pressure from European Commission to member states was quite huge. Even Italy, <laughs> even in Italy, the, the idea that oh, we have to do something for pollinators. 
and the role of, uh, of BCE in the, in the work, of, especially of CERN, eh, the, the policy advisors of BCE, was crucial, at least in, 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 for the Italian ministry, because they had this meeting uh, about pledges, um, where they discover that, ah, we have some data about uh, pollinators. Uh, yes, we know. They know to have a red list, uh, butterfly monitoring scheme, but they didn't realize that it's something useful to answer the, um, the European Commission request. So, uh, awfully, I was involved in an advisory group uh, about um, uh, pesticides uh, since many years, uh, and this, uh, um, with ministry, and this advisory group became partially became an advisory group of pollinators, but just thanks to uh, to be there to tell them, okay, we uh, start with um, monitoring scheme, for example, they don't give up us money, we are in crisis, we have no money, very exciting project, well done, but we have no money, but I send them every workshop, every meeting, an email, just to keep them uh, in touch. And this became the, na uh, the, the National Pollinator Advisor Group, um, in which I can do what? Use the fantastic data that Holly produced uh, and give them the opportunity to say, we have something already, um, I can say, partial done, because it's also the, the format is similar to the format they have to fill in, so that's easier. And take into account that uh, each member state has to do this legis, uh, process, but that not means automatically that the butterfly are inside. They could also use uh, only birds or, I don't know, dragonfly or whatever. Um, in this case, it's our responsibility, at least for, for Italy, is, it was like that, to say our member states, uh, we have data, we have uh, something, not all, but something to work on pledges. And now we are working on pledges and butterfly are selecting thanks to this work we have done together. And I suppose that example could be similar to other countries which the sensitivity to biodiversity is not so high and European Commission something that uh, stay here and sometimes ask us to do something and we have to answer but just a problem. No, it's something like that. And I also have the impression that uh, the uh, at national level, the ministry group of work uh, is growing a different uh, also sensibility to to the problem. We are growing up together and that was good and thank you all and especially so for, for that and only for the, the big work. I hope it's this. Do, do the same, write your um, ministry if not already done it uh, because it's the, some month, a couple of months, no? February. Yes. And there will be late. There will be late. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much. Say thank you very much, uh, Xavier and uh, Simona. I think it's very inspiring, and uh, hopefully, we can empower you with our information. So, uh, any other final questions? Uh, Drop gold. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, about uh, writing to the ministries, which is something I'm obviously <laughs> going to have to do, being the only one in Bulgaria active in this. Uh, having to inform the ministry every now and then of things they should be more on their own. Uh, could we get something like a draft from you, which we can translate? That would because you know the parlance, uh, you know what buttons to press. I guess better than someone like me. So I would really appreciate that. Help a lot. With like something like a resume of what we've discussed and what we have to bring to the attention of the... Absolutely, yeah. And actually, we do have a pro forma uh, letter, I think, uh, Holly, that we've uh, we've drafted to go with these uh, tables. So hopefully, we'll help you to push the right buttons. Perfect. Sorry to put things short, but it's now lunchtime, I'm afraid. We have to go to lunch. So thank you for all the speakers this morning and all your contributions. Thank you.
So, uh, yeah, I might have overstretched myself by trying to switch between the presentation, the YouTube video and Mentimeter, but I thought it'd be good to have a bit of interactivity this afternoon so that uh, you don't fall asleep after your nice lunch. Um, but I'm going to introduce, I'm going to talk at the start of this session and then followed by others are going to give more detail on the um, Butterfly Count app. So I'll go through this reasonably quickly. Uh, so give up on that. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to cover these um, topics in terms of where does the 15 minute count fit into the our, our job of monitoring butterflies. Um, I'll go through a bit of the functionality of the app as it is at the moment, and then think a bit or ask your views on what we should focus on next. So there's some of the ways we monitor butterflies are very familiar to you. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, surveys and methods in our sort of toolbox from opportunistic sightings through to molecular techniques, uh, capture, mate, mark, recapture. So they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, no, nothing's perfect. So our, our need to monitor butterflies probably needs a mix of approaches. And I know you all have great experience in, in many or not all of these approaches. But thinking about the opportunistic sightings and what it gives us. So um, this map's a bit out today, but I think it illustrates the fact that we have a lot of this data and it's increasing very rapidly through observation um, international. It's one, one example, iNaturalist, and lots of national portals that do a great job. Um, and the advantage of this opportunistic sighting, it asks very little of people taking part. They can do it almost anywhere, um, no real conditions of what they do. And it's relatively easy if you know your butterflies. and can clearly involve lots of people, photographers, um, and wider citizen science. And it is really valuable data we saw from the Red List um, process that it does give us trend information and error of extent. So really important um, baseline information about where species occur and how rare they are. And there's lots of science using this data. So we definitely need this. Um, but the measures of change are relatively insensitive. They really tell us about distributional change or occupancy trends. Uh, so, yeah, we, I think really valuable we need it. At the other end is our sort of gold standard with our heroes who um, uh, run these schemes and put a huge amount of effort, uh, highly expert. Um, the advantage of this approach clearly it's more standardised. We revisit sites, there's a method, um, we count within a fixed distance, etc. So it has very good data on abundance and we know the absences of things that weren't seen. Um, demands more people and typically it's more the expert end of citizen science. Um, very well developed analysis methods as Rato um, bamboo, bamboozled us yesterday with the, the way we analyse all this data. And it's our sort of strongest results in terms of national trends, European indicators, and it's been proven to be a very sensitive measure of change. So I think this is a this is our gold standard really. But um, this again is out of date. We know there's fantastic efforts to expand the monitoring schemes south and east um, in Europe. But this was the map that was uh, published alongside the last grass and butterfly indicator. So it shows we've got real, you know, lots of gaps. Although we call it an EU grass and butterfly indicator, it really is quite biased in terms of where we've got information on butterfly populations. And if we think about from the species point of view, um, in terms of using the BMS data and the trends we did under ABLE, um, showing the number of species and their status in terms of trends of declines through to increases against the IUCN categories. So we firstly, we only really can produce trends for about a third of the uh, butterfly species in Europe, and even species that are of least concern, so probably reasonably well distributed, there's still around 200 species. We don't, we can't really produce trends at the moment for monitoring data, and big gaps in the, the more threatened end uh, where we really need to know how they're faring. So the butterfly count application, um, and particularly the 15 minute count, is part of the solution, I think, about how 
we use it to improve the coverage. Um, and the advantage of it is, is that we, it provides abundance information, um, and we also have a measure of sampling effort in terms of the area covered and the time taken. So it's richer data in terms of analyzing population trends. Um, and we can use um, the technology provided by the apps to help um, capture data in a standardized way in terms of particularly GIS type information, the spatial information, but also um, other things to support the count data. So it has the potential to particularly, I think, to fill in up underrepresented areas, um, maybe urban and farmland, which is less attractive to volunteers because it's perhaps less rewarding. So transects haven't traditionally been very popular in those areas. And also undersampled species, remote species in remote places, for example, rarer species. And we'll hear some talks, I think, about how the app's been used in some of these contexts. And we've seen already this slide I showed earlier. So we are the app's been around for a couple of years, I think. So the 15 minute count data is increasing um, across Europe, it's being used. And what's nice about this is that it is filling some of these gaps further south and east where we haven't traditionally had transit data. So in terms of what it offers in terms of so that's sort of background in terms of where I think it fits in to our um, suite of methods for monitoring. In terms of a quick overview of some of the key features, I think we've put a lot of effort, well, you've all put a lot of effort, supported by Christina, to make it suitable in multiple languages, which is important for reaching um, diverse communities across Europe. So thank you all for your massive translation support. So I think it's around 20 languages, something like that. Um, we also have a species guide, which um, is, it makes it slightly more attractive to people. Um, and perhaps we could expand on this to give more support for identification, for example, in, um, for new audiences. Though it's focused on butterflies, we have, um, uh, We've expanded the app to support other species groups that may be recorded on transects, so uh, particularly bumblebees uh, and dragonflies. As we've heard, we've um, added the moth, the moth module within the app. So that's quite a lot of work to maintain and develop these species lists. So yeah, that's perhaps a part of the app you haven't come across, but there are these, are these four groups that it now covers um, in terms of the species lists. And within those species lists, similarly in terms of the names, we've included a whole range of uh, names in local languages. Um, you're very welcome to try out the Japanese version if you if you want to test yourself. But we've clearly focused on many of the European languages. Um, so this is a count of number of um, names we have within the system. So it's a sort of huge effort to um, to work with you all to increase this part of the app. But it's important for making it accessible to um, audiences that don't necessarily know the Latin names in, in parts of Europe. And so it's main, so yeah, it supports, the app supports multiple surveys. So um, it, it can be used and is used for the transit recording. So um, it links to the, to the websites where the transits are set up and then they're selected within the app to enter the data in the field or even I, I also think it's not necessarily about recording transits in the field. It's quite an efficient way to enter your transit data if you've gone out with a clipboard and piece of paper. You can sit, just sit in the bar with your phone and enter the date, data quite efficiently rather than having to load a laptop and enter it that way. So that's worth considering. But there's these, there's also uh, the 15 minute count, trying to count all species um, as a list, but we also have a single species 15 minute count where you're maybe targeted, targeting, targeting a particular rare species um, so that you're only uh, focusing on recording one species. And the way this is accessed through the app is you, at the bottom of the app, there's a plus button. If you long press it, it reveals these extra surveys. Um, and it only shows three because you have a default survey that you set if you're generally only using one of the survey types. So I'll say a little bit about the moth uh, survey that Chris, Chris showed yesterday. So uh, Chris also mentioned it's being used for the LED bucket traps, but the 
Um, Moth Derby does allow you to set up other trap types. So we've got a, a set of character uh, categories of um, moth, tra moth trap types and also the lamp used within those uh, traps because the two can be varied depending on your situation. So you can, within the app, you can set up the location, lo the location of your of your your moth trap, and then enter the list against it. And also, Chris uh, mentioned the AI support. So very grateful to Naturalis. So we we use the Ops Identify classifier to support identification, and in my experience, it works pretty well in in the UK, um, and I guess generally in Northwest Europe. So Christina's going to go through the uh, the main app, but I just wanted to um, hopefully show this YouTube video of um, a recording of using the app, um, which shows particularly. Need my assistant. Yeah, I was keen to show this because I think the last time I presented this here at this meeting two or three years ago, it was it was very clear that people wanted sort of a richer capture of data. So one of the main things we've done, um, we, we took away a clear message and went away and worked on the app, is that now the app um, sort of records effectively an observation for every single individual butterfly you see. So this is uh, an example of using the app where you start your survey and it tracks your route um, and then it takes a while to find see a species. So you find your species, add it into the, the list. So you build up a list of things you've seen, you go out walking and if you see there's already a dot there where that individual was seen and you can then add extra information. You can fiddle around the route if the GPS isn't quite working. This can be a bit fiddly on the phone, I think, the sort of GIS functionality, but it does allow some very accurate information to be captured about the data you're seeing. And you carry on walking, you're not seeing very much, but you see another species. So this is looking across that list of, of species and you tap on the number for each individual you see as you walk and it creates an observation for each of those uh, individuals you, you see which can be quite heavy for relatively common and widespread species, but for the rarer species, it can be incredibly important in terms of knowing where these individuals are seen within the site. So I think it there, I'll stop it there because I think you've got a point. Sorry. I'll carry on while uh, my assistant comes back. This is my um, YouTube history. <laughs> yeah, and Christina will go through um, demonstrating more features of the app, but if it gives you a, we, we, we listened last time, we made some quite major changes in terms of and the response in terms of what people are asking for. And I'm not going to say much about the website, but also the app works very closely with it, with the website. And I just want to point out a few things for, I guess, more than well, individuals as well as national coordinators, but there are a series of downloads. So you can download the data that you've submitted. And as a national coordinator, you can download all the data for your region um, for all the different surveys. Um, yeah, and if you have any issues with this, there's been a few issues in terms of um, some of the fields not yet being captured in the downloads. Please let us know. We'll we'll update those to make sure they work as effectively as possible for you. Um, so the, yeah, the the website is where you would then download your data because it's more efficient to um, download download spreadsheets, GIS data from a website. We have this coordinator role, which gives you extra information. Um, in terms of downloads, but also there is a data verification system to review 
um, the records mark ones that are clearly wrong so that they don't pass through the system, etc. So we're starting to build up that side of the system and, and um, if you're interested in helping to review the data, please um, let me know. So the final part of the talk is where we go next with this. So this is where I'm going to try and be a bit more, get you to, to give your view and be a bit more interactive. But I've listed some of the things we're thinking about doing or could do, and we really, we've got a year left, about a year left under the spring project with some resources to make, um, uh, to work on this app a bit more, make more improvements. Clearly the first priority is getting everything working that currently it functions. So we're not going to forget about things which you really let us know about that aren't quite right. But um, it'd be good to know where you think we might go next. Um, we won't necessarily do it all within the Spring Project, but it's good to have a list, a shopping list, so we can um, look for other funding to make these improvements. So the, the sort of things we're thinking about is um, capturing richer data for migrants. We're ready for the next wave of painted ladies, for example. We could expand the species guide. Um, we could add in um, image classification for butterflies. So we've already got it for the moths, but we could um, integrate the similar functionality for, for butterflies. The breakout groups yesterday, there was clear um, appetite for improving the engagement with individual users. So we could add some more personalized feedback, more reports on your activity, how many species you've seen, how many sites you've recorded, etc. Things that are particularly notable, so more personalized feedback to encourage people to, to remain involved. Um, the data verification system, we will be working on that, but I'd like to know, you know how important you see that within the system. Um, automatic export to GBIF for those schemes that want it or those uh, member states that want it um, so that we can share the data more widely or other things that you um, have ideas of. So I'm going to ask you to vote on these in a minute. But just to expand on the, the idea for the um, painted lady or other migrant species, Hopefully you've seen this fantastic um, poster that uh, Chris and others have produced, which tells the amazing story of the, the migration from Africa to Europe and back again each year. And there are various stages of um, the population dynamics. So it's, this is a species that can capture the wider imagination. I think you know, it's quite inevitable we will get a big influx um, across Europe again in, in some years. So when it happens, really, is being ready to capture much richer data on the migration front. So the idea is that um, if somebody selects painted lady as a single species survey, they'd be asked a series of extra information, information about the behaviour of the individuals, the migrating, um, uh, mating, nectaring, egg laying example, and the conditions of the individuals. So you can tell whether they're migrated individuals, migrating individuals or new, new emerging individuals. So yeah, for those who've got their phones or laptops ready, this is a bit where you have to do a bit of work. So has anyone used menti.com before or Mentimeter? It's a way of sort of getting a feedback from the audience. So if you go to menti.com, and you'll be asked to in a code number, hopefully. Hmm? So you'll have a, now you can rank between zero and 10, how important you see each of those options. So you should see all these things. And then you, you uh, try, try not to give everything 10 or try and spread out your votes about where you would um, particularly likes to focus in the next period. Yeah. So work on the species guide in general. So it could be making sure we have photos for every species because we don't have it so far. We could have more ID information, more support for, for people using the app. So yeah, I appreciate I could have gone through these in a lot more detail, but just your quick your quick vote would help. 
um, us understand where you see the priorities. Can I have some help switching screen again? Sorry. This is my that's my end slide. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone again. But um, I'd just like to hopefully. Is it sharing? There we go. So this is your your votes. So then, so currently we only provide image classification for moths. So it would be if people own. So it's if people add photos of butterflies, we would use the image classifier to, because uh, currently we only have it for moths, for example. Yeah. So yeah, you can carry on voting. Well, you can. Those who haven't got to the page yet can vote. But I think it, my conclusion from that is everybody wants everything, which is usually the answer. But thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we can sit here and watch this uh, moving up and down no, it's gone now. all day. Uh, so, so I think we save the question, uh, since all talks will be about uh, the app, we save all the questions to after the last talk. So now I welcome Andras, who is the leader of the EBMS app 50 minute counts. Uh, and he might tell us how to become that. And, uh, or he might not, in case he wants to retain his position. So, uh, welcome, and please carry on. I want to lose this position because I want others <laughs> to make more counts than me. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, I didn't see David's presentation in, uh, in advance, but uh, there will be some recurring themes and topics. I think we were thinking similarly. Um, so I was asked to give you a presentation on how we use 15 minutes counts. Hopefully I can put it on the full screen. On full screen? It is full screen. Oh, just for me. It's good. I, I can't see it. That's good. Okay. okay. So uh, I talk, I will talk about the potential, what we saw in why it, it became so pop, it, it became really popular in Hungary. And um, of course, there are several reasons for that, but we also uh, felt a huge potential in that when uh, it was introduced. I think it was in, uh, in the same venue quite a few years ago. Uh, I can't say anything now. Anyway. Yeah, that is fine. <laughs> okay. So. And the future, yeah, and some dangers also. So people are using it for all kinds of purposes. You know, if you invent, some, invent something, people use it for everything. So you should know that. Okay. Um, yes. So when we saw the uh, what we saw in the app, which we thought was very great in that uh, large scale involvement. Yes. So there are people uh, sometimes are less willing to make hard commitment, like for transacts, but for a fifteen minute count, it's easier. Uh, monitoring less interesting. It's already said, so sorry about that if I repeat, uh, David, <laughs> some of these points. Yes, uh, in less interesting, I mean, in terms of uh, for the butterfly fans, less uh, interesting areas. Okay, and and the, the, what was in our mind also urban green and agricultural areas. These were the two main areas which we wanted to extend our uh, monitoring activities. Uh, also, urban habitats, yes, um, and incorporating international biodiversity monitoring scheme. I know that some other countries from the former socialist bloc has kind of similar systems to Hungary, uh, but there is a, a state funded monitoring scheme, which basically should handle the reporting under the, uh, the Article 17 species reporting to the EU. So this is specific, it is a specific monitoring for specifically Natura 2000 and Article 17 species. 
uh, and they monitor, their monitoring methods are not all the time up to date. And there is a major overhaul and a major reform is going on right now. And I'm in the unfortunate or fortunate position of taking part in uh, both the volunteer monitoring system and in the state funded one, which is seemingly this year is volunteer again, because we didn't get any money but so far. So, far. so uh, and what we wanted uh, to get a closer relationship with the BMS, which is uh, part of the citizen science project and the uh, state funded monitoring system, which badly needs, badly needs data and we badly need supports. So, also, uh, yes, this is uh, the complementing them because they don't have enough data on certain species. And this is a huge addition if we can provide them with additional data. And we had in mind, which were not possible before, taking snapshots. This is um, a word we coined. The snapshot, we like coining words because these are the only, only coins we have, seemingly. <laughs> so, uh, this is when many people are doing the simul uh, simultaneously a 15 minute count in an area in an organized way within a very limited time frame. And you can get a snapshot of that population, of that fauna, of that, of that region, uh, so efficiently as it could have never been done before. And it is also very good for building community, also uh, involving uh, new interested people. So it has several, several uh, possible possible benefits and we saw it a great tool uh, this 15 minute count and this app for that and also to using it to test it so use it for certain months and in fact we did it so there are for certain months you cannot do that but for certain months and for certain life stages the 15 minute counts and also transacts works quite well okay so let's see what we did so as a result we will get more monitoring data filling the gaps uh, better monitoring methods because we wanted to change the uh, state funded system and we managed to do that in a way, although it is underway. And also it's a much larger scale monitoring. And yes, which is, uh, we want a, a transparent and compatible database with the ministry. So the using our data, uh, because every data is as good to the extent as it is used to provide to collect for the drawer. And also, we had in mind that uh, probably we can get some state support, if not in terms of money, but in-kind benefits also, uh, probably uh, also for the data analysis or for any other, other things, maybe not just in, in forms of the money, but uh, a definite support we want from the state. Okay, so these are the number of transacts uh, are over 30. This is a map of uh, the transact system currently in Hungary, and there are all kinds of little but they're all kind of colors, don't worry about them. <laughs> but there are, uh, because there are one which are not uh, doubtful transects, which are not yet finished. I can't see the data up there, not so far. We have to wait for a little bit. And also we have uh, single species transects, which are, or actually not really single species, but targeted transects, I would call them, because mostly on the targeted transects too, we try to record everything, but it is not throughout the whole year. So, for example, for Maturna, we have targeted transects, but whenever we are there, we record everything. And also, we try to do less frequently than the weekly transects, but uh, in other periods of the year, once a while, we also go out there. We, we have the same thing for combined uh, uh, targeted transects for Aurinia and Macurinas. And this also covers quite a, a good range because first Aurinia comes and after the Macurinas and then because you have to go there four times. So basically it's eight transect walks. Okay, so this is the system and this is very scarce as you see. It needs some improvement, they're working on that. Also it's not representative, not currently. Neither the habitats nor the country. But if you add, this this is just for two, uh, this year, for 2022. If you add the, the dots from the 15 minute counts, it complements it quite well. Uh, I didn't put other counts because uh, from former years there are other areas also co covered. Uh, what we are trying to work on to fill the gaps and get more 15 minute counts from the areas which are currently blank and cannot transact. There. So this is our uh, one of our future steps. We are working on that. Um, as I told you, we wanted to reform the state-funded system 
And this is just an abstract. I don't want to deal with uh, butterflies because uh, uh, we managed to put into the official protocol the 15 minute counts and the EBMS transact is there done by the app. So this is very good. Uh, but this is also for uh, some noctuates and some moths. Uh, you can see these little pinkish cells are the one where we could fit in this methodology and we can do it with the app. That's Exodata. Um, I don't want to talk about it much, but uh, if anyone is interested, then please come and ask today. Uh, snapshots, great way, great tool. Uh, it, it can mobilize many, many people who are interested. And also, uh, you can get very variable data because before it was not possible. This is one of the legendary places, uh, Maturna. This is the Maturna survey in Kumpasir. Kumpasir is, is one of the number one hotspots in Hungary for butterflies, the Kumpasir forest. The, this is the place where uh, the famous banker Rothschild in, in the turn of the 19th century came also to collect butterflies. This is the place where Melanargi Rusice was, Russia was first uh, or last saw actually in Hungary. So this is an iconic place. Everyone wants to come here and it's close to Budapest. So that's why we chose it. Uh, this was the test. Uh, actually, that was me, my dots, and I walked it uh, in a day. Basically, that's where our transects are. So you can see that there's also, that was a transect actually, but you walked everything else too. That is also here a transect. Um, and the red dots are the matunas. The rest is everything else. And we also record moths. Actually, I do that. We are uh, omnivorous. Uh, so this was, and this was the daily list from that day. But this was done. The problem was because if you see the shades, because this is a forest, these are forest roads we are talking about. The sun is going. So if you are doing that from morning till the afternoon, you don't get a clear picture. And this is uh, two weeks later, we did with uh, with the applicants and all of the, with the group, all volunteers came in, coming here. You see, this is, uh, this was organized. We prefer, uh, people working in pairs because that's also more fun. You can involve the newcomers with less knowledge. And also this is a very good way to make them familiar with the tools. So with the butterfly count app and what you do is, uh, usually we come together before the survey. You had, uh, uh, everyone is briefed about what to do, uh, helping them to log in whatever, if they have any problems. And then also, uh, we organize that which pair will start from where and which route you will take. And then you can cover the whole thing in, within two hours. And that's what you get. Uh, of course, there are always some problems. It's just, you see that there was a, a mistake, <laughs> just lost, lost, lost her way, but. But anyway, um, so this is highly successful and uh, a capture market capture study is also going on there. So you can see that we, we actually we saw some of the marked specimens. Um, and this is another one of these snapshots, uh, which is another very famous place for Oedipus. It's also very close to Budapest. So it is a very favorable for, in terms of traveling and getting people together. Uh, this was... Uh, the dots, the red dots are the Oedipus specimens recorded. Uh, the habitat is quite variable. This is a, and actually, if you go back, uh, here is, you see the scale. This is a huge area. So some, some of them were working here, some pairs working here, some pairs working here and here. So you couldn't, you couldn't do it otherwise. It's a huge area. And that's what it gets. Uh, here it was a little bit different because uh, for Matuna, uh, we used the single, so the general type of 15 minute survey because we wanted to see everything. For Oedipus, what we did, we used them combined. We wanted to do basically um, a single species survey for Oedipus. It's much easier, there are too many species there and there are too many specimens. But we also wanted to give a feel and look of what is the ratio of that butterfly, what is the share in the population mix on that day. So what they, what we did, we did in pairs, some of them did general surveys, one or two to see it and the rest in parallel. And then later on, they also switched doing single species surveys. 
So you see what I took here is that the general surveys. Here there were no Oedipus as well. They were a bit late actually. Here there was one. Here there was one, two, there were more. And you see the rest. So it was like dropping the ocean actually at that grid. Okay, so what else? It is very good for urban green. Uh, and urban green surveys and monitoring. Uh, we also combine, we do two things with that. One is uh, as a PR event in festivals, green festivals, uh, we're always there, try to be there. And then involve people and then walk the park, walk the, this is the, here, this is the Danube bank here within a city actually. It was very rich. That was in October. <laughs> and this one, again, this was a festival. This is basically a holiday area with holiday cafes, but it's also an urban area. And then they could apply, they could come even with kids and we walk together. It was very, very successful. And we also do some more organized monitoring because it's not really monitoring, this is just a survey, but we do monitoring as well. We have um, intensively and extensively managed urban parks and grassland. And that's where it comes in handy because it's very good showing in the differences between the intensively managed, always cut grass and the sites and the, the parts of the park and the grassland where it was not cut. And it's striking when you can see when you, when you walk and you see that nothing is there. And when you reach, for example, a patch of, of grass which was left, a larger one, then it's full of dots. And this is pretty convincing. And also uh, we are, okay, and we also, also we are involved in, in Budapest. They are also doing a, a larger project. And uh, next year, the pilot we've already done, but next year we want to move on next step, a step ahead. When we want to manage the Budapest ex intensively managed and extensively managed uh, grasslands and make a, a comparative monitoring there. Now, dangers, uh, yes. You know, there is a joke that uh, you know who a Hungarian is who enters the revolving door behind you and comes out ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, anything what, what is invented is, is used for whatever purpose they want, it, want to use it for. So, as, as you see, I guess you can guess that this is a Hungarian survey up there with Karaksasiasius and all kinds of species up there. So, this is, this is dangerous because it can, it can uh, it is not bad for the app, uh, for the database. So these are the dots you have to take out when Chris showed us the map, for example, and then one by one manually, because it's not good. Um, of course, it was because the functionality is not yet in the app. So they use basically coded butterflies for what they wanted to. This is actually, <laughs> it was actually a long distance sampling. And what they use for, the, uh, for Maturna, and they use different species for the different uh, distances. That's fine, you can do that. But uh, if you have unidentified one, unidentified two, that would be much better. Much better. I, uh, hopefully the guy who did that uh, in advance noticed, um, notified me and I told him to make a separate account. So that can be deleted easily and I flagged it as uh, in the validation, but uh, but anyway, on a, with unidentified one and two, it's even better. So you can use for many things, very inventive things. You you, you probably you have not thought of when you when you made the app. Okay, uh, another thing is uh, it's a it's a huge. I feel it, and especially in Hungary, it is a huge danger uh, when from officials and also from mm, professionals. It is the perception that these 15 minute counts are a replacement for the transit system. Uh, no, it should be an addition to it. Um, and we always have to fight for that, uh, which is, uh, I think we should make it clear because this is a great danger. Because then we couldn't have any transits anymore. We have volunteers that said that I do because it's easier. I will do the 15 minute count. Okay. What's the future? Um, I don't know, but we also have some suggestions, but I know that you have tons of for the developers. Um, what we would like really to see, and, and actually we were talking about that, and 
uh, when 15 minutes count started, the app couldn't record the actual uh, GPS coordinates for every occurrence. Now it can. It would be nice if it could have been done for the transact as well, because then these two things are coming together and you can use uh, also for, to a limited extent for distribution as well along the transact route. It's very nice to see it. I've done many surveys together when I did, I do the 15 minute count and the transact survey because I want to see the distribution as well, not to worry. Um, and I think it, 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 uh, it doesn't seem that far off. I mean, if I'm seeing the current state of the, of the app. Limited area, yes. When it started, there were no limitations about the area. Now, if you see what is in the actual guide, it says that basically transact area it covers. So you should do your 15 minute count the same way in terms of area as, as uh, in a transact count or transact walk. People doesn't do that. I will never do that. So, um, and also bef because before it was not a requirement, so even if they wanted to, they didn't. So the, our data backward is not compatible then with that. Of course, there are certain species which, which you can see from far away, especially in open habitats like chrysotheme. And there are, especially the blues, even if, if it's an open habitat, because it is small, you have to go there. So for the transect, it's pretty good there, the transect area. But there are some which are really spotted from long distances. But I think uh, if you don't want to lose many people, if you don't want to lose the flexibility, which is one of the greatest uh, assets of this, of this tool, I think, then we should opt for the method that gathering our data and deduct basically these uh, detectability uh, for the species from a large amount of data which has been gathered without limiting the users to the five time five time five meter square because they won't do that. Also, um, we would be happy to see other taxa integrated into it, like my cone headed grasshoppers, yes. But, uh, or even if not just taxa, some, I know that this is primarily uh, as it started, it is a butterfly database and it became a moth database later. And now there are other pollinators in there, but there are also some species and taxa, which we always see in the transects we recorded. Now we couldn't do that. It would be nice if those were included. In there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. That, that was very well timed. Uh, we, we, as before, we saved the questions for after the last, last talk, and uh, now we will hear about more about um, fifteen-minute counts in Spain uh, with a focus on rare species by Miguel. So welcome. Thank you. Um, tell you what, I, I will be repetitive. So. <laughs> However, I, I think this is interesting because then, then probably you will get the message if we repeat it several times. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just first of all, I, I will show you an overview of what uh, we have uh, got in Spain. It's mainly the last two years, so it's uh, 21 and 22. And, uh, well, there are 31,000, well, almost 32,000 butterflies recorded and, well, butterflies and dragonflies, okay? And some moths, but, but it's mainly butterflies and dragonflies. Uh, during the two years, you, you will see the evolution. There's almost nothing in these three years, but then it uh, goes up in, in, in the last two years. Um, the, the top three species are these three ones, uh, Melanargia, Pironia, Parnassus Apollo. So then this is interesting. Uh, uh, just for comparison, uh, provided the, for the same time period, uh, um, the, the top three, three species uh, taken from the BMS. So you see Melanargia is, is, is again there, but uh, you don't get Parnassus, of course, so, so you get uh, more common species, okay? So this is, this is interesting. 
Uh, I will show you something about the distribution of the, of the data. Records are really concentrated in these two areas that are, that are marked in, in red. Sorry, the, the points are in blue and sometimes you don't see them. So that's why I, I put this, this, uh, this red to mark them. 29% uh, of the records, 29 come from a single recorder and this is the metrio the Midel, that, that works there um, and we will see why why this is happening most people come from spain but but we also get quite a lot from foreign visitors and 11 percent of the recorders are foreign people okay um these other three places uh, we will we will talk about them as well so um so we recorded uh, 176 butterfly species from, well, the number of recorders is 64. And from these, 31 are rare or, or endemic species and, and quite a lot of specimens, three, more than 3,000. So that's interesting. And again, I compared the data from the 15 minute, minute counts and from the BMS uh, uh, records for uh, several endemic species and, and this is interesting because you see that for some species we are really getting quite a lot from 15 minutes counts but for others uh, you get better results with the with the with the transects and that's why that's because the transects are just running across the areas where, where these species live or because the, the well, like for example, Lithena bleusei, because these species are also quite uh, widespread. So, but, but, but you see, at least for, for these three species, this is just a selection. I, I mean, I just selected uh, for you to, to see. But at least there, there are species that are better recorded by uh, through uh, 15 minute counts. Okay. Um, now, I, I will. And this is this is probably the repetitive part. Um, uh, what what are the strengths of the of the feed thing when it comes uh, as far as we 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 think? Uh, I will show you uh, four four cases, um, and I will I will just tell tell you something about about each is that no, it's it's one of them. First. Um, uh, we can get records in hard to reach areas you, you never you never fix a transect in, in such areas because they are high mountain areas and well we, we do have a transect at 3000 meters in Sierra Nevada but that's uh, uh, well special but, but not the normal thing of course uh, there's not many transects in steppes or semi deserts in, in areas where you really get a very few species, but you, you do get species like this one, uh, an endemic species. Of course, islands, the Macaronesian islands uh, are, are a good example, uh, or also small islands. Uh, you you uh, really don't get uh, a lot of transects in these places, or areas with limited access. Okay, so, so this. Uh, um, 15 minute counts can, can be really very good for, for these sort of places. Um, now, this is also quite important because they are quite good for monitoring endangered or protected species. I'm to observe that. These are two, two examples. Uh, we can track the abundance of endangered or rare butterfly species in particular habitats, or we can count single species or characterize the, the entire uh, butterfly community. Andras already told us about this, so I won't uh, stress on this. Um, and here I, I, I show you uh, Spanish habitat selective species, and then again a comparison of what you get by 15 minute counts. Of course, the Apollo is the, the, the relevant species for this. Although, for example, for Aurinia, that is a widespread species in Spain, uh, you, better, you get a quite a lot of better data with the BMS system, okay? Um, we, have, we haven't really 
uh, any any record for this uh, these two species. Sorry, Nemosine is now changed the name. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I will show you some examples. Uh, the first one is this one. Uh, it was financed by the local government in Castilla Leon, and this is a, a study to improve the conservation status, the knowledge of the conservation status of the Lepidoptera community, uh, the Lepidoptera of community interest. And uh, this is the, the, the guy that did, did it. Uh, he, he was studying this, this kind of species, so uh, uh, habitat directive species. Um, he did 195 tracks, uh, recorded a lot of butterflies. He also recorded not just target, target species, but also, also other species, so, so quite a lot of uh, species in, in his study. And, uh, well, the number of records is, is also quite quite uh, interesting, the, the number of, of record of, of this uh, target species, okay? Um, the second example from, comes from Aragon. Again, the, the government in Aragon uh, financed uh, a study to to study um, specific uh, species, or oh, well, all these species were included. So this in, this includes uh, habitat directive species, species, but also uh, endemic species. Uh, this 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 is the 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 guy that 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 is the champion of uh, many counts in Spain. Okay, so his name is Demetrio Demetrio Vidal. He counted uh, well 9,000 butterflies from 120 species, and and of course he was discovering new populations because he, he was working in a remote area. So so this is quite interesting because uh, new new records are are provided for this very rare or endemic species. Um, well, just to show you some of the results, these are points, and he also uh, has the abundance of of species in in different uh, uh, places and so on. Uh, these are the two areas covered by, by these two examples. Okay, see, this is example one and this is example two. So, uh, um, now, the other thing is that uh, we can also monitor the butterfly abundance and diversity in particular habitat types and uh, we can do inventories in protected areas. Uh, sometimes uh, some protected areas don't have uh, transects. Uh, this is an interesting thing. We, we can have butterfly data data for impact ass assessment studies. And for example, this is Teruel, the area where Demetrio, the, the champion, <laughs> uh, works. And there's uh, uh, these uh, windmills uh, that, that, uh, that are projected. Uh, there and, and he's providing data. Uh, there's no transect, so th there's no occasional data there, but, but this study provides data for particular species in, in these sort of areas. Uh, and uh, well, you can also study target species, and, and there's another example, for example, uh, the Apollo butterfly in the Sierra de Guadarrama. Uh, there's no transects done in the places where Apollo flies there, and, and these 15 minutes uh, counts are providing very, very nice data for that area. Okay, and that's that's the area. That's Madrid, and there's Sierra de Guadarrama, and some uh, some of the counts there are related with the Apollo butterfly. Um, now, uh, it, uh, the, the council are also useful to, compil to compile occasional data, um, and of course here we well many people come to Spain for a holiday, so why not to some some of these uh, counts? Uh, just a few. We, we've just got a few. I, I showed you eleven percent of the of the recorders are coming from our, from abroad, but I'm sure this could improve. Um, um, we can also record unusual abundances of species. Maybe you you are coming across a, a migration or a, or a place where where there's a, an unusual abundance, and this is, this is a, a good tool to to record that. 
and we can also record the presence of interesting species. Well, this is Lithena blusei, one of the endemics. Uh, we, get, we get quite a lot of records, but, but maybe it, it would be interesting to have more, more records and probably to, to just meet these species and, and uh, with a 15 minute uh, count, you, you, you register the presence of, of the species, okay? And um, that's it. Uh, uh, so thank you everything for listening. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we have reached the, the last talk of this session. So it will be Christina who will tell us about the uh, training uh, using the EBMS. Well, it's going to be more interactive because I'm going to show the app directly. So uh, while I prepare it, because it's not ready, maybe we could open to questions for the presentations, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. If there are questions. Do we have any questions to, to the speakers so far? Internet? Yeah. And we need to enter. From the... um, uh, thank you. A question for, for David, really, and that is uh, we talked yesterday about. Yeah. Um, what well, you have the presentation? So I have at you, least. you were talking about expanding the range of species uh, or the species accounts from the app. That's but would it be possible to narrow it down for those species which are actually flying at the time that the count is made, so that for uh, well, less experienced volunteers, they don't have different choices? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, okay. So I mentioned about the. The validation verification. I think what we would do for that is is have information in the system about the range of species where they're known from and the times of year that they fly. So once we've got that in the system, we could potentially use it in the app to. Um, well, uh, maybe think about how we do it, but our UK app, which is sort of equivalent, okay. it sort of gives you the species in the order you're most likely to see them. So we could maybe consider that method for. Yeah, engaging newer, less experienced audiences as one idea, or at least flag up to people when they've got when they've recorded something very unusual, very unlikely at the point they're doing it in the app, so that they can change it at that point rather than waiting for some review down the line. So yeah, we'll certainly consider some of those options. Okay, so uh, it's a general question on how to use the the uh, area drawing or whatever in 15 minutes uh, counts. Um, if I draw it beforehand, I can run out of 15 minutes. So then how does the app know I haven't counted the whole territory? I used to do that at first and then I realized that's not really how I should be doing it. E either draw it at the end or just uh, put the GPS on and uh, just have it count the area itself somehow. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think probably my suggestion is you use the GPS, yeah. but if um, but if you want to redefine the area at the end, you can maybe use the GPS to then create your area. Although it's it's a bit fiddly on a phone to draw an area, so. Mm -hmm. I think given the GPS typically works pretty well, I think just, just let it track you and um, yeah, or pause it and draw your area. But yeah, no, it's interesting because obviously this is just a tool, this is a tool that we've developed and I think as Andres showed and you're saying, the way people use it, perhaps we didn't predict how to do it, so yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, we're sort of learning all the time, I think. Yeah. I think, I personally think the GPS on phones is pretty accurate, so the easiest thing is just to let the phone do the hard work and you yeah. enjoy the butterflies and yeah. the application. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but just one comment on that because it's like like if you see the big butterfly count, sometimes you do fixed point surveys for fifteen minutes and then you need the area because then you don't move. So that's. Um, because, uh, and that's why I asked that we should have a flag. Is it a fixed point survey or not? Because they didn't. in gardens, perfect. Yeah, I can just uh, uh, agree upon exactly that thing because that, that's the kind of network that we have in, in Sweden as well. So it would be good to be able to reuse sites uh, 
So this is a feature that we would be long for. Right, someone else? I just had a question about the analysis coming out from using the data from these 15 minute counts and what sort of, like, is there a link to relative abundance or how you can, because we have a 15 minute garden count um, in Ireland since 2020 and we're just kind of wondering what can be done with analysis, what sort of analysis can be done. So there's a couple of projects that have got resources to develop the statistical approach to integrate transex and 15 minute counts. So the spring project needs, it's got a bit of time to look at that because it's relevant to the um, wider pollinator monitoring schemes. And there's another project, a European a horizon project that's got this job to look at the methods. So we've, we've sort of produced the app and put it out before we've got the analysis methods fully sorted out. But I think there are some clever people working on it. So I think within, if we have this meeting next time, this time next year, I think we'll have a solution optimistically. Yeah. I think at least, I think one obvious use is species distribution modeling. This data is perfect because it's got presence absence, which we often lack for the opportunistic data. We don't know the absences. So there's an obvious spatial role for this data, but I think ultimately you want trend information as well, which means integrating across. The Great, so. Have you seen that in my for that? Yeah. So are finished, it could be interesting for people to see what you could do there. Yeah. Uh, one more question, uh, yes. that then uh, uh, we'll uh, save the marking for the next uh, round of questions. Just a short comment on the use of uh, GPS on, on sections, uh, on transects. Uh, I think several people, observers on section, uh, this in Luxembourg, are not stopping for each very snappy or manual adjusting. Uh, they, they sum it and at the end of the section, we encode it, so you might arrive with many points at the end of the section and not a good section. Well, that's just a good point. So then let's go into the interactive session with Christina here. Okay. Um, uh, well, so here I just wanted to mention it that the, this application uh, we have it here on the website of EBMS. Uh, we, we have a specific section just about describing how to use the, the mobile application. And you can download it for uh, Android and also for, for iPhone. So it's possible for both systems. Of, of course, it's for free. <laughs> so you can do it. Um, and I wanted to show you an, a more interactive way because with the screenshots, sometimes you don't really get how exactly the 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 app works although the, the video of uh, david was really useful to see how every point that you enter is uh, starting to create it on the route that you do for the 15 minute counts but just to show you how is the app this is a, a demo that we have it on the website so that is how it's currently the app at the moment if you have it on your phone um uh, we are here at the moment in the in the menu so here you can just register and are all the different options where you could change in settings uh, the language. As we say, we have many different languages. <laughs> As you can see, Japanese, we are not a line. <laughs> line is true, it's in Japanese. Um, and we have also, it's important to select the country where you are because the species uh, on the field, on the guide that there is on the app is filtered for the, the country. So if I'm now selecting Germany and we go to the guide, here is showing you the species occurring on uh, Germany. So it's filtering you and helping you to, to show uh, the species. And many people told me that it's handy to have it on the app because you, you are thinking on just two species that you don't remember very well and you have uh, a fast look and, and it's really easy. And more things on the settings. Uh, here uh, you could select where you which species group you want to, to use. So at the moment it's just uh, butterflies, but you could select uh, several. So I want also to include bumblebees on my list of uh, species to record it. And of course you could do all of them, <laughs> but maybe that is uh, too much. Um, and here even because the moth, uh, as David saw, we have more than 10,000 uh, moth uh, species included on the EVMS system. So it was a bit uh, difficult to search with in all of these uh, species. So we decided to create a, 
day flying moths. So we created a, a short uh, list of the of the moths that they are more frequently flying during the day. So then you could select this part, and then you don't have. The, so you will get the ones that normally you could see on the transit. I recommend to use one or two, but of course, uh, someone the other one they told me that you don't see the same uh, butterfly that how you see uh, you look for a dragonfly, right? It's not the same way how they behave. So I will say like if you are looking just for dragonflies, just go for dragonflies and forget about the butterfly. Maybe you could do it because it's a really poor area and you are able to to record everything at the same time. But more recommendable just uh, select a few of them. Um, and also here in the moth survey, you could also use the use an image identification or not. So you could also select that I want to do it all by myself. So it's not necessary to use it when you take the, the pictures. And, and what more more features on, on, on the application. And here primary survey is basically in the purple button, the important one in the middle of the app, in the, in the application is which methodology you want to use more in that button. So in this moment it's 15 minute counts, but you could select the different uh, methodologies that you would like to, to use. Maybe if there are any questions while I am explaining, please just interrupt me. Eh? I, don't, I don't mind to, to stop and explain it a little bit more. So this is the button uh, that if I just do a, a fast click, we, location permission, yes. Um, then we go directly to the 15 minute count. So we start immediately, but you have the option to stop it. So don't worry, don't be on panic that you could stop it and get ready for start counting butterflies. And then just enter on the area, you, you check that the UBS is on. So then you are uh, the, is able the application to start recording your, your location. And then, well, I don't know, here in the demo, it doesn't work uh, perfectly, but then it should bring you to the, to the area where you are. But in this case, we are around here. No? Well, one, another option that you could do is like uh, switch off the, the GPS because you don't have enough connection or you don't have enough uh, battery or whatever. And then you are able to uh, say, well, anyway, I'm going to record my butterflies just here. So I can just say, hey, I've been recorded butterflies in this area and is where I'm going to count, no? So because you know exactly what to do it and you are able to, to determine the, the route. And you see here how repeat this. Okay. Slowly. So then you look for on your map, wherever you are, and then you decided to to go here to this route and these are the tools. So here you could draw a line or you could draw a polygon. Okay, both options. So I select a line, I start to draw my line, one click, another click, and then double click to finish. And then you have even the option to correct it in case uh, we, it's not exactly like that. <laughs> it's not on the bushes, it's uh, on the road, road itself. Um, I save it and you can also delete it if it's not at all good. That is clear, so. You are going to walk, but then you can correct it later. So, because we don't have the GPS, it's an option that we, in case you don't have connection well or something, the GPS reception is not good or because you are going to really count in a meadow and I know I'm going to be the 15 minute counts in that meadow all the time. So, so I saw the colleague on, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could do it afterwards. So I have, no, this is not a meadow. This looks like, like a meadow. So I select the polygon and then I start drawing a polygon and then double click and then it appears and immediately recorded how much area is going to be recorded. Okay. And this also can be, this is the edition bottom, and then you call it edit. Oh yeah, I didn't arrive until the corner, so <laughs> I don't want, I was between these two trees. Um, save, I just save your, uh, same save, can you save also? 
uh, we don't have we will have it for Sweden, no? A specific point for 15 minute count. At the moment you can't say location, but that's we have talked about it. So you have your sort of favourite sites. I think uh, as we talked to Lars that if you've got sites that regularly record, you don't want to draw well, yeah. I will save those in the website and then just select them. Uh, Yolanda is asking because in the urban areas is the same uh, parks in the urban area, so it's always the same area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she so can I do the 15. You could have a system built in, maybe when you share the transact approach. It's easier. Yeah. yeah. Martin? I would say from my uh, experience, I would recommend normally you can use it to do it. But uh, uh, maybe if you are in a special situation, maybe even in the town, you yeah, have a Skype friend by town speaker. I would always recommend to add uh, to check because yeah. there might be mistakes, especially in this sure. thing which happened in our. Uh, in Madeira. Yeah. For example, uh, you should be aware if you start very quickly, that sometimes maybe you didn't find the coordinate yet, and then you have a mistake of one. Then you will see, like, uh, it will take the last coordinate. That's the problem with smartphones. You don't, uh, they don't show you. Uh, they take maybe time to find the satellite at the first place. So the first one is the use uh, one with it. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will mention it later, but yeah, when you finish your 15 minute count. Recommend you to check uh, the area that the GPS recorded that you were working uh, and, and check it well. Uh, and also now I'm using an iPhone, but I remember with the Android before to switch on the GPS before open the app, yeah. for example, because the iPhone is always using the, the location. Actually, one way around this uh, fixed area uh, question might be to have an option to load them here because uh, those sites would be associated with, with a user. So uh, it would be possible to have a drop, drop down where you uh, say that you, instead of drawing it, you could just load it and, and then display it. And then, then you have a preset uh, area that you, you would go to. So it, it might be a way around uh, just loading instead of drawing them. Uh, would would solve the entire issue for the student, for example. David, you know the bird track um, uh, that predicts where you're likely to be, where you've been most frequently. So that's a, that might be another option because it, it just says it assumes that you're going to your last place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are a bit uh, back still, but will be a, a nice future to reach. <laughs> But uh, yeah, at the moment now the app and the website are connected and, and show you the transit. I'm going to show you now. Uh, so it could be something similar for the 15 minute counts that you have your redefined 15 minute counts where you go often and then it's just automatically safe on your account. No, it would be something like that. Okay, so we continue. We are, uh, well, because I am in the demo, I prefer to, to save the area. Uh, now drawing and then uh, we could start uh, the time and then it started to come down. It's quite simple, 15 minutes. And then in any moment that you need to take a picture of a butterfly to really, I don't know, uh, put your glasses well or whatever, then you can switch off this time because the good part of the 15 minute counts is that it's a standardized based on the uh, monitoring effort. So we don't mind how much you work or how much you didn't work much. But what is standardized is the 15 minute counts between all the 15 minute counts in Europe. So we what what if we compare is the monitoring effort and the abundances. So that is the good part that if you are not really recording, just stop it. And then what's well, simple, just started to add your species uh, and even you could uh, search for them just uh, with the species part. So it is snappy and here you could see that there are some groups of species, uh, so you could see that, um, yeah, it's not necessary to only one species if you are in doubt. And then every time that you uh, click on the number, it will increase uh, the individuals. And then, well, here, let's allow the collecting. Yeah, because, well, this the demo is super perfect, but uh, basically here it will appear the coordinate of every specific individual. And then you will have all the list. If you have uh, 10 Pierre Snappies, there will be 10 uh, different coordinates and the time. 
and in every one you could determine uh, include a picture, include a comment, if it's exactly, well, the state is adult because we are looking for adults, but it could be uh, looking for X. So you are with Tecla Betule and you just want to search for uh, the X, you could do it with the 15 minute counts. And if even we are using it in the Netherlands in that way. So you can do it 15 minute counts for just caterpillars of mods or, or for, for X. So it's quite useful. And um, and then, if it was wrong because it's no, it was not very snappy and it was not this one, you always to drag to the left, then this button appear and then you can delete it. Okay, for everything. Caterpillars species. I have to tap the button a hundred times. Uh, no, with my mind. So, ah, there is an on the, on the long press. The um, ah, yeah, look, boom. <laughs> I just click a long. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, that's I'm interested in the group side. Let's assume. So you could correct here, for example, clicking on the number to say 100 directly, no? Or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Either way, it's just something that I came across and I just ignored it. Yeah, it's a, also for estimations, yeah. But but the way it looks now is that if you will press for 100, it will start uploading all the positions for all those and wait and wait and wait. Because it's doing that for five now. So no, but because this is the demo, in a normal situation, it will get the norm, the coordinate the same. Yeah, yeah, you get a long list of positions, of course. Um, one option also is to, you could, uh, if the species were wrong and it was not card, you can always change it to another species. So you don't lose all these coordinates and then you correct it like it's no, it was not card, it's what Atalanta. So you have also that option and the deleting also works for in the whole app we work for that all the time by default we yeah so is there this disadvantage that you think I engage in the to uh eggs or sad uh, salad Still, still you need to do it one by one, but we, we have it already that issue <laughs> raised on the list to do. Like if you were starting with Larry, it will continue uploading Larry, right? David? It was like that. So then it's avoiding you to, to search uh, all the time for the same. And also, I think the single species one is simpler because often you're not recording adults. And... Yeah, that's an option. Transit method is adults. Account. So then, then in the front end, typical of the you will see over there that my colleagues see that uh, I also want to put it in my 15 minute count. Then you start pushing it and you one by one you have to change it. The I need to go, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but if the 15 minute count single count, it will be the special. Yeah, I dropped it. You got it on the list. We have a huge list, yeah, we have a huge list. Well, just to mention the additional detail, this is, you don't need to fill it, but automatically is filled in the 15 minute counts, the cloud, wind direction, and so on. And we included recently how many people were recording in that 15 minute counts, because it's not the same one person that in Madeira we were sometimes seven, no, together. So you can specify, here we are 50 people, no? So we can specify how many um, we are counting. That is also to estimate no, how much we are recording. Uh, you should note that, uh, note that uh, this connection uh, is only possible when there's uh, when the phone is uh, internet Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's getting the information for the closest uh, meteorological station. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if you have internet, okay. but you can always enter you manually. So here, for example, the temperature is not taking it. I think we are really low. 
Uh, so you can always determine, and that is not perfect. Maybe it's not hundred; it's no. fifty. <laughs> but you could always change. So by default, it's going to put you some if you have internet. But you can always change that. And while the time continues, and I'm not going to to finish it because I want to show you also the um, uh, the transit. But basically, when the time is up, basically here you just need to say finish, and then you have time uh, to. To go to your survey here, you see that it's a draft, but when you finish it, say you have the, to upload it. So you have two steps. First, you need to finish the 50 minute count, and then you need to upload it because we give you time to check or include pictures or finish your identification, and then you do the upload it. And then you could see here yours, and even on the map, how many you have been doing. No, So here we have already one in Germany. <laughs> Um, how to do a transect? Uh, if you press long this uh, button, then it will appear the other methodologies that you can do in the butterfly count, uh, the mod survey, the single species count, or the transect. And if you go to the transect, the first thing to, to select is which transect you are doing. And then it's doing the connection with the website to uh, check which one uh, you have. So. I could show you the transcript of my parents-in-law in Madrid <laughs> and uh, the sections that you could see the different sections. So just started with the first section and then you start like similar with the 15 minute counts adding a species. And here you could include pictures of the section, comments, uh, the clouds also, how much it is. And when you have all your species list, you continue to the next section and continue including all uh, your species. Sorry, we have to continue. We can take the questions off. <laughs> uh, if you really have suitable conditions or not, maybe you are right to your section and it was closed the fence and you cannot really enter. So I'm unable to do the survey. Uh, or in by normally suitable conditions, but we want to give that a uh, possibility on the transect. Okay, so it was not really success, not many butterflies <laughs> in these sections. Um, and then after you finish that, it, it takes the time when you start it, and then you could determine at the time that you 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 finish the the count. So imagine, uh, I I cannot move it here, but normally you can uh, ah like that. Yeah, sorry. I finish at this uh, time, and then you could also enter the different uh, environmental uh, variables. So the temperature, the cloud, the wind record it and, and any comment and then you just need to to finish it and it will appear in your in your survey so you see here that i started a transit and a 50 minute counts in this case with 12 individuals but if you are not really happy you can always delete <laughs> just to remember because it's not so obvious about the deleting button and many people ask me um more tips uh, here in the reports we included this year i don't know it will Download it, but here is kind of a bit of reward for the volunteers. Like you could see uh, how many species you have been recording uh, in your 15 minute counts. So, your top species, I was in Madeira, so I have Hipparchia madeirensis <laughs> as the top species for me. Uh, there were thousands, there were many. Um, and also, uh, top species from all the time counts done in Europe. And Jurtina is uh, really winning here. No, So, it's it's a little bit more interactive, this part, and this up, uh, updating no? all the time. And you have here the, the guide. And, and I, that's it. I think I explained more or less some, the majority, the most important part of the, of the app. Just to mention that in the YouTube channel of uh, Butterfly Conservation Europe, I made several uh, YouTube videos so short showing how to use, how to do a 15 minute count. If this was really fast, you could check it on the webs on the YouTube, how to really do it or how to do the transit or some tips. So I included several videos that you could just check and understand better the, the application. But as I mentioned before on our website is everything uh, describe a step by step how to do things and we have it translated in several languages already so you could always check uh, that part i think 
that's all for the moment, and then I can ask a question, or we, we go to the coffee directly, no? Uh, yeah, I think, I think we can have time for a few questions here, because there's some, some people who are uh, more to ask questions before. Uh, but I think we should thank all, all the speakers for a brilliant session. Actually, uh, I don't know if Carolus and Avilius is online, but I think uh, I'd like to thank Carolus and Avilius, who, you know, we've all seen apps and there's some good ones and bad ones, but I think they've done a brilliant job responding to things we've asked them to do and make it really intuitive. So, if yeah, thank Avilius and Carolus. Thank you. Thank you. He's there. Yeah, yeah. Carolis was this this morning before, so he was the a great person behind helping us. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, he said thank you. Ah, nice. <laughs> He's listening. So yeah, really nice because the the app is improving all the time with all your feedbacks, and we have a really long uh, list to do of things to improve, but it's really working a lot. And as you saw on the on the maps, of Europe is uh, taking over, and many people are using it and. Yeah, let's let's continue using more fifteen minute counts. Andras, of course, tell me. No, that's a question. Uh, actually, it also takes us to methodology a bit, and I always wanted to ask that, but I just forgot. Now it came to my mind. Um, if you, uh, we talked about that it is very troublesome to enter large numbers human with by five when we are doing like uh, caterpillar counts or or larva nests. For, products, for example, whatever. But uh, when the other problem, other possible case when you have really high numbers, are when, for example, there's a pond on the road and it's full of blooms, for example, and you have to enter some like 200. Now, if you take the option of saying you can enter a number, that's an option. You won't press it and it's not by five, you can enter the number. That's five. Well, but that's fine, but then. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if you walk in a species which has, so the, the more species rich and 15 minute count is, the slower you are, because you have to find the next species. So basically it penalizes you for the area getting richer. If there is only one species in large abundance, then, then you get the highest counts. So, and what you do, you have to choose. So either you, uh, because the, the space, when we enter it one by one, for example, the blooms, it's also a limit, it's a limiting factor. And you say that you have to do all counts like this, or then you have to take out the time while you're searching for new species. And, and of course, when we have, sometimes we have this, and there are 40 species there and 50, and by the time you find the next one, you always have to try to, to pause it or whatever, because otherwise, a lot of time, it will take a lot of time to find the species that you want to add, for example. One more. So the more species which the area is, the app is more, I mean, the count penalizes you for that, basically. Not really, because you have the possibility to sort it by abundances. No, uh, no but you have, <laughs> not, 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 it's not the point. You can the price. Yes, then the, but then the thing is that whenever in a species with which area you want to record something, you always have to stop it. So then it's pause it actually. Yeah. So so it's it's maybe it's not the way. So it's uh, so what you should do. You have forty five species. You can list it, but you don't know which one will come up. And you have three species larger than us. You can just click it. That's very easy. Yeah. And then, then the uh, then either you have to. To, to take into account by the analysis, the speech swissness, or you have to give a unified approach for that when taking the data. Yeah, I can see the problem. The, the one bit of functionality, which I can't remember it's, it's in there or not, you can, there's a way that you can populate the list. You can remember your last list before you start. Doesn't work very well. Like that, that I need to yeah. Yeah. Okay, I saw three butterflies out, species somewhere here, somewhere there. So I, I don't know which one is there. Very rich. And then it is very slow, or I have to pause all the time. That's fine, but for the rest, no. 
I see what you mean, yeah. Uh, actually, I think there are functionalities in, in the app that, app that you could use, not in this one, but if you, if you uh, let the, the app pause when you have screen activity, then it would give you that time back. So, in principle, you could, uh, when you are doing things with the app actively, then it would pause. Uh, you could probably do that uh, within the app. Let's see if they need a GPS in that thing. It's very risky. Well, well uh, everything is risky in themselves. It causes many, many possibilities for an accident. We're trying the best app, uh, but of course, that is a specific situation. Maybe you have it quite a lot, but that's not the. Right. 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 I don't think it's uh, myself already because I do accounts in the Netherlands, which are very simple, and I do accounts in the French Alps and in the Italian Alps, which are very different, probably uh, very like yours. And I, I, at the moment, I don't have a simple solution. So, uh, I'm aware of it because I noticed myself that uh, this happens, this effect. Uh, yeah, let's think about it. Uh, Maybe they should, should uh, calculate something instead of pausing that, then take it out the, uh, the analysis that they got the which on the one Yeah, but well, of course, it's also you see that the, uh, the distance gets a little shorter. Yes. So the Netherlands I can walk maybe 800 meters uh, and then. Uh, uh, in the Italian Alps, uh, 200, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, of course, yeah. right. but, uh, but I the same thing you can get uh, when you have a uh, uh, large number of one species, which is then a higher number because it's yeah. easier to get yeah. yeah. only one, two, three. That's yeah, but, let's discuss it, but I think it's worth remembering the analysis typically has a site factor in it, so we're looking at change in a site. So if that's a bias, it's a sort of site factor. There is an issue if the site becomes less diverse, for example, but it's, it's, the analysis is typically a relative change with a site factor. So it may, I, I, I can understand the bias that it might have, but it, that's a bias between a very rich site and a very poor site. But if we're looking at trends in sites, maybe it's less, it's less noise. Well, I think it's noise compared to how big numbers can go up and down. So I think I'm not particularly concerned about it as a bias in the analysis. Well, thank you. Um, uh, just coming back to what we said uh, yesterday about keeping participants happy with cake and so forth. Uh, uh, the cake is outside here and so is the tea and the coffee. Uh, so I suggest we continue with questions either in here or next to the coffee. Thank you all.
contracted for each national park in three years. So 21 chunks in three years, what was it best in history? You've done something and now... <laughs> No. Okay. We started in fact when Abel gave us the opportunity to, to work together to have uh, tools, uh, effort, Christina, so and so and so. And so we are one able project uh, scheme, and so we are four years old. Um, the, the challenge in Italy was two. One was the high biodiversity we have, and the problem to how recognize so huge diversity um, to uh, improve the knowledge in citizens. So, and the second one, the, or the first one, I don't know, um, was the, the idea to recruit uh, people, citizens in a country, so where the history in uh, volunteer, um, environment and, and volunteers is very, very, very low. Um, but in any case, we, we started uh, and uh, we started and we were surprising by the results because in uh, four years we have uh, 137 permanent time sector, which for me is a very huge number according to my expectation. Um, despite the, the beginning of the story, only 30% more or less are inside the 2000 and managed by National Park. National Park, uh, Grand Traviso National Park, uh, a very long story of uh, cooperation with us, uh, uh, set up the first national um, scheme, uh, transit, but then uh, the other do not follow it. So the volunteers involved are more than 100, 113 uh, yesterday, and they come from very different kind of uh, um, sectors. They are mainly not, not uh, entomologists, uh, um, even not people involved in natural studies. Uh, so very, they, they are very different. Uh, one of the key factors was to divide um, the, the Italy in three, and that is a good suggestion for countries where differences uh, in habitat, but also in people and distances are very, very high. Um, and of course, at the moment, uh, uh, schemes reflect uh, in distribution. Now, here there is the University of Turin, here there is Leonardo, and here there is uh, Stefano. And we have some parts that are not covered um, because we have no direct contact. We, we didn't guess with workshop to reach, for example, Sardinia, the, a very cool story of uh, uh, historical collection of data, but we will. Yes, of course. Um, here are some, some results. Uh, we collected more or less 50% uh, of our fauna. We have almost 300 species uh, of butterfly, 150 were collected. And uh, the, the trend was positive, apart from the last year that is mentioned by Miguel and other um, of us, uh, of you, um, we have a very Try and um, kind of hot to win, but a few butterflies, few individual, fewer butterflies, and we will just end the previews. Uh, of course, what we have done is to what you already know to translate the, the, the website, the, the app, and all the tools that were already done. Also, to produce some, some small uh, videos that you probably already know. Il Butterfly Monitoring Scheme è una rete di monitoraggio delle farfalle a livello europeo. Sono già moltissimi volontari che contribuiscono alla conservazione delle farfalle attraverso il loro campionamento. Grazie a un metodo standardizzato come quello del transetto, è possibile valutare la numerosità delle popolazioni farfalle e di conseguenza immaginare delle strategie di conservazione degli username e password. Yeah, sorry.
one of the tricky points, no? and that was the past. We don't have any Italian field guides. Uh, we recently had the one Alpi, one uh, field guides uh, uh, that is good for Alps, or restricted to Alps. Um, and otherwise, all, all of us, we are used to use the European one. No? Um, so that was not um, suitable for our uh, volunteers. So, of course, we would use uh, them the mini guys will be able, and we will continue this project, but we also decide to uh, open a project in I Naturalist, uh, where from Leonardo and Paolo Mazzei, um, uh, we ask volunteers to take pictures to, to the butterflies and fill in this project, and they um, validate or not validate the, what's the signature? Set the picture. Um, that works, but uh, not for all of them. Some of uh, our volunteers do not use this uh, idea. I naturalist. So the, one of the solution is to give, as uh, Yolanda said before, some of them are super um, volunteers and have more capacity uh, or more experience or more uh, used to it, and they produces small groups of local uh, and uh, small network of local uh, volunteers and they have uh, a small uh, group of exchange in Facebook, for example, where they um, help each other in recognized butterflies. So give the opportunity to uh, volunteers to become in some way protagonists works uh, at least uh, in our in our case. And then for um, during the ABLE project, we also produce uh, um, a field guide, not a field guide, but a, a guide to recognize Arabia species. And we do the effort to, to cover all the Arabia, uh, Alpine Arabia, not only the Italian ones, since we have more than 90%. So we are asking for um, German and French translation so that that's, uh, tools could be useful for all. Uh, uh, alpine um, alpine people in schemes and workshop that was mentioned and was done by all of you were absolutely crucial meeting people for recruitment was absolutely important and of course also during we didn't stop also during the the pandemic situation after the pandemic situation in each case we produce of course uh, an advertisement that was sent to all of them and also to authorities and so on. And we spent time uh, uh, with um, social media and media in general, which is uh, something that I dislike, but I think yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> also, because they ask every time to do what they and the idea um, that they have in mind. Also, for example, in this case, it was in Parco di Chile. The journalist was um, you know, quite big uh, uh, television channel in Italy, famous, and asked me, oh, you are in Ticino, so why are you here? Because uh, it's full of uh, butterflies. No, it's in, in, absolutely in the pop lane. So it's one of the poorest. Uh, uh, no, no, not so there should be something very rare. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, so you're here uh, yeah, because of, I need, I, my idea is to present this special network with seeds, blah, blah, blah. At the end, when he asked me, so how many chances do you feel to put here in Ticino? One. <laughs> So it was very convenient to me. But in any case, and then it's like that, no? In any case, uh, we tried to, to, to do that. And I think that one of the solutions, one of the key points is give, is 
um, pass this responsibility to the two volunteers. In some cases, we realized in the last workshop that uh, the journalist could uh, interview with the local volunteer, with organize the local event. And that works because they feel uh, really important, really a network of people. And some of them are really super volunteer <laughs> um, in the sense they have uh, really the, the, the potentiality to do what we're doing. So I think important to not only the report, we already said some uh, words and Christina mentioned that we are doing all the reports. That was particularly important for, for ministry, for administration and so on. Um, of course, it was uh, translated into English and in Italian, all the all the volunteers received and were very happy to see their name, but was mainly for administration. Um, not me, in fact, but Federica and Marta that helped me since the, the first uh, day before. At the beginning was Federica and then Marta, which is sitting there. Uh, they, organized, they organized this uh, um, cocktail, um, especially during the pandemic uh, situation with volunteers to have uh, feedback. And then we realized that uh, most of them um, do the same at local level, not at national level. But this, for example, is a, a group of um, volunteers in Padano Plain that work together. Uh, she's uh, Silvia is the super volunteers and she <laughs> organized courses, uh, organized also interviews on in local social media. And one of these um, parts of got a restaurant, they produced these fantastic cakes uh, because it's job. Uh, and they produce, uh, they, they do some, they celebrate in themselves at the beginning of the season, the end of the season. We start, and I think the best solution is uh, uh, delegate, not, not only because we can't uh, basically be everywhere, but also because they they will do that uh, and they will be more happy. And the last uh, meeting, we, the last workshop we we have done was in the um, in a house near close to Rome, which is uh, one of the the um, official uh, residence of uh, Italy president. And uh, inside this big uh, area, green area, there is uh, there are people that work inside, uh, and one of them decided to become uh, uh, a volunteer. And again, uh, they uh, um, ask for uh, to publish it, publish it, and uh, uh, also keep in touch with the local uh, local media directly, not through us. I think that could be. A good, uh, a good solution for for that. This is the the, the species we we collected uh, the most uh, common species. Uh, nothing special, I think. Uh, um, stable during the years. Uh, also, the the list of uh, of species. At the end, as we told uh, also during the evening, the we were one of the uh, states that do not have any. Um, society dedicated to Lepidoptera, historically. So we established in uh, 2020, because I think, I'm quite sure that uh, for many different aspects, not only for the United States, it's very crucial uh, point. Uh, yes, the, the society, Ali, was really born during the pandemic situation, but then, mm, I don't know if it's surprisingly or not, the overlap between members uh, of this society and volunteers is very sparse at the moment, you know? And that's probably is the same in your country, I don't know, I've never, never asked, uh, I've never seen. I suppose that we should do something to connect in more um, volunteers to our uh, national or regional uh, society, because that could, the challenge is to bring the network uh, uh, Permanent as uh, we want uh, in for this point uh, of uh, Let me just uh, again thanks 
uh, Federica and Marta because otherwise I will have started with uh, such a such a job. And she's a job, fantastic, but it's a job. And thank you very much for your attention. It was a very interesting talk. We've seen lots of hard work communication. Also, I, it was fun to see that you know how to enjoy life with all your volunteers with nice parties and cakes. And I think that's a good thing. And um, now uh, we're going to Lithuania and Eglia Lithuania will be talking about outreach uh, to the public and communicating to volunteers. Okay, good evening everyone uh, sitting in the room. Uh, good evening to the online watchers. Um, so I will be talking today about the uh, outreach to public communication. Uh, most likely uh, all of the things you have heard already during the, uh, the, the whole event uh, we had here. So my apologies for a lot of uh, repeating information. Uh, but uh, just moving forward, um, before I go into the outreach, I still want to uh, discuss Lithuanian BMS and what we have achieved in, uh, well, technically one and a half year, um, how those results were achieved, and uh, hopefully we'll be sharing some uh, of the best practices as well. Uh, so I will start with the Lithuanian BMS and. Uh, just a success story, probably uh, this um, this Melita uh, Diamana. We found some uh, new locations um, uh, where we didn't know uh, them being before, and this is a protected species in Lithuania as well. Uh, so I want to show you how the observations were um, distributed in the country and what we actually have observed. Uh, so in one year, we have observed a total of 288 species. Uh, of which 100 species of butterflies, 183 species of moss, and five species of dragonflies. Uh, so some of you might be wondering, 183 species of moss? Wow, that's impressive. And it is because uh, we had one moth trap set up. Uh, so there was a person who was extremely interested in, uh, in uh, moth diversity. And of course, he was mostly keen on finding very rare and uh, uh, not very um, common species, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I just guided him. Hey, look, this is a great new tool and you can actually identify it with uh, just taking pictures with your phone. And he was extremely happy and he was doing it throughout the season. Uh, of course, uh, then I had to employ uh, help. Uh, with verification of the data because the pictures were, be uh, were being taken with the phone. And as we discussed, pictures with the phone are not the best to identify the species. So especially the mi uh, micro moss, uh, that was uh, a big challenge. So most observed species, uh, so peacock, 180, uh, 827 individuals, meadow brown, 581, and brimstone, uh, 576. And in total, in one season, we had um, 7,607 inputs. So that's how many individuals were observed. And this is how the map looked in spring. So this is the end of March. Um, so this is just a snapshot of uh, how it looked like. And this is part of the information I shared with the volunteers as well. Uh, this how it looked in the end of uh, June. Uh, so you can see a lot of uh, way more dots there, and this how it looks right now. Uh, so I want just to give a big shout out to Vilus, who is also online, and he's one of the developers. So he's uh, he's here. <laughs> yeah. So you know where Vilus lives now, and uh, he's a very active um, counter. He does uh, fifteen minute counts, unfortunately only. Uh, Vilo, I hope you're here and you will uh, set up a transit over there. Um, so, and this is how our transit looked like. Uh, so, we have uh, 10 transits set up. 
uh, we had 1,885 uh, observations made in uh, this year, 70 species of butterflies and 11 species of moss. Um, so as you can see, the distribution in the country is not very good. Um, but uh, so the biggest amount of transects we have here, and I think the champion is uh, the one in the in the north, and the highest number of walks is 29 in one season. So that's an extreme dedication from the volunteers. Okay, and then moving to communication to volunteers. Um, so what I want to um, celebrate as well, um, we did three online webinars uh, to familiarize public with uh, Lithuanian butterflies. So these were general uh, trainings just uh, to family level. Um, and it uh, was, they were extremely popular. Uh, we had three in-person trainings um, to attract new volunteers. Uh, one of the trainings were um, two day long. Um, it's um, a lot of work, but um, as you can see from the faces and serious and happy, everyone were extremely involved um, and very um, receptive to the information. So um, where we started? So. First of all, we needed to identify the knowledge gaps and actually it's a funny story, but how, it, how this uh, came uh, to life is uh, um, I saw the same field guide just in Polish and uh, I got so jealous that we don't have anything like that. And um, I messaged um, Butterfly Conservation Europe and it was Christina, I believe, who responded to me is like, yeah, give me a second, um, we'll sort this out. And this was the quickest uh, developed field guides for a country. Um, yeah, so we got it done in two months. In one month? Okay, so yeah, we, uh, we wanted it that badly. Um, and one of the reasons is because uh, we don't really have any field guides for Lithuania. Um, so this uh, has been a very uh, important tool. Um, of course, we needed to identify uh, the best social media to work with. And in our case, it was Facebook and um, tried the communication through emails as well. Um, obviously, we couldn't do without tools and materials, so uh, we created the um, online uh, field guides, uh, but with help of Christina as well, they got printed out uh, with the help of uh, the project as well. We got the uh, nets, uh, which were extremely helpful during the um, field trainings. So the social media we have. Um, a dedicated group uh, for volunteers and anyone basically who are interested in butterflies specifically. And we have a, a page uh, just dedicated for the butterfly monitoring scheme where all the information is being shared. So what kind of information we were sharing? Uh, so something similar to this. Um, this uh, was extremely popular and this was um, inspired by um, uh, British butterfly conservation. Uh, they're doing this for a very long time um, and they include moth as well. Uh, we did this only for butterflies, but um, I don't know if it's visible, but it received almost 300 responses uh, like likes and, and um, so people in spring when they saw this, oh my god, it's spring here. Yes, butterflies, please give them to me. <laughs> Um, so we shared some of the um, interesting observations. So, uh, for example, this um, butterfly was observed 27 days earlier than uh, we would normally expect it to see. Uh, the March was extremely sunny, uh, so most likely uh, the pupa was somewhere in a sunny place and it just emerged, but it's just a very interesting observation. Um, some of the that we encouraged the uh, moth observations as well. Uh, we use the group uh, to share some tips, very practical tips for similar or um, more difficult to distinguish species. Um, so just again, very simple, but very informative. Um, so as I mentioned, butterflies to look out for campaign. 
Uh, so just a couple of things. So it's visually attractive, informative, um, educational and engaging, uh, but at the same time does not cover all the common species. And so, and you have a very, very limited space. Uh, you need to make sure you know your species, especially if this is being done not by a professional. Um, and which species to choose more, of course, all butterflies are beautiful, right? But what do like, do we choose the even more beautiful or the actual more common? So these are the questions you need to ask, but this is extremely popular and, uh, um, even general public found them uh, very welcome. Uh, created the newsletter as well. Mm -hmm. um, though this was a lot of work to create and uh, uh, develop. So uh, during the breakout groups, uh, heard some very good tips and I think we will um, adapt it and uh, make it a little bit different uh, to uh, make it easier and more informative for the volunteers as well. Um, the uh, bulletin, so it's basically the key information translated in the local language. I think it is very important. Uh, but the key thing that really, really worked for Lithuania um, is reaching out to the experience. So by using the iNaturalist and the Lithuanian Entomological Society Facebook page, we were hunting for people who are doing um, the recordings. They uh, they are sharing the pictures of uh, butterflies or they are constantly uh, reporting the species. So it was evident that these people are keen, they're interested um, and they're willing to spend the time and get the data. So we would uh, physically um, reach out to these individuals and ask them that if you, they would like to do this at a more um, structured manner, and uh, quite a few of them said yes, and that's how we managed to get 10 transacts in uh, one year. Of course, I would like to give a big uh, thank you to Giedrus, who I know is also online. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without him. Some of you in the room also know Giedrus, so uh, he does, uh, he gives a lot of support. He's very helpful and um, he's a big part of the butterfly monitoring scheme as well. And of course, media is the best uh, way to get noticed. And um, yes, maybe it's not the uh, um, the um, most favorite activity probably talk to the um, media, but it is very good to put yourself out there. Thank you, uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Sure, that was very encouraging and very nice talk. And uh, just on schedule, so I'd like to move to the report to volunteers. Will be reporting. Something the money for that will be. Okay, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, well, I, I was asked by, by Sue to give an overview of, of how uh, our data uh, is informed to, to the people that found uh, the BMS in Catalonia, but also uh, how we uh, let know to the, to the volunteers uh, our results. Okay. Uh, the, the Catalan Butterfly Monitoring Scheme is uh, an old one. Uh, we have almost three decades of, of existence. Uh, now we have uh, around uh, 225 transects, some of them uh, really old. Uh, more than 300 volunteers. Uh, 
Uh, well, you can see that uh, we, we record almost all the species in, 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 in Catalonia. We have uh, 202 species and we have data collected for 190. Uh, so the, the scheme is uh, funded by uh, governmental bodies, uh, by the Generalitat de Catalunya mainly. And then also there is the Diputació de Barcelona uh, that is a, a body that uh, manages half of the natural parks in, in Catalonia. Uh, the scheme also covers uh, the Balearic Islands and specifically Menorca, which is a, a reserve of the biosphere, uh, started to, to give uh, some, some money for local people to record all these, all these concepts, uh, some of which uh, have been running for 20 years almost. And then we also uh, include uh, transects in, in Andorra. Andorra, of course, is uh, another country. Uh, they have uh, uh, an own uh, VMS, but all the data are uh, um, uh, merged with, with the Catalan data and, and we have uh, all, all the analysis of, 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 the, of this data. Okay, uh, for um, informing uh, to these uh, governmental bodies, but also our results of, of the uh, we started years ago this uh, uh, bulletin, uh, Cynthia, uh, which uh, at, at, at the beginning it was produced uh, every year, but uh, it, it uh, uh, represents a lot of work and now uh, we produce the, this bulletin every two years. And, and we um, give by free, of course, the, the bulletin to the volunteers uh, the day that we uh, uh, organize uh, a workshop or a meeting uh, every two years with, with the volunteers. Uh, this uh, bulletin uh, has a structure um, quite similar to what uh, Miko uh, Kusari yesterday explained for, for Finland. Uh, it, it has uh, fixed sections. Uh, for example, uh, there is one section informing about uh, which species have been found, uh, at, uh, how many sites uh, they appear. Uh, this is this, I'm sorry, uh, this uh, long table. And then there are some uh, simple graphs showing statistics of how many uh, transects are increasing every year and so on. And then uh, we also provide one table with uh, the trends of those species for which it's possible to calculate the trends. At, at the moment, we have uh, trends calculated for 120 species, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and then also some comments on, on the species that in a given season are especially remarkable because they are very common and, and these kind of things. Uh, then we, we also include uh, a section that uh, presents uh, a transect by the by the volunteer uh, himself or herself. Right. Uh, then uh, there is uh, a simple explanation of, of how the transect looks like, uh, what are the species more common, and this kind of information. We also have a, a section which, in my view, is one of the most interesting about uh, uh, focusing on, on, on a single species. And this is uh, quite complete. We use uh, data that uh, has been obtained through, through the years and publish uh, data on, on the biology of the species, on host plant All, all this kind of information. And then uh, <clears throat> the, the bulletin is, is uh, ended by, by two pages that uh, represent uh, identification sheets for more or less difficult species with uh, all the tips that are, are needed to know for a correct identification and so on. Right, so this is so far the, the, the structure of, of this informative bulletin, but uh, we also have uh, devoted a lot of effort uh, in uh, building a, a very complex um, 
a website for, for the for the project. No? Uh, you you can see here the uh, the link. Uh, in in February January uh, there will be also an English translation for the first time. Uh, we already have everything prepared. And, and then, uh, well, uh, at the website, uh, you can have uh, details on how the project uh, works, about the, the methodology, how the data is analyzed, these kind of things. There are also links for the publications. The, the Cynthia Bulletin can be downloaded uh, as a PDF uh, at, at this, at this uh, place. But then probably the, the most interesting thing is, is the, the uh, possibilities to uh, uh, have information on, on the results. So we have our results at the level of the species, at the level of, of the sites, then combinations of the species and sites, and then also uh, about the habitat uh, types and which uh, butterfly communities are typical for, for these habitats. Uh, I, I will show you very uh, rapid um, the kind of, of information that is available. Uh, this is uh, the typical information that uh, we present for a given species, in, in this case, the, the gatekeeper. Uh, there is, uh, well, a, a map of the abundance of, of the species throughout the, the monitoring uh, uh, system. Uh, then uh, we have, of course, uh, a, a graph showing the, the population trend, uh, the phenology, distinguishing uh, the phenology in three different uh, climatic regions that are quite distinctive. <laughs> you see that, that we have uh, the Pyrenees, uh, also a part of, of Catalonia which is very uh, dry and hot. And then most of the country, which is uh, Mediterranean fuel, right? And then we also provide uh, one graph showing the habitat preferences of, of the species. Uh, this is uh, for each uh, species. Uh, for half of the species, we also have um, uh, written uh, information about the biology, uh, the ecology, as it was a field guide. So it's not necessary to have a field guide. You can go to the uh, to the website and have more or less the same uh, information. Uh, then, as I told you, there is the possibility to uh, see the data at the site level uh, for for each site. Uh, well, there is a description of of the basic. Um, climatic uh, data of the, of, of the site, uh, uh, geographical data of the site, but then also uh, probably the most interesting is the, the complete list of the species that have been found at, at this place over, over the years. Uh, and these uh, species are uh, shorted uh, in, in a depressing order of abundance. Uh, we also show in, in a more pale color the, the local extinctions that we have recorded for years. And then uh, if you click to each uh, uh, species, you go directly to the, to the species sheet. So it's quite very nice. Um, what else? Then, uh, as I told you, there is this uh, combination of species and site, which is uh, very interesting for, for the volunteers and also for the people uh, running uh, or, uh, natural parks and, and, and this kind of, of people interested in, in the local uh, situation of, of, of the butterfly populations. No? Here you can see, for example, uh, the general trend of, of the gatekeeper in, in, in the Mediterranean climatic region and uh, one particular population that uh, got extinct uh, in, a nat in a natural park in, in that case. And here you can see a more optimistic uh, situation of the orange tip that uh, colonized one site that has become more abundant while in the, at, at the regional uh, level it has remained stable. Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, available for, for everybody and everybody can check all, all this kind of information, but we need to produce some reports annually 
uh, to these uh, two governmental bodies that uh, found uh, the, the scheme. No? Uh, and in, in uh, our view, the most important thing is uh, to let them know what uh, is going on with, with the population trends of the species and, and uh, let them know that, that we have a problem as, as, as in many other parts of, 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 the, of the world. No? Uh, you know that uh, butterfly declines are everywhere, uh, but uh, what we have seen in these three decades is that uh, in Catalonia we have exactly the same problem and, and is not uh, different from what you can see even in, in, in Central and, and Northern Europe. Uh, this is a, a very a recent uh, evaluation of, of the trends in, in Catalonia. Uh, and you see that more than half of the species uh, are showing a uh, decline at the moment. No? Uh, even uh, formerly common species like Ophelia aurinia are becoming more and more rare in, in, in Catalonia. So, uh, in this uh, annual report, which is quite simple because there is so much information at the website and at the CTA bulletin, which makes no sense to repeat this again. Uh, what we do is a very short summary of, of uh, the general trends and we distinguish uh, these three different climatic regions, as I told you. Uh, we use uh, the, the package provided by RETO for the calculation of, of trends at, at these uh, um, climatic regions. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, use uh, two indexes of the species that we have uh, produced using data for, for, from the scheme. One is uh, related to the how uh, generalist to specialist is a species in uh, terms of habitat use. And the other uh, gives you an idea of how the species is uh, ordered in a gradient from uh, forest to open, to open areas. Uh, these two indexes are calculated for uh, almost all species and a combination of, of the two indexes is used to uh, select uh, a group of species for calculating uh, multi-species habitat indicators. Uh, we currently produce uh, a, species, a multi-species habitat indicator for forests, uh, another for uh, um, grasslands, and another for agriculture. Uh, we have more or less uh, the same, exactly the same trend uh, as in, in the whole Europe uh, for, for these uh, habitat indicators. In the case of, of grasslands, uh, we have seen a, a, well, a reduction that is even uh, more strong than for the general uh, indicator for, for the whole Europe. It's about 50% uh, of the decline in, in, in the last uh, 30 years. Um, these um, indexes are also used to uh, uh, calculate uh, community trends in regarding, for example, how uh, the dominance of the species that prefer uh, forest habitats are becoming uh, dominating in, in, in particular sites. And here you can see a, a very uh, nice example. And what else? Uh, well, the, the, this report that we provide, we also include uh, a section uh, showing that the data of, of the Catalan scheme is used at a much more uh, broad level, which is very important for politicians to uh, to let them know that, that this data is, is useful at the large scale. Uh, and also, uh, recently, we have incorporated the butterfly data in a living planet index that is uh, calculated specifically for Catalonia. A uh, similar thing that they do, I think, in Belgium and some, some other places. So, at, at the moment, this uh, Living Planet Index uh, from Catalonia, uh, for the first time, includes uh, a large proportion of, of butterflies as, as a representative of, of insects uh, in this general trend. And uh, to, to finish, well, uh, we also include, uh, I think this is very, very important, a section 
uh, of communication and dissemination of, of our results. Uh, so um, we, we have this, this bulletin, but we also produce different uh, leaflets and posters that uh, are very um, have a very successful to the to the broad public. For example, well, uh, there is the poster of, of the painted lady, but uh, this uh, year we have also uh, produced um, a leaflet about how to um, design uh, gardens to attract butterflies. Here you can see well that, that there is there are lists of, of uh, nectar species, nectar plants that are important. Uh, plants that are, can also be used as host plants by, by species that uh, are free to in gardens and, and this kind of things. And uh, very recently, we also have started to produce a newsletter that is open to, to people, not only volunteers. And uh, this every three months, we, we provide information about the state of the project and so on. And finally, we include uh, which I think is also very important, a section uh, summarizing uh, what are the scientific results that the, the project uh, is producing uh, every, every year. So we, we have uh, an extract of, of the main uh, publications and a short summary about uh, the results. And well, that's... Thank you, Commissioner. We have to move to the next talk. I would like to invite Elizabeth for reporting her scheme. Thank you. Elizabeth heißt, steht da in Wolle vor. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to tell you very briefly um, a bit about our German butterfly monitoring scheme and with a focus, a special focus on the volunteers. So we advertise the um, butterfly monitoring scheme with take a walk in service of science. And that works very well because many people like to contribute to science. That's a very important part. Oops, does it work? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just to start with a few numbers and an overview over the trend sector that was set up now. Um, our monitoring scheme started in 2005 and those are all the trends that um, delivered data from that on. They are not, not all active by now but um, that's an overview of everything. And the numbers of transact, we just finished our annual report for 2021, and those are the numbers for 2021. 375 volunteers, 587 transacts, and in total, we, are, we almost reached the 4 million individuals counted during the 18 years. Um, yeah, these are the numbers of transact over the years we started of course, in 2005, very low, but then on an almost even level. And during the last uh, years, we had an increase of uh, transact on the transact workers. Um, but more important for us is that out of these uh, 587 transacts, 20, uh, 251 are worked 10 years or longer. So people really stick to their transacts and they uh, they are really dedicated to their transacts and they care about what is going on there. And there are even 60 transacts that um, are worked since the start of the project. Um, yeah, people just um, have some sort of a um, stewardship for, um, for their transact. They really care and they want to know how their butterflies are doing in their transact and that's why they are, keep going um, in counting butterflies every year again and again. Um, yeah, but what do our volunteers get? It's not much, I have to admit, and I always feel a bit bad about that because they put so much energy, energy and so much effort in there. 
And uh, what they get from us is they get a newsletter at the start of the season, another newsletter at the end of the season, and sometimes, not every year, a newsletter in between for, with special information. Um, and we have an annual report, and this report is um, in the uh, journal Oedipus. Oedipus is the journal of the um, Gesellschaft für Schmetterlingsschutz, the German Society for uh, Butterfly Conservation. And the whole scheme is run by uh, UFZ and GFS in, um, together. Um, yeah, and with this annual report, we sent out a printed version at the end of the year. Everybody gets a little thank you. I come to that in a minute. <laughs> Um, the annual report has two parts. The first part is what we do. So results from reporting here, the trends for the butterflies and all the basic numbers uh, put together. <laughs> uh, the second part is a contribution from transit workers. So they sent us little contributions, uh, articles about um, their transact, how their transact are developing, or we have now an, a contribution about uh, the severe drought on one transact last year and how what that did to the butterfly numbers, and um, yeah, things like that. And we have new repo new projects, all kind of um, butterfly related projects are promoted there. New books about butterflies in in a broader way, uh, the butterfly of the year and the insect of the year. So that's for the report. So thank you um, that our volunteers get every year for now, um, for the last six years by now, is a little um, identification chart to help um, identify the um, more difficult groups. We started, I think, with vernets and then with uh, skippers, and we have a chart for, for the whites, um, Militeine, uh, that was very Ambitious one, um, hair streaks, including eggs, and our newest one now will be one about the blues, and we start with those about, without our studs. So we divided that, that group because it, otherwise it would just be too much. <laughs> yeah, and this is how it, what it looks like. That's a, a chart for the skippers, and it has two sides and is um, printed between um, hardcover um, plastic, so you can take it outside and um, take it with you in the field. And that's about the bonus. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. I know it's been a long day, but I also know that you have questions for uh, our presenters and our volunteers, and we will have two main discussions. We thought that we would have two main discussions, but we would like to start with six to ten, but I would still would like to take some questions for our uh, volunteer sections for any speakers, if you have any questions. Any questions? I have a question, maybe mostly for Simona, but also the other schemes that obviously we've been fortunate to have funds under Able and Spring to support activities. Is Are you now seeing that the governments are helping to support the schemes? Do you think there's any um, sort of potential for that since, since now you've proven that it can work in Italy? Is the government going to fund some of your activities or is that still like... Not yet. Uh, to be positive. <laughs> Any answers for that? Yes. For that question from other other volunteers? Okay. What about other questions? Or any comments about uh, the workshop or okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just told I'm sorry, it's all my fault. Lars? Would you like to ask? And, uh, yes, please. Well, I was going to say that uh, since we're running late, we, uh, we might skip uh, my one, but uh, <laughs> we can do it that way. So, yeah. Uh, presentation. It's just going to be a um, quick sort of cookbook ish uh, uh, overview of what we uh, do with our uh, annual reports.
Yeah. Um, so um, I was asked to to talk a little bit about what the uh, annual reports that we have for for the volunteers, uh, what they represent, and it's pretty much like what you've heard now. But uh, I, I thought I could go through some of the elements that we have. Uh, so. Um, we have them in print, and we have had that for quite some time. It's just just because that we feel that we have to give something back to the volunteers. So they've been given uh, an annual report from from the scheme that they've been in. Uh, they also get a, a sticker every year. So we have um, invited artists to do, donate a, a painting of uh, one of the butterfly species that we have. So we have uh, thirteen different ones so far. Uh, so, so we have a bunch of schemes that we run. Uh, the uh, Swedish Butterfly Monitoring scheme, monitoring scheme has been running since 2010. Uh, we also have a targeted habitats directed monitoring scheme uh, since 2014, and a couple of other schemes uh, as well. Uh, but what we do mainly is that we. It looks quite boring, but it's quite easy to, to produce. So we have a template that we follow quite closely. Uh, so pages. It, people recognize what they expect. Uh, we have a dedicated part about uh, weather because that's quite interesting, especially in a country that is uh, so long as Sweden is. So it's it can be a, a really quite cold year up north, whereas it is, you know, can be a hot summer in, in the south and vice versa. Uh, to the left here is something that we uh, usually show, which is the number of sun hours per uh, region. Uh, so this is the average for, I think it's, uh, they changed the algorithm for how they estimate this. So I think this is for the last five or 10 years, but this is for, for 2020. So you can see uh, where you have the most sun and the least sun uh, that year. We also provide the, the uh, weathering in relation to the average for the last 30 years. Um, And then we show where the sites were that particular year. So this is from 2020, the transects that we have, um, the point sites. Um, and we compare the, the average number of species that people see at the point sites and transects. So uh, the lower number here is for point sites, which is uh, sites that are um, specific position and about 25 meters radius uh, around that particular site. And transects are uh, just ordinary polywalk transects. And then we have uh, detailed information for each species. Um, so the flight period of it per week and uh, where it was found that particular year. And we also highlight where, where the most individuals were seen each year, which is something that people appre uh, appreciate quite a lot. So it's a sort of interpretation of what the year was like for, for that particular species. Uh, then we produce uh, a number of um, indicators as well. Um, uh, com uh, 20 common, most common species in Sweden, uh, the grassland butterfly indicator, uh, farmland um, indicator is based on a UK indicator that we have been following for some years, uh, and the forest indicator is based on, on um, species data for, for uh, forest butterflies in Sweden. Uh, for every species that we have a convergence in terms of, of uh, uh, population trends, we produce a trend like this. Uh, at this moment, I think we have a stable trends for 85 species or so, or uh, estimated trends for 85 or 86 species. Uh, we also uh, finish off the uh, report with a dedicated article, in this case, uh, the, the large immigration of uh, painted ladies that we had in 2019. So we tried to, to offer some, some sort of uh, extra reading for, for volunteers. And then we also tried to, to um, invite them to provide some material themselves, uh, not least to provide the photos. So they're quite pleased to, to see their own photos in, in the report. And in this case, it was a sort of personal experiences that uh, the volunteers had of uh, the immigration of painted ladies. Uh, to finish off, we have a couple of things that, that are on the way. And one of them is that we have targeted um, uh, reports for some regions and for, for some municipalities. 
And those uh, reports are fairly standardized, quite boring to write. Uh, you replace the figures, you replace some of the text. So what is highlighted in, in yellow here is the dynamic parts of it. The rest is just boring. <laughs> but but uh, you can, in principle, you can replace the uh, area covered and, and then generate a new report uh, that is sort of geared towards the, the readership or, or the target audience. I can do uh, use reuse a lot of the content. You can rerun the analysis. You can generate it in the markdown. And by doing that, you can have customized reports for for target audiences. Uh, and finally, um, what you can do as well now that we discovered, I've been longing to read Finnish reports for a very long time. But uh, Finnish language is quite complex. Uh, and, Unless you are from Hungary, when it might be a little bit less complex than for Sweden. Uh, so then we discovered, then when they had this pollinator strategy, which is a great report, by the way, uh, uh, Harriet, who works for me, uh, she discovered that you can now feed entire PDFs to Google Translate. Uh, they have to be less than 10 megabytes, but if they are, uh, uh, I, I noticed that our uh, reports are slightly more than that, but you can just save it as a small file. And then you can just feed it to Google Translate and you get it all in English. And I had a try here and it works quite well, but it gives you rubbish species names. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, there is some, somewhere in this text, there is something that should be a meadow brown. There's a short grass cutting butterfly or whatever. <laughs> So, but you can do this. So, yeah, that was all that I had. So, thank you. And I'm sorry again for skipping. Uh, so, uh, we learned a lot about reporting to back to volunteers, to public, to governments. Uh, is there any remarks, any questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for BMS that are doing producing a grassland in Tor, uh, are they using the same selection of 17 species that uh, is used for the European grassland indicator, or is it another strategy like, for example, selecting sections or transects that are in grassland? What's yeah, perhaps it's a survey who, who use uh, the selection of 17 species? Our case, uh, uh, the, the study is based on, on trends of uh, the case of uh, Raslan indicator. I think uh, about uh, 40 species, which we consider uh, Raslan specialists at, uh, in, in, in our country. So we, we, we uh, Merge the the trends of this uh, forty species, or not so many because uh, there are no enough data for, for trends. But uh, for, for true uh, grassland specialist in Catalonia, to, to know uh, how the, the indicator is. And are the others using? Only, for example, uh, observations that are in grasslands instead of selecting species with relation to grasslands. Uh, we, we are using the, the uh, uh, 12 out of 17 uh, species out of the uh, grassland butterfly indicator. So it's the same species selection. We have 12 out of those 17. Uh, but we don't uh, match it with, with habitat. Uh, it's a completely different question. It's, it's a good question, but it's rarely done. So, so, uh, but we use the, the uh, observations that we have with those species, irrespective of, of where we are sitting. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, just one very brief, very practical remark that uh, uh, as an alternative to Google Translate, there's a commercial package named Depot, which you can use for free for small bits. And it has a few advantages. In general, the translation is better, but especially if you have a paid package, you can make your own word lists. 
so you might uh, circumvent the problem of having all st strange uh, translations of, of names, uh, species, etc. So that might be a good option if you want to have even less work in translation. Uh, I'd recommend uh, have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Deeply better. <laughs> Thank you for that remark. I tried that too. It was definitely much better. So, so I was just about leaving for you know, for an hour or something because I had a, um, the a yearly volunteer meeting <laughs> um, um, online and there was a question coming up um, that uh, a few people are sharing a transect and they would like to see each other's counts and at the moment it's, I think it's not possible. I, I both, like both of them are um, checked for the transect so they can put in data but they don't see each other's data. Is this correct? Or is this is a bug. I think, yeah, you can explore it via the general explore page, but not the transect summary. So just, you cannot produce a report for your transect, which actually shows everything. So uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe you can email me about it. Several people that wanted to do this because the National Park and the Nature um, Nature Park that they both uh, share their transects. And I think that would be really useful for them. If, 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 we, if we can't do it, we can, it's up to you how restrictive or not you want the system to be. So if you want it more open, we can certainly make it more open. Yeah. Yes, oh. we're going to say why don't you start the next one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we still have a couple more minutes for questions. Maybe just a, a question uh, for those that produce these reports. Uh, do you produce them your, yourself or you ask artists or a designer to actually do those beautiful poster like you? one of the poster of the migration of the painted ladies. I mean, I would not be able to do that, but I was wondering if you did it or if it's... There's another thing that I, I noticed that um, some of the figure seem to be gray for colorblind people. So I was just you know, to know that this is kind of important to be inclusive and that there is diversity in all things. Okay. Yeah, we, we changed the, the trend the colors for, for the, uh, um, well, the, the butterfly trend in, in, the, uh, in the appendix that we have, because I have a PhD student who is colorblind and she was quite upset to, to see what the green and Red meant. So now it's magenta, uh, gold, and uh, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, of course, the night is not over yet, so we will have a nice dinner tonight. And we, I, I would like to invite Sue and Martin here for the conclusion remarks. Thank you. Yeah. Can I stand here? Yeah, sure. No presentation. Yeah, so um, we're all getting you know, it's a long day. It's been very full, but we try and cram everything into these meetings because, of course, we don't meet so often. But um, I don't know about you, but although I'm exhausted, um, I'm really pleased just to see how much is going on because um, when Butterfly Conservation Europe started, which is all those years ago, um, and we had our first meeting here in 2007. And of course, we were thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have all this monitoring and recording across Europe? And, and it was just a dream. And I don't think we had really a plan of how it would happen. Um, but like all good things, you know, they come have their time and uh, all the enthusiasm in this room makes this makes the dream happen. So a big thank you to all of you who uh, have contributed. Uh, right from the you know the people that do the organising at the top, 
but but you know that that's worth nothing if the people in the countries don't do their bit so it's it's really for me it's, um, it's really lovely to see um so much progress has been made over that time and yeah i think well i think we're all very grateful to each other in a way because we feed off each other's learning and enthusiasm so uh, all that give ourselves a pat on the back i think for that um so um i mean this is just a few reflections i'm not going to talk for very long at all but um and sue will just come in if i've missed anything that's obvious but um i think i mean obviously um the pan-european monitoring scheme is um alive and well and is sort of you know almost there to be completed it's it's an extremely fantastic achievement i think um, obviously the two funded projects able first and then spring have made the big difference because actually bc europe is run virtually with no money whatsoever it's just one on the goodwill of the board and, and the advisors uh, and of course all of you in the room but occasionally we have the money to do things a little bit faster and and we're very grateful to sue particularly i think for um securing these funding and of course the meps you heard um martin hoisek uh, there it's really nice to know that there are people in high places who really support our work and really want us to succeed and so we must keep remembering that because we're actually part of a much bigger network of people all of whom wants to conserve biodiversity um so um i mean i think we've made really good progress as well developing indicators as well because i mean all this you know we like to know what butterflies are doing and so on like that but you have to have a cut through if you want to conserve butterflies and now moths of course um and the, the indicators are the way you cut through because it's a way of telling you the state of europe's butterflies and that's really really important and sue and all the work she does um is needs these indicators because that's what gets noticed in the policy circles they're not going to be worried about which species is doing well and a is doing well here and a is doing badly here they're not bothered about that all they want to know is how a butterfly is doing and that's where the indicators are really really important and i think we've made really good progress of that and and thank you to all the statistical whiz kids that are doing that um so and i think the the other the great thing that um i think we've made just an enormous progress on is all the tools that are available to the country bms's now the the website the online data entry tool 15 minute count is quite a revelation to see how you're all using that because in a way that was i guess a leap into the unknown <laughs> I think, you know, it, it's, it was a nice idea. It would make me nice to have a 15 minute count app and then you could just record as you go around Europe. And, and now it's happening. And of course, thousands and thousands of counts. So that's really, um, I think, um, a very exciting thing that's taken off in a way. I don't think we expected it would take off so quickly. Um, and of course, there were some ideas about uh, reporting on the website and the, or the RBMS tools that um, Reto and others are developing. Um, so, and the other thing that I think we heard that, uh, a lot about in this meeting was, of course, how, we, you know, we're working in our butterfly bubble, but of course there's all the wider pollinator work going on under the spring project. And I think it's really nice that we're linking into that. And of course you heard from Simon Potts that actually the butterfly, um, what we're doing with butterflies is kind of in the vanguard there because we've developed it so much quicker than other groups, which are, are, are a bit only sort of really beginning to get their court networks together so of course what we're doing is then being looked upon by others as a model of how to develop schemes um, so i think it's nice for that we can be involved with that share our expertise and of course help um, it's another rationale if you like in your countries to argue for resources because it's part of this wider state of biodiversity um, effort um, and we heard from Sue about um, the, um, all these new policies that are coming through from the EU and how they're really, I think, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it's in conservation, it's very um, hard to be optimistic. But, you know, it, it, hearing that there are real opportunities there that we must grasp. And Sue explained all that with this new potential nature restoration law, which would be such a big step forward beyond the habitats directive um, which we know has big flaws but so it might make a big sort of step change i think 
Um, and of course, the commitment to spend more money on biodiversity within the EU, that's, that's kind of big to me because actually we all know that money drives this progress and, 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 and uh, uh, actual conservation on the ground. So just um, a reminder to contribute to the pledges that um, Holly talked about. And uh, I guess you'll be sharing something soon about the, that spread spreadsheet and, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But I mean, that's that's a real kind of concrete example, I think, of how you could and it'll take time, bit of time, but um, it, it really could influence this process. Um, and I think lastly, today we heard about all this engagement of the public. And I think that's, you know, in a way, this is how it's how conservation grows, isn't it? The way we, we the citizen science element of what we do. I mean, we, we're all probably volunteers in our own way, but of course we're working with other volunteers and the way these schemes are structured. So they start with people doing kind of really structured surveys and then down to the butterfly count, the 15 minute counts and really getting the public involved. And I think that's how we will actually try and conserve things if people care about them. So I think it's really important to engage the wider public and monitoring and counting butterflies is a really nice way of doing that. And of course, we're going to work on the red list and we hear some um, that we want to do a bit more consultation. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in the new year. So we've had a fantastic um, program, I think, and learned an awful lot. And uh, my head's full of it, really. But uh, I think I'll need the weekend just a long plane journey and a train journey to try and digest it all. Um, but just to kind of look ahead, so um, I'm really sort of speaking for the BCE board, which I'm no longer on, but I kind of an advisor there as, as someone that's been there a long time. Um, and uh, I mean, we're committed to develop all this good work. You know, we, we, it's really our rationale. I mean, we tried to focus on just one or two things because we were so small and under-resourced. So the monitoring and the recording of butterflies and now moths, it's really lovely to see that. We wanted to do that for a long, long time, but now just beginning to get obviously some resources to, to do that. Um, so we're very committed to do that. And the spring project, of course, is only for two or three years and then that will end and then we'll be looking for money for the next stage. And of course, we're already thinking about that. So it, it, we know it's important and we know the work has to carry on and the support has to carry on. So we have that in mind and it's definitely a top priority priority for us. Um, and uh, obviously, we're very committed to pursuing the policy opportunities that Sue mentioned. So this this also was, I mean, the very first meeting 2007, we had a, a sort of discussion and people voted on what would be the thing that BC Europe could add to their work. And really, almost at the top of the list was influencing policies in, at a European level because it's something that's very difficult to do from an individual country because you're a lone voice and you don't really know how about how to go about it. So the work of Sue and now Aidan is, and, and Holly is just really, really important because that's using all the information we have to try and make good progress with conservation. So, and, and BC Europe is still very committed to that, although we don't have much resources to put it in, but um, both, um, well, all those people I've mentioned are, are very um, committed to it. And I'd just like to say a bit, 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 thank you actually to BC in the UK and Dutch BC who actually provide the only core funding we get to run BC Europe is sort of the machinery of just keeping an organization ticking over. And of course, they not only provide a bit of cash, which is needed actually, but also seconding staff. So Holly, for example, uh, myself was one day a week doing some secondment work to BC Europe. And that was, you know, really just helps the thing work um, in, in a good way. So I think uh, just to sort of finalize then, you know, I think that um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's very daunting when you look outside the door of a room and see the world, the state it's in and the state that biodiversity is. And I think we can all get very depressed about it. Um, but um, I think one of the things that's nice about coming together is that there is a lot of positivity amongst people like ourselves that want to make change. And we're not alone. There are other NGOs, many millions of people around the world also want change and want a better world to live in. Um, so I think that we must think that we're part of this big movement and together we can make better progress than if we work alone. So I'm very grateful for you to give up your time to come and support the work we do and, and actually help build the butterfly monitoring scheme, which is just like, if you like, one element that will help push 
this biodiversity road along. And of course, growing awareness with the public, as I mentioned, but you know, people do love butterflies. So we have, if you like, a special opportunity with the work we do to really excite the public about conserving biodiversity. So thanks again for all your effort. Um, and we're very grateful and we look forward to seeing you again and uh, very soon. Sue, do, I, do you want anything to add? I'll just say um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's hugely supported and uh, we love being part of this family and uh, the new people who have joined us, we hope you've been inspired and supported by what you've heard and and take away some good ideas and thank you for all your inputs uh tell me what you want and how you want to amend the nature res restoration law as soon as possible and uh yeah do your pledges thanks thank you okay so thank you all very very much uh but before we finally kind of move off and we have a, a, a this exciting surprise dinner that we're going to so we're going to leave i think at quarter two and the minibus is outside the front but before we do that we really need Oh, what's going on here? I think it's you. Who is this person? <laughs> um, uh, we, we need to say a really big thank you to the people in ANL who have helped us organise this meeting. So uh, there's a lot of work under the bonnet. So at the back there, there's Marianne and Chris Blunt. Well, But also joined this year by Nick and Leone, who have done, I think, a superb job with the technology. So, thank you. I'd like to invite Marianne and Kristen to come to the front for a minute, please. <laughs> So I, uh, some of you probably won't know that um, both Marianne and Christian who have been working for ANL, I think 40 years and 30 years or something you said, so it's already, yeah. uh, you know, really a long time, obviously since, since the very start of, of um, um, all these seminars in here. Um, but you're retiring next year, so we're very sad to that. We'd like to say a, a big thank you, but we also have a, 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 a small gift. Where's the gift? Oh, there we are. So, um, so this is a gift for you, Marianne. You just hold it up and show people. Yeah. That's for Christian. Thanks. So, so, so. Something about Richard Lewington, I guess, for this who's out there. Yeah, these are these are prints by Richard Lewington, who's a British artist who does these most amazing, uh, beautiful paintings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm relieved now because I was afraid that we'd get an award like the golden microphone or something. <laughs> So um, just, uh, we have the minibuses at um, quarter yeah. two. Oh, sorry. And then, uh, yes, I know, just before, because everyone will be so excited after the video that, that they'll forget. So I just want to say, <laughs> uh, just as a sort of like a, a farewell, we've got a little video to see. Okay. <laughs> It's quarter to seven, and we we're catching the minibus in the cell as well. So, can you help me with the video? I see a message. Yeah.
Uh, the last last thing is just uh, we I did I created a um, compiled video about all these eight years of Laufen meetings, and uh, you have been coming here many many of you since the beginning. And um, well, I wanted to thank you for all of you for being here because it has been incredible. I'm so excited that the program was great. Yeah. Thinking of that, the uh, hard day pays off. <laughs> so. Thank you for speaking up. Okay. <laughs> And yes, I, I leave you with the video. Yeah. Yeah, you like it? <laughs> Summarizing eight years, <laughs> many, many years in eight meetings. So, yeah, thank you so much. Let's go for the dinner. <laughs>